Columbus, Georgia, this is your city council. Mayor, Skip Henderson. City Manager, Isaiah Hughley. Pops Barnes, District 1. Glenn Davis, District 2. Bruce Huff, District 3. Toya Tucker, District 4. Charmaine Crabb, District 5. Gary Allen, Mayor Pro Tem and District 6. Joanne Kogel, District 7. Walker Garrett, District 8. Judy Thomas, Post 9 at Large Counselor. Tyson Bagley, Post 10 at Large Counselor. Sandra Davis, Clerk of Council. And City Attorney Clifton Fay. Columbus, Georgia, this is your City Council. As we call the April 9th uh, Council meeting uh, to order. Uh, we do have a quorum. We uh, also have uh, joining us virtually our Mayor Pro Tem, uh, Councillor Allen. Uh, and uh, so he will be voting through our, uh, our, our uh, clerk this morning. Uh, we are fortunate to have with us uh, to help us start our meeting by invoking God's presence, Pastor Jason Wade of Winton United Methodist Church. Pastor Wade, thank you for being here. Thank you, Mayor Henderson, all distinguished members of our city council, as well as our city government officials are in the room here this morning. We bring you greetings from Winton Methodist Church, and thank you for the honor to come and to pray over this meeting today. Let us pray. Our dear most gracious Heavenly Father, we come once again to this day to where we come and place all of these matters before you. God, we know that each person in this room, Father, they have a heart and a desire to see Columbus and Muskogee County continue to grow. Father, we offer today an opportunity for our minds to be opened, an opportunity for grace in this room. And we pray over each one of these leaders, God, as they make these decisions that will benefit and continue to grow the Columbus area, Father, for your glory. In all these things, we pray and place at your feet. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. If you would, please stand and join me in our pledge to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You know, the uh, Pledge of the Flag takes on a little extra meaning this morning. I don't know if you are aware, but we lost, uh, you know, the word hero is used a lot about sports figures and singers and entertainers. Uh, the true heroes are the ones that uh, pledged themselves to help defend the freedoms of this country. And uh, Colonel Ralph Puckett passed away yesterday. So certainly our prayers uh, go out to Miss Jeannie and to the entire Family, And I know that there are some arrangements being made for public uh, viewing and uh, Councillor Thomas had actually brought those to our attention. So I'm going to ask her to uh, kind of let us know about those. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, the um, public uh, celebration of Colonel Puckett's life will be on April, uh, April the 20th at 11 o'clock on the um, parade grounds at the National Infantry Museum. Um, and because they expect, uh, as one of the folks from the museum told me, everybody and their brother uh, to be there, um, they will be streaming that service. And so if you uh, want to see it, it will be streaming. If you want to go, uh, they said come early. You may need to come back at 8.30 for the 11 o'clock <laughs> service. But anyway, we, um, we uh, hope that there will be a uh, large contingent from Columbus and from the surrounding area to pay tribute to um, Colonel Puckett. Uh, he was the most decorated officer in the United States military. And it, he was, but he was also just right down to earth and was a good guy. So we're going to celebrate his life April the 20th. 11 o'clock at the um, Infantry Museum. 
uh, on the parade ground. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes if there are no edits. All right. Motion to second to approve the minutes from March 26th meeting. Any edits or any questions or concerns about those minutes? All right. Hearing none, all in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? All right. Uh, and we've got a... Thank, thank you, ma'am. All right. And we do have a number of... Uh, Proclamations, but but first I want to call up uh, our uh, delegation. They have just concluded another session, uh, a very active session at the uh, state legislature. And uh, as they always do, they come back and kind of report to us and give us some idea of, of what uh, what they encountered during during the session. So uh, I'm going to invite them uh, to the to the podium. I get. Senator Harbison, are you, you want to come to the, give us a, an update? Good morning, Mayor and Council. Good morning, sir. We are certainly glad to be here this morning. We always uh, uh, honored to come before you and let you know what we've uh, tried to accomplish as it relates to the resolution that we pass, that you pass every year. Uh, in order to further the, the success of our city here in Columbus. We certainly appreciate that. And just as a quick aside, uh, we appreciate the resolutions that you send before us. Uh, and it has always been our policy for the last 40 years, of, um, even beyond um, Calvin Smyre and Tom Buck and the rest of the leaders of our delegation, that we only uh, pass uh, legislation or attempt to pass legislation or deal with the legislation if it's a majority of council or unanimous. And we certainly appreciate that. It makes our job much, much easier today. Uh, we come to you to let you know that we've endured some 2,000 pieces of legislation in the Georgia General Assembly over the last two years. And we're just glad to tell you that we survived that. We have with me my local legislative delegation. I'm honored to represent them as the chair of the delegation. And what I'll do now is ask the vice chair of our delegation, de delegation to come up and uh, give us some uh, specific points of legislation that we tried to deal with uh, during our legislative session. Uh, Representative uh, Vice Chair Carolyn Cuba. Thank you, uh, Chairman Harbison. Good morning, Mr. Mayor and members of council. It's my honor to be here. And first of all, I want to give honor to the citizens of House District 141 who have allowed me to represent them. The 2024 session was one uh, for the history books and one that has left an indelible impression for me in terms of the importance of our service as well as the importance of how we treat one another as a delegation for we lost a valuable member of our delegation in uh, the Honorable Chairman Richard Smith. And he left with us uh, something that we should all learn, and that is focus on the main thing, put Columbus first, and put service above self. So that's what we're going to take away from his life and legacy, and that's what we're trying to do as a delegation. So the chairman asked me to speak about some of the things in the budget. Of course, the one thing that we are constitutionally mandated to do is pass a budget. And our budget for uh, fiscal year 25 is $36.1 billion. Uh, and uh, speaking of Chairman Smith, the one thing, one of the things that he was very much interested in uh, was the expansion of Mercer Medical School here in Columbus. And we're pleased to report that $850,055 has come to us for the fifth of the seventh year expansion of the medical school, of the Merc medical school campus here in Columbus. We also have $4.8 million for CSU for the Davidson Student Center renovation. Now, this Columbus Council sent us a lot of resolutions and uh, several of them had to do with mental health, and you all were concerned about increased authority for APRNs. There were some 30 bills dealing with mental health, 
issues and five bills dealt with APRNs. However, the most important measures were found in the budget. We have $1.5 million for the David Rawson Center for Behavioral Health and Disabilities, $1.6 million for the IPSE program, and that's a program for students with disabilities to go to college and have mentoring as they go. There's $3.2 million for the Macon Crisis Stabilization Diagnostic Center, $1 million for the Georgia APEX program, which expands to additional schools, and this provides counseling for uh, students. And there was $1 million for the Child Advocacy Center to expand statewide advocacy. There is $608 million, $608,000, excuse me, for the autism services and screenings that will help our children with autism across our state, and $1 million for veteran services to support active duty military members and veterans with behavioral health sciences. And then there was a $79.9 million provider rate increase for the now waiver, and that is to uh, help people with disabilities live in their homes and have assistance. Uh, and there was $26 million uh, for the behavior health provider rate. And so, as you know, everybody's having a difficulty with uh, workforce. And so these provider rate increases will allow uh, those members who have those waivers to get the assistance that they need. On the subject of APRNs, uh, we had SB 449, which is a licensure exception for military medical personnel uh, from the APRN licensure process. And we had House Bill 557, which allows APRNs and PAs to issue prescription drug orders for certain Schedule II narcotics. And then uh, we had HB 1046, which authorizes APRNs and PAs to sign death certificates. You also asked us to uh, provide legislation uh, to allow for technology fees for the recorder's court and the probate court, and we're pleased to report that both of those provider fees uh, have been uh, authorized by the General Assembly. So with that, uh, I could go on and on about the budget because, as I said, it's, it's uh, uh, $36.1 billion, but those are some of the highlights, and we focus on the things that were the result of the resolutions that you all had sent to us. And with that, I will yield uh, to Representative Boker. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, I'm Debbie Buckner, and I'm proud to represent House District 137, and I am delighted to have some good things to report to you today. Um, the list that uh, you provided with us had some uh, uh, tax implications that you want to check on, and let me just back up a bit. During the summer, there was a panel that was um, selected it was a joint panel of House and Senate members, and we looked at all of the tax credits, a lot of the tax exemptions that were um, in place in the state of Georgia. Uh, that resulted in a number of very large bills uh, that had to do with our taxes and whether or not we should keep the exemptions that we have, in some cases, keep some of the tax credits. So there was one bill that was um, very, very large, very, and the only one that passed actually, and back, basically what it did is it looked at all of the, the tax exemptions that have been in place for a very long time that did not have what we call a sunset. Most all of the tax measures that we pass now will have a sunset so we can check on the return on investment to the state for that tax credit and to make sure that it is doing what it's supposed to do as far as helping whoever it was designed to help but not hurt the budget of the state of Georgia. That was a large bill we went through and we picked out any of the taxes that had, or tax credits or tax exemptions that did not seem to be being utilized in the state and gave them a five-year sunset so that we will know at the end of the five years if those are actually being used, if there is a benefit to the user and or to the state. Some of those created some questions. It is, like I said, about a 40-page bill, so if you have questions of 
or if anybody brings them, feel free to call and I'll be glad to go through it with you because I can't do it to this morning in my two or three minutes. But that bill did pass and I do think that is a good measure for us to have passed in the tax arena so that we can make sure that we are um, collecting what we should, not collecting what we don't need to, and helping people that we can help. Um, there was also a film tax credit that was of great interest to a lot of people here in the Columbus area. When it first was drafted, it did not include what they call an uplift, which is extra tax credits for areas outside of the metro area. But um, in the process, we were able to add that so that underutilized areas of the state, which included Columbus area and some of the rural areas of the state, would get an, incre an increase in that uplift to encourage film companies to come to our area. We also were able to add um, music and post-production, which is where they put all that great footage and, and video together and, and clip it and snip it and put it into the final package. However, in the last minutes and hours of the session, that bill did not pass. But I feel certain that everything that, well, we, I know everything that's in place now will remain in place. And I feel certain there are some that will come back and revisit some of those things that we talked about this year. The other tax credit that if directly impacted Columbus was the low income housing tax credit. It went through several gyrations as well. It did not pass. So we are just status quo. Uh, at one point, they were going to cut the availability up back to 50%, which would have really hurt some projects that are in the works here in Columbus. So it's a good thing it didn't pass for us. And hopefully, um, if they decide to make some adjustments to that, they will be uh, a little more um, thoughtful and careful and will not hurt our community. The last thing that did pass in the tax area was um, historic tax credits. It, the uh, residential historic tax credits were going to be um, sunsetting this year. And we were concerned because there are several projects around the state, including here in Columbus, that use those historic tax credits. We were able to extend the sunset for five years, so it will continue as it is with, two, with one change. We um, did get the opportunity to change the definition so that the Department of Community Affairs can say if this is, a, say, a neighborhood that is um, not designated as historic, as like on the National Historic Register, but is eligible for that, that they would be eligible for this tax credit with approval from the department. This is important because we have neighborhoods here in Columbus, and we also have them all across the state, where they are well-built homes that are in neighborhoods where people have um, gotten older or passed on, and the neighborhoods are falling into demise or into blight in some cases. This would be an opportunity to refurbish those neighborhoods and make some really great first-time homes for some young people that uh, are looking for something that's more affordable and a good home and help revitalize those communities. So the other thing that was in that bill that will help is a downtown development historic tax credit where you could have a store on the bottom floor and housing on the top. The last thing that I wanted to share with you that was on the list from the city was um, regarding uh, where to post signs about uh, abuse, child abuse, and we didn't have to pass a bill for that. It's already in rules and regs, and I brought copies of those to share with you at some point, but it tells where they are posted and it tells what is posted, and um, most of that goes through um, two different departments, education and the Department of Community Health. And um, so we didn't have to do a bill for that. And then the last thing I want to say is that we were able to pass this year. Unfortunately, we couldn't get it done before Colonel Puckett passed away. But there is a road naming here in Columbus that was approved for him. It's actually the roundabout at River Road and um, the, the new roundabout as you leave. Um, oh, Brad, ooh, what's the, the road that goes in front of Brookstone and... and and it's right Brandon there, that, right there. So that will be named for him. And um, we, are, of course, are very sad at his passing and very proud that he was a citizen of our city and our country because he did so many great things. Thank you for the privilege of speaking to you today and serving Thank you. you.
Good morning, Mayor and, and Council members. Um, I'm State Senator Randy Robertson. I represent uh, parts of or all of uh, Muskogee, Harris, Troop, Meriwether counties, and uh, serve in the State Senate. I'm the Majority Whip over there for the Republican Caucus. Um, Chairman uh, Harbison asked us to uh, identify ourselves and, and uh, Representative Smith said it the right way. Uh, I'm actually, I'm Teresa's husband. Would probably be the right way. I, I told him I would steal that from him. But um, we did have a, a very interesting session. Uh, one of the things that was very unique about it and uh, stressful at times is that we passed this budget that, um, that Representative Hudley was talking about on the last day of the session. And so there was a, a lot of back and forth, a lot of hard work done by both chambers. Um, the, the effort put in by uh, Chairman Hatchett over on the House side and Chairman Tillery over on the um, Senate side a lot of times gets lost in the conversation when we're discussing $36 billion. But they, along with the staff, and, and I know this body deals with uh, budgets, uh, big budgets also, and a lot of times uh, the average citizen hears the number, but they don't understand all the workings that go on behind the scenes and and the, uh, the, the sweat, blood, and tears that go into developing a budget. So it was a very uh, tough budget season. And one thing that made it even tougher was the fact that we lost uh, an extremely important person from our delegation, and that being uh, Rules Chairman Richard Smith. And uh, I can promise you the first uh, delegation meeting we, we had uh, after losing, unexpectedly losing, uh, Chairman Smith, is you could you could look around the room and see how all of us were stung uh, by that loss uh, because um, he and um, and our our delegation worked very closely together. We leaned into each other. Uh, we leaned into the to the availability that he had as rules chair, and thank goodness we have a, a leader such as Senator Harbison that was able to to keep us all together and keep us focused on what our mission was. And while 2,000 bills sounds like a lot, uh, the last day when I walked into Ledge Council, I think the number of bills that the lawyers had helped us put together was around 4,000. So luckily we were able to prevent a whole lot of uh, stuff from, from getting through and getting out that would have hurt us. Like, um, like Representative uh, Buckner said, the dropping the, the affordable housing from the current 80 down to the 50 would not have been a positive thing for Columbus and for Muskogee County. But we did pass some other legislation that, that, that was important. The governor signed yesterday a piece of legislation that allows the Department of Family and Children's Services to work closer with the feds, which will provide much more federal tax dollars coming back to help in our foster care programs here in the state. It also builds a stronger relationship with the uh, Center for Missing and Exploited Children that is recognized on the federal level so that we can continue to work in our foster care system to get these uh, children that are trapped uh, in that system out of hotels and into healthy families. Uh, tort reform is always a conversation. And one of the things that we did do for those in the mental health field is we gave them more immunity uh, from civil liability when it comes to just them doing their job. Uh, because we know in that field it is extremely uh, tough. The population they deal with each day, whether it's in West Central or whether it's at St. Francis or anywhere else, they deal with a very tough population. And, and for them to be able to go in there and, and with confidence do their job without the fear of uh, you know, somebody swooping in and, and holding them civilly liable for something that, that they really had no control over, we saw that as a, as, a, as a hamstringing that profession to a certain degree. So we were able to get that tort reform passed out by the House and the Senate. And I think it will go a long way in helping uh, the practitioners in the mental health field do what they needed to do. Um, we were able to complete the second part of our uh, bail bond reform uh, that the Wall Street Journal has recognized as an example that should be used around the country not only to give everybody an equal opportunity uh, if they are arrested and held in a county jail, but also to make our cities safer and our streets safer. And we were glad to do that. 
We had a PTSD bill for first responders that passed unanimously out of the House and the Senate, which offers a benefit opportunity to any first responder who suffers from severe post-traumatic stress disorder uh, based on uh, what happens on the job. And it was something long overdue, but again, it's a, it's a serious and important component to our uh, mental health agenda that Governor Kemp has championed along with uh, uh, the late House Speaker David Ralston. Uh, it was an extremely important part of their, uh, their plan and we continue moving forward with that. Uh, and to, to put a bow on, on my comments, uh, we did pass a resolution uh, just prior to uh, journey that we, along with uh, the, the city of Columbus, will be naming the interchange at Manchester Expressway in 85 after Chairman Richard H. Smith. And I think um, that will send a, a, a well, um, a strong message of appreciation to him and to his family and to this community that those who um, serve uh, the way he did should always be recognized. Uh, driving up here today, I realize that I have spent almost 40 years serving this community in, in some capacity. And I still find myself falling short of, of Richard Smith. And, but he has set a goal for me to follow and the rest of our delegation and under the leadership of Senator Ed Harbison, I have no doubt that we will continue uh, championing the city of Columbus under the Gold Dome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and City Council members. Thank you, sir. Good morning, Mayor, City Council. I'm Vance Smith. I'm State Rep, District 138. I have a 90% of Harris County, the northwestern portion of Muscogee County, and about 40% of Troop County. I follow the Chattahoochee River all the way up to Heard County. Uh, but it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to serve in this delegation, which I've served for a long time. I echo the comments that have been made by each one about the loss of uh, Richard Smith, a good friend. He and I sat on the same row, one seat apart, and uh, it is a big void right there. It's kind of interesting. We've got that seat on that row, and he was right on the end. And I've yet to see anyone walk up and sit down in that seat to communicate with somebody in that area where I sit. It's just kind of a reserved seat, and, uh, and it very well should be. I'm going to speak just a minute about the Richard H. Smith CHIPS Act. We've worked closely with uh, United Way, Mr. Ben Mosier, Ms. Jennifer Bickerstaff, with Mr. Bill Dudley from the Greater Columbus Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we're trying to entice the chips industry to come back to Georgia. Uh, right now, if you, if you Google that and look it up, over 90% of the chips are made in Taiwan. Uh, we, we've lost that industry for years. Uh, some of those chips that are manufactured there, they're not all packaged right there in Taiwan. A lot of those are packaged in China. And the chips go everything from your phone to your car to your washing machine. They're used in a lot of our uh, equipment that we have here. And it's also national security, too. So we want to bring that industry back to Georgia. So we introduced a bill, and we've had very good support and leadership of the House. Speaker Burns was second signer on that bill and the, the leadership in the House, and I was tickled with that. Uh, it got near the end of the session. We've had to rotate that bill on to another bill, 1026. So if you Google the Georgia General Assembly and look up HB 1026, you'll see that there are two bills there, and it's in that bill, the Richard H. Smith CHIPS Act. Um, this could be a huge benefit to the state of Georgia and to the United States, matter of fact. Uh, it's all under the pyramid and under the function of the one Georgia, Georgia authority, and it's totally depends, depends on funding. But we have a consortium that we've created, which are colleges across around the state of Georgia, uh, Columbus State being one of those. It also has an executive committee with appointments from the governor, lieutenant governor, and speaker of the house along with the chancellor from the University System of Georgia and the president of the Technical Colleges of Georgia. So we're excited. I, I must clarify that a lot of legislation that hadn't been signed immediately by the governor uh, is on his desk. It takes 40 days for us to go through a session. When we finish, the governor has 40 days. So I've been in contact with the governor's office last week, and uh, we, we're, we're going to stay positive and hope this is is signed and goes right on through. But 
really was an honor to do to do that, working hard with the delegation members, and we're just really tickled that it was successful in the House and the Senate, and uh, look forward to the governor signing that bill in the near future. But appreciate each of you. Nice working with y'all, and don't ever hesitate to give us a call. Let us know what we can do for you. Thank you very much. Well, oh, uh, how could I forget? <laughs> Representative Reese, I'm sorry. <laughs> How you doing, Mr. Mayor? I'm good, sir. How are you? It's been too long, my friend. Yes, it has. <laughs> well, Today. thank you for having us today. I am um, Representative Lady Catherine's daddy and Dr. Chastity Reese's husband, according to Randy Robinson, Representative Teddy Reese. It's truly an honor to be here. Um, last year, I stood before you as a rookie. Yeah. This year, I'm not quite a rookie, but I still have to go last because uh, <laughs> there's a lot of valuable experience and wisdom uh, that spoke before me, and I, and I must say what truly an honor it is and how blessed I am to be in Atlanta with such phenomenal leaders that we have here from Columbus that um, helped me maneuver the halls of the state capitol, which can be kind of consuming a little. But when you have a team like the one right here behind us, led by our chairman, um, you can't go wrong, and we are still held as the best delegation in the state of Georgia under the Gold Dome. Uh, we tend to get things done, and we, we're very good at what we do. So I'm honored to be a part of that team. And I just want to take a moment to say thank you to the house, to people of House District 140 for allowing me the opportunity to represent them in Atlanta and to the citizens of Columbus, Georgia, for this opportunity as well. And I also want to say thank you to you, Mr. Mayor, and members of council, and Dr. Hughley and your leadership team. Um, even though we had our hometown connection meeting, the conversations didn't stop then. All session, I was speaking with the Chief of Staff, Mr. Joshua Berg there, and uh, so many other leaders here. Um, uh, Councilor Begley, he and I had numerous conversations, and that's required to make sure that we are doing the work of the people of Columbus. Communication is, is just so critical. So we appreciate that and um, all the information that was shared. I was tasked today with talk about, a, I'm talking today about a few points. Um, one being housing, uh, we had several members of the Columbus community that visited us here in Atlanta um, during session. Uh, Mr. Broadwater being one of them and so many others that are here today that faces we have seen in Atlanta. And we always welcome the citizens of Columbus to come up there and see us. That's the people's house. We want you to be there. We want to hear from you. We want to see you so that we'll know what issues should be on the forefront of the table and what we need to be fighting for. Housing continues to be a very important conversation in Atlanta. As you know, we are engaging in many economic development initiatives throughout the states that will require some unique housing requirements, particularly some of the projects that we have going on along I-16, some of the new car plants that we have coming in, and hopefully that's setting a blueprint for what we hope will happen here in Columbus, Georgia, as we move forward with the, with the CHIPS initiative. We did pass a bill out of the House that focused on tenant rights, making sure that homes are habitable. We, we, we just feel that everyone should basically live in a home that's, that's decent for human decency. No one should have to live in a space that doesn't fit that bare minimum. So that we, are, we will be looking at. Um, as you heard, economic development, we are working every day hard on economic development, um, one being the CHIPS Act, in which I'm not going to repeat that, but also we are, I appreciate um, Representative Buckner for getting across the finish line, at least through the house, that uplift that we started talking about um, many, many um, years ago, but it was really got hot last summer, thanks to Pace Halter and the team over that Flat Rock here in Columbus. I'm after visiting the studio there and talking with other film leaders around the state of Georgia, especially around the outer perimeter. There is a need to make sure that the business is spread throughout the state because the tax credits that are delivered is not just for Metro Atlanta, it's for all of Georgia. And we all carry that burden, so we all should benefit from the, um, the, the uh, reap the benefits from that. Um, you guys asked us to look at legitimization. We did submit a um, house, house bill to take a look at that. It is still in the committee, so hopefully uh, we'll reintroduce that next year because, as you know, this is the second year of our term, so everything dies this year. So we have to reintroduce things. So we will be reintroducing that next year to continue that conversation. Also, with the question in regards to the tag conflict, that was introduced as well, and we will be revisiting that as well. I do want to share that uh, this delegation, um, especially with the leadership of our chairman and um, our uh, resident law enforcement expert, uh, Mr. Whip here, Majority Whip Randy Robinson, 
uh, we remain committed to public safety and we remain committed to helping our city council and the leaders here in this city uh, reduce crime here in this area. We're excited to announce that we did get almost $6 million in the budget, which will go toward the contribution of a GBI office here in Columbus, as well as a gang prosecutor out of the attorney general's office that will come in and help here in this area because we have heard the voice of the citizens. We hear the cry of people that are so committed to our town, that have lived here all their lives, and we wanna help get things back on track. So we understand that that's within your purview, but we want you to know that we are here fighting with you and we're getting the resources here to help us get that done. So we're very appreciative of the leadership of the, the, the Chairman Hatchett and, and, Chair, and Chairman Tillery for helping get that in the budget. And we hope that the governor will sign that so we can get that across the line and get this set up so we can get it done here in Columbus. Um, we, th this year was a great year recognizing some amazing people. It was a tough year for me. Uh, one, because my first year, I lost a very close classmate of mine who came in with us. She had only been there about six weeks. She sat right in front of me, would turn around quite often and have a conversation with me. Her name was Tish Nagisi and she represented the Fayetteville area. And then to come this session and lose the chair, uh, chairman of our rules committee, a very important person of our delegation. I was looking back through some house photos last night and I noticed that the house photographer caught a few photos of me kneeling at Chairman Smith's desk, asking him a question or talking to him about some legisl legislation. And that picture really caught my relationship with him. Though it was very short compared to the wisdom that I have here behind me, I will forever cherish the moments that I had to work with him in Atlanta and the patience he had with me and the things that he helped me to understand. And it was mentioned earlier that we will be naming an intersection after him where there are two more historical names that we will have this summer as well. Uh, one, we will be honoring the very first African-American woman elected to the Georgia House of Representatives from Columbus, Representative Morella Taylor. She will have an intersection as well, and it will be at the corner of Interstate 185 and Buena Vista Road. That's right, Rep. Hughley? That's right. And I want to thank Representative Carolyn Hughley um, for leading us on this and just her leadership in general. That lady is a ball of wisdom, you guys, and I'm just so blessed to be in the suite with her because I have unlimited access, Mr. Mayor. And I take advantage of it. <laughs> she, she is very helpful. <laughs> but um, and, and I also want to share that um, this year we will also be honoring uh, a, a gentleman that I hold in the highest regard, someone who um, I have the pleasure of following his steps here within the city. He served us for 48 years with, 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 with the highest dignity, with the, with the highest level of honor, with the highest level of integrity. And no one ever questioned his commitment to Columbus, Georgia. And that's now um, UN representative, former dean of the House of Representatives, Calvin Smyron. We will be naming the intersection right here. I shot from this building, Macon Road at 185. That's a very amazing man, someone who deserves it. And I'm glad that he's here with us to see it because oftentimes we don't get to give people that flowers while they're still here. And we want him to know that we appreciate his lifelong dedication to this city. And as people transverse this city and as Columbus continues to grow, in which we will, because we cannot let Augusta get that number two spot again, they will know the leaders upon whose shoulders we stand. Those who paved the way, those who fought the fight, those who sacrificed the most so that Columbus can be what she is today. And with that, Mr. Mayor, I want to say thank you to, again to you and our wonderful, amazing leaders for what you do here. Thank you, Dr. Hughley, for your persistence, for your knowledge, for your information that you've shared with us, and, and for, for staying on us as well, making sure that we have what we needed to be successful. And I will turn it back over to our chairman to close us out. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, members of council and mayor and city manager. We certainly appreciate you listening. We tried to be as concise as we could dealing with so many issues that we had to deal with during the session. So we stand ready to serve you. Thank you for everything you do. I know it's not easy. Being elected is uh, you have to sort of, uh, sort of multitask and have a lot of godly favor on your side when you're doing that. So we certainly appreciate what you do, what you endure, and what you're going to do, the great thanks for our, all of our citizens of Columbus, Georgia. Thank you once again so much. My great delegation back in. You give them a hand, everybody. They're good people. They really are. They're good people. 
And we, we, we thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless and show you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. We've got a few council, uh, Councilor Huff. Good morning. Uh, we are on the local level, but I know you all work so very hard, and I just want to take time to say thank you. We, we spend time here locally working for the people. You all do it locally and statewide for your districts and everything, but uh, thanks for the update. Uh, I was sitting here tracking some of the things you all were talking about on the uh, ACCG app, looking at the bills and things you all were talking about. And so we go through GMA and ACCG to keep up with what you all are doing during the session, and they give us an update every Friday. So thank all of you all for what you do. Thank we you. appreciate you so much. Thank you. Thank you. City, City Manager. Uh, uh, good morning, Mayor, Council, and I just want to uh, take this opportunity to thank the members of our delegation uh, for their service. Um, we, Mayor, um, sit on the Legislative Policy Committee um, for the Georgia Municipal Association. Uh, we meet at 8.30 every Monday morning uh, when um, you guys are in session. And, and oftentimes uh, we get asked to uh, contact our delegation to help other areas. Uh, and uh, we text you, we email you, we call you, and uh, you always answer our call, each and every member uh, of our delegation. And so uh, because you are readily available to us and, and you support us, you contact us when there's something on the floor that doesn't sound right, doesn't smell right, uh, you text us. You, you email us, you call us. And, and, and even when I'm in meetings, uh, I could be sitting in a meeting with the mayor and your number pops up on uh, the phone or any member of the delegation. We answer those calls. We stop the meeting, we answer those calls when you're in session because things move uh, at a fast pace and, and uh, we know that it's something important to you and it has to be something important for our city. So. Thank you for your service, your commitment, dedication, for all that you do for Columbus, Georgia. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Senator Mayor. Thank you, sir. And, and let me just add finally that, uh, of course, first of all, and most of all, thank you. Uh, and and we, uh, we are delighted that there are some actions being taken to uh, memorialize uh, Rev, uh, Richard Smith. Uh, and, but I, wanna, I just want to mention something that to me is important because the over the years, the faces have changed a little bit on our uh, that, that serve uh, the folks here at home, but but the culture of what you bring to the to the state legislature has not, and that is what makes people ask our city manager, ask me, ask some of our other counselors, um, how we get things done, and it's because of the attitude that you bring to your jobs, uh, and that is that you may get behind close doors and caucus and the fur may fly and y'all may get a little bit upset at one another, but you understand who you're working for. And when you come out of that door, Amen. you're speaking with one voice. And that is what has raised you above so many delegations in the legislature. We recognize that. We're very proud of that. And we want to thank you for that. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Teamwork is so important. God bless you. Thank yes, you. Sir. One thank team you. for God and country. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. All right, we do, we do have a couple of uh, proclamations uh, today. Uh, one, excited about, about all of them, but really excited about this one. It's uh, a proclamation for Arts and Culture Month. Uh, Carrie Beth Wallace, uh, who is the uh, publisher of the Columbus site and also uh, serves as sort of a, a, an officially unofficial liaison with the mayor's office to keep us abreast of what's going on. Uh, and Councilor Kogel, uh, will present this proclamation. Good morning. Good morning. It's my pleasure to read this into the record. Whereas the arts in Columbus, Georgia are a vibrant and essential part of the quality of life for our citizens. And whereas the arts are a major part of economic development in Columbus, Georgia, and whereas cities rich in arts and culture assets are statistically healthier and more prosperous overall. And whereas Columbus, Georgia will celebrate 
Arts and Culture Month during the entire month of April. These celebrations will include Arts Fest, a month-long celebration of the city's rich creative talent and many arts organizations striving to cap captivate and inspire diverse audiences of all ages every day. Arts, art Fest will celebrate the important contributions of the arts, make uh, that the art fe Arts Fest will celebrate the important contribution that the arts make to an increased quality of life in Columbus, Georgia, thanks to many artists and creative industry professionals who live and work here every day. And whereas Arts Fest will encompass more than 70 events from over 20 present presenting organizations throughout the month of April, include more than 100 local artists and feature the first annual Arts Fest block party on April 20th from 9 a.m. To, to noon on the grounds of the River Center of, for the Performing Arts. And whereas the arts in our city increase the quality of life, contribute to economic development, and are an essential part of our educational curriculum in our schools and beautify our cities, or, or beautify our community through acting as a source of joy and renewal of spirit. And whereas the City Council of Columbus, Georgia urges citizens to support the arts and their continued development in our city. And whereas the City Council of Columbus, Georgia supports the collaborative efforts of the Columbus Cultural Alliance, Arts Alliance, the Columbusite, and many artists from the, and many artists and patrons of our community in their efforts to continue fostering the environments where arts are celebrated and flourish in Columbus, Georgia. Now, therefore, I, on behalf of Skip Henderson III, Mayor of Columbus, Georgia, do hereby proclaim April 2024 as Arts and Culture Month. Carrie Beth, before you start your remarks, I'm going to ask, we've got a lot of people here yes, representing you. different areas of, our, of the arts in Columbus. Could y'all come up and stand at the podium as well, please? I think it's important the public and the council see just how many people are, are working every day to... Uh, to enhance the arts in Columbus. We brought a crowd, Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> First and foremost, if I may, I would just like to thank the mayor and um, his staff who have helped make this possible. Um, thank you to everyone who's here this morning, especially my esteemed colleagues um, who I represent uh, only as your arts liaison for the, for the first time in the city. First of all, um, thank you for creating this position. Like you said, the unofficial official position. <laughs> but um, I would not be standing here if it were not for the incredible programming of the people behind me. Every single one of these organizations not only provides and presents shows, concerts, um, educational opportunities. Um, there, I can't, I'm just, there's so many things. Ballet, I mean, everyone is here. Everyone is here, uh, including some people who had to scoot out. I mean, Columbus State University is here. I mean, we just, we are working together, um, but I would not be here if it were not for what they do every day. So if everyone would give them a round of applause, this is why Arts and Culture Month exists. The proclamation went over 90% of what I was going to say to you. So I will just say thank you. I want to reiterate that the arts are a powerful engine for economic development. I know that a lot of our legislators that were here this morning have advocated for Columbus on multiple occasions in the arts in particular, and I want to thank them for that as well. Um, we hope that the entire community will join us for the Arts Fest block party. It is uh, Saturday, April 20th from 9 to noon, and I want to give a special thanks to our host, the River Center. Norm Easterbrook and his team are here this morning. They um, are providing the venue for us, um, and I want to go over just very quickly things you can expect from us that day. Um, 
The block party will include live music performances on the hour by multiple organizations that specialize not only in educational performances, such as our youth orchestra, who is with us this morning. Um, we also have the Columbus Jazz Society performing and several ensembles from the Schwab School of Music at Columbus State University. Um, in addition, you can expect to see family-friendly activities. Our partners at the Columbus Symphony Orchestra and the Youth Orchestra are teaming up to provide an instrument petting zoo for children which I'm very excited about. There will be um, strings and honking, and I'm sure lots of fun things for the community to engage with. Uh, we'll also have some stilt walkers. Uh, Springer Academy students will be there in person if you've never seen them walking around. They're fabulous, uh, incredibly entertaining. Um, we will also have a pop-up exhibition of uh, nearly 60 artists from around the community who were invited to submit their work for free. They will sell their work, um, as well as hopefully have a wonderful opportunity, along with our partners in the arts, to engage with the community on a face-to-face -face basis. Um, this is the first time since 2019 we have had a designated month for the arts in Columbus, Georgia. So thank you to the mayor and council for making that a priority. Um, the biggest thing I wanna say to you this morning is that while April is a phenomenal opportunity to celebrate arts and culture and everything that the arts are doing to continue creating economic development and contribute to the quality of life here, the reality is that our arts programming is this strong year round. April's fabulous. There are 70 events in 30 days. I dare you to look at the calendar for December. We can barely keep up with everything that is happening and I just would really encourage our community um, members of council to continue engaging with these organizations behind me. The arts make us better human beings. Statistically, they make us healthier in our communities. Um, we I could go on and on about economic development in general. Americans for the Arts just published their most recent um, survey of the economic impact of the arts across the nation. Um, those numbers are available on their website. In Georgia, it's over a trillion dollars. I mean, it's, it's remarkable. Um, and again, arts education, I know in our city, uh, in Muskogee County is championed. We are fortunate to be in a community where the arts are a vital and important asset. I know that each of you see it that way. And I thank you for sitting in these chairs and continuing to say that. Um, at any time you have any questions about what is going on in the arts, I would invite you to contact me and I will put you in contact with all of these people that I represent. They are incredible. I am but a little cheerleader on all of their work. And um, it's a privilege, again, to serve as your first arts liaison. Thank you for making that a priority. And um, thank you to everyone in this room. Please bring your people to the Arts Fest block party. We would love to see you. We would love to engage with you. And most importantly, I want everyone to come see these artists and all of these organizations. They will be there that morning with marketing material. They will share with you what they have coming up. Um, it is free. Public transportation is running that morning. We're working hard to take as many barriers down to accessibility as possible. Um, it's a market day on Broadway. We should have quite a crowd. So I hope you'll come and join us. And thank you for the privilege of speaking to you this morning. I appreciate thank, you. Thank you, Carrie. Is there any way we can get all of y'all very, very quickly to come through and just tell us what uh, what area you represent? Because uh, there's there's something for everybody. I mean, we saw we saw Def Leppard cover band on. Friday, and then yeah. saw Renee Fleming on Saturday. I mean, that's a pretty broad spectrum. That's great. Uh, I'm Kern Watkins. I'm the executive director of the Columbus Symphony Orchestra. Good morning. I'm Rachel Morway, and I'm the executive director of the Youth Orchestra of Greater Columbus. Hi there. I'm Shelby Guest, uh, vice president of Visit Columbus GA. Good morning, I'm Crystal Gavin, the Executive Director of Clement Arts. Good morning, my name is Miguel Juarez. I'm the President of the Columbus Jazz Society. Good morning, Danielle Varner, CEO and Executive Producer of the Springer Opera House, your State Theater of Georgia. Good morning, I'm Robin Peacock. I'm the Director of Facility and Event Operations at the River Center for the Performing Arts. Good morning, I'm Carrie Corbett, Director of Marketing at River Center for the Performing Arts. I'm Norm Easterbrook, Director of River Center. Hi, I'm Jennifer Joyner, I'm President of the Columbus Ballet. Monica Luger, I serve on the board. 
Mary Roddenberry. I serve on the board. I'm Tate LeClaire, and I'm the Director of Development for the Springer Opera House. Good morning. I'm Keith McCoy, and I'm the Artistic Director at the Springer Opera House. Good morning. I'm Kevin Baxley. I am the uh, Events and Rentals Coordinator at the Springer Opera House, and I'm also the Co-Director of No Shame Theater. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Katie Underwood, the associate producer at the Springer Opera House. Fantastic. A lot of really great things going on in the arts community. If you would, come around, let us shake your hand. Thank you, and I'll give you your proclamation. Thank, thank you. Y'all can come around. So thank y'all, too. A lot of exciting things going on in the arts community. All right, next, uh, we have a proclamation for National Therapy Animal Day. Uh, Councillor Begley will present that. Uh, Angie Zapata, is Angie here? And anybody else that wants to come up for uh, Therapy Animal Day? Oh, Councillor, oh, I'm sorry, Councillor uh, Tucker, did you have? No, no, I was just trying to see if the League of Women Voters, because the election day. Oh, okay. Councillor Begley, you want to hit your light? I think you've got this one, right? Hi there. Good morning. Good morning. It's my pleasure to read this into the record. Whereas Pet Partners has designated April 30th as National Therapy Animal Day, and whereas scientific research shows that interacting with therapy animals can reduce stress, relieve depression, slow heart rate, lower blood pressure, and strengthen the immune system, and whereas therapy animal teams in the town of Opatoy play an essential role in improving human health and well-being through the human-animal bond, and whereas therapy animal teams interact with a variety of people in our community, including veterans, seniors, patients, students, and those approaching end of life, and whereas these exceptional therapy animals who partner with their human companions bring comfort and healing to those in need, and whereas we encourage more pet owners to consider becoming pet partner volunteers to help our community by creating greater access to meaningful therapy animal visits. Now therefore, B.H. Skip Henderson III, Mayor of Columbus, does hereby proclaim Tuesday, April 30th, 2024 as National Therapy Animal Day. Good morning. Good Thank morning. you again for another year where you guys declare the 30th of April for the National Therapy Day, uh, Animal Day. 
I am Angie Zapata. I'm the founder of Pet Partners of Columbus. And yes, it said Upatoy. I thought I had changed that. No, that's where I live. Nobody cares about that. We <laughs> are actually doing visits at local hospitals, nursing homes, schools, libraries. And I know some of you guys, sheriffs, sheriffs, not sheriff's office, but in the jail. So we, we do a lot. So I'm going to let everyone introduce themselves because every one of them does an awesome Introduce job. your fur baby there, too. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> yeah. Well, the reason I forgot is I just retired my Rottweiler because last year I was here with a Rottweiler. His name is Sam, and he retired after doing seven years. And so this is Bailey. He has been doing it since January, so he's pretty new. That's why he's still a little up and down, running around, so... And he's not even two yet, so thank you. Come on, baby. Let's go over here. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm Claire Bedingfield, and this is Sassy, and we visit memory care. Hello, my name's Karen Knutson, and we team with Diesel, and uh, we tend to go to a lot of hospitals and nursing homes. I'm Wilma Levinson, and this is my dog, Frankie. She's been certified since last May. Um, she'll be two at, next week. <laughs> I'm Shannon Zeisloff, and this is Beethoven. He's been serving since 2015, so nine years now. Beethoven's a star, too. I believe he got a little coverage. <laughs> Good talk, Kevin. Um, I'm Irma Rodriguez, and this is Gabriella, and we've been doing this for 10 years. This is her 10th year. And then I also have a, a one that just started, and she's just about one year now. So I have two therapy dogs. Hi, I'm Sharon Dollar, and this is Layla. Um, Layla is just about to turn two. She's been do, being a therapy dog since she was one. And we primarily go to the Rehabilitation Hospital of Columbus every week. And when she enters the building and sees the therapy room, she just, oh, woo, 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 which is her <laughs> excitement thing. And they know her. They see her coming down the halls. Layla! So we like going to the same place every week. Um, the staff know her. She helps the staff and the, the patients as well. And she's a great therapy dog. Great. Hi, I'm Cosina Marshall. This is Curly. We go into uh, Orchard View once a month with Miss Zapata. Thank you. Well, thank you for what you're doing, and uh, thank you for bringing your partners in here today so that we could thank them as well. Angie, if you want to come around here, yes. the rest of you want to come around, we'll be glad to shake your hand and thank you again. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. It should be enough. I you call me. Let me know. Yeah, I appreciate it. Oh, you're good. You're good. Thank you all so much. <laughs> that is one cute little pepper. Hey, thank you all for what you did. Eleven. She's so sweet. Our dog is eleven. Hey, thank y'all for what you did. Thank you so much. Okay, I, I didn't get the first ones either. Thank you. Thank you. He's famous now. <laughs> so much for what y'all are doing. Thank you, baby. Thank you, sir. I'm good. Thank y'all for what you do. We have a dog that announces she does that kind of a moose roar. Thank you so much for what you do. Oh, my dad has a black bug. Thank y'all.
Next, we have a proclamation uh, in recognition of Child Abuse Prevention Month. Councillor Thomas will be presenting to uh, Margaret Cofer uh, and the uh, other folks from the Exchange Club. <clears throat> Good morning, ladies. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm uh, privileged to read this into the uh, record this morning. Whereas Child Abuse Prevention Month is a time to acknowledge the importance of families and communities working together to prevent child abuse and neglect and to promote the social and emotional well-being of children and families. And whereas child abuse is a serious and growing problem affecting more than 3.2 million of our nation's children annually and thousands of children locally. And whereas this blight on our society that affects our children who are abused, neglected, or traumatized must be alleviated. And whereas the societal uh, malignancy called child abuse respects no racial, religious, class, or geographical boundaries and is in fact, and in fact has been declared a national emergency. And whereas child abuse prevention became the Exchange Club's national project in 1979 at the 61st National Exchange Club Convention, and whereas the Exchange Club of Columbus provides a variety of public awareness materials designed to help inform and increase awareness of child abuse and how it can be prevented. And whereas the Exchange Club of Columbus seeks to help families and those who support and encourage families as they seek to understand and problem solve the various challenges that come with raising children and whereas the Exchange Club of Columbus time out Teddy mascot uh, will tell you to take time out to know your child. Take time out to learn uh, about discipline. Take time out to help when you see the warning signs. And take time out to prevent child abuse. Now, therefore, Skip Henderson, Mayor of Columbus, Georgia, does hereby proclaim the month of April 2024 as Child Abuse Prevention Month. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm Karen Bush, the president of our Columbus chapter of the Exchange Club, and this is Margaret Cofer. She's the director of our Child Abuse Prevention Program. She voluntold me to receive this in her stead. <laughs> uh, but we appreciate the proclamation very much. As you know, that the child abuse prevention is the main platform for the Exchange Club. And uh, through our, um, jambor our hot dog jamboree and our pancake jamboree that y'all are all familiar with, um, we support uh, child advocacy centers here in Columbus, such as Children's Treehouse, Truth Springs Academy, Micah's Promise, and, and many others. And we also provide the uh, timeout teddy bears to the police officers here in Columbus so that when they respond to a call where a child's involved, they've got the teddy bears to give to the children to help uh, calm them and provide some distraction. And as, as you all know, child abuse is very prevalent in Columbus much more than the citizens, residents of Columbus, Georgia are aware of. And I think um, the highlight of the current trial going on has brought some awareness to that. But with our proximity to Atlanta and the hub there at the Jackson Hartfield Airport, we, it's, it's much more prominent and it's um, a much more existing evil and problem here in Columbus and appreciate y'all's assistance with raising awareness to that issue. Margaret. And like she said, I'm Marguerite Kepfer and I'm so glad she said it all because the cat got my tongue. <laughs> so I really appreciate everything, Mr. Cool. Mayor and 
members of the council. We are extremely grateful for the Exchange Club. Y'all, in addition to focusing on child abuse prevention, you also have an incredible partnership with our public safety and with the veterans of our community, so we thank you. If you would come around, let us shake your hand. Thank you, and I'll give you your proclamation. Okay, next uh, we've got a proclamation commending the League of Women Voters of the Chattahoochee Valley and its election volunteers. I know I saw a couple of them here as well as uh, the head of our elections and registration, uh, Nancy Bourne. Ms. Bourne, you want to come up as well? And Councilor Tucker is going to present the proclamation. Hey, ladies. <clears throat> I wanted it to be a surprise. That's why I didn't say anything. <laughs> I have been working with um, the League of Women Voters since 2020, and we've done some amazing things. Um, actually did a event at CSU and registered so many people. So this, this, I'm very honored to be able to read this proclamation for you all. Thank you. Whereas... The League of Women Voters of the Chattahoochee Valley is a nonpartisan organization working to register voters, provide election information, and advocate on behalf of voters. And whereas the League participates in voter registration drives and works year round to make sure all eligible Americans, especially first time voters, non college youth, new citizens, communities of color, and low income people can register and vote. Whereas the league educates voters about candidates of all races and works to increase voters access to the polls. And whereas the league staffs an information table with volunteers each election day to provide precinct location information to voters at the city services center. These volunteers have assisted over 1,000 voters since 2020 and remain an important part of the election process. And whereas vote411.org is a one-stop shop for election-related information that provides general and state-specific nonpartisan resources to the voting public, including a nationwide polling place locator, a ballot lookup tool candidate positions on issues, and more. And now, therefore, B.H. Skip Kennerson III, Mayor of Columbus, Georgia, do hereby proclaim Tuesday, April 9th, 2024, as the, the League of Women Voters of the Chattahoochee Valley Day. <laughs> Thank you so much, Toya. I was, I was hoping you would be the one reading this, and I thank Nancy for Nancy Boren for putting us in for this proclamation. This is a perfect timing for this. <clears throat> We've been in existence as a small local group since 2017, but the league itself has been around since 1920, the League of Women Voters nationally. So we're just glad to be part of that. And when we when we got started, there had been groups here in the in Columbus previously, but it had kind of gone defunct. And um, we decided that we wanted to get together and we represent the whole area. That, that's why we chose the name Chattahoochee Valley, because I live in Harris County. My friend Eileen lives in Muskogee County, and my friend Barbara lives in Phoenix City. So we're, the rep we're representing Eileen asked if we should be called Valley Girls, but I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> but we do stand on some important shoulders. Uh, Augusta Howard was an early suffragette born in Columbus. I think I believe there was a plaque 
that was established to honor her in Columbus, placed near the uh, the city hall in uh, in in 2020. We were going to have a big event for that, and the pandemic kind of interrupted that. So, uh, and I believe it did happen anyway. And Augusta Howard is buried in Linwood Cemetery, so we do have some connections that can be pointed to. We too try to get active in any way we can to help people know about voting and how they should go about it and to be registered and to how to check their registration. It's so important. People don't always realize that they're, what, that they're registered and that you have to register in order to vote. Uh, there are some states that allow you to, you don't have to register. I think it's only uh, North Dakota that you just come. You don't have to be registered, but every other state does require registration. And there's so many different rules, but uh, so it's important to get to acquainted with all of those, even though we only have to worry about here in Georgia. And um, so we're just happy to be part of that and uh, to be able to register voters and to present education. The whole point is to not endorse parties, not endorse candidates, but to make sure people are aware of how to prepare for and plan to vote um, and know where they're supposed to go. That's that was an interesting phenomenon that, that Nancy discovered and that people show up here at the Citizen Service Center on election day because early voting occurs here, but election day, it does not. So we've, as a, I, I guess you tallied them all up, Nancy, how many, we don't really have a counter to click these, but um, you can kind of get a pretty good idea. It's not so busy today because today is the, special election to fill the vacancy left by the death of Richard Smith, who was spoken about earlier today. But uh, so I'm sad to say that despite the fact there are four people running to fill the remainder of his term, I don't think a lot of people have been voting and they don't may not even know they're supposed to vote or they can vote. So we still have work to do in getting people educated. But we're thank you for this proclamation and for the recognition of the important work that's done by your elections director and by others in the community. Thank you so much. Ms. Moore, did you want to make any comments? I would love to uh, say that, that this was my idea, but Jane actually came to us after a board of elections meeting and said, hey, can we help you out? Can we help come staff a table? And they have done that every election and helped so many vo voters. What they didn't tell you, though, is that they have taken them in their own personal vehicles, uh, disabled voters yeah. who were dropped off here and couldn't make, make it to the right location. They've actually driven them there. And if you ever see them wheeling someone across the way to the public library, it's because they were dropped off at the wrong building. They've been a tremendous asset for us. It's freed up our staff to do things that we needed to do on Election Day, and we're extremely thankful for uh, their volunteering uh, <coughs> in the elections process since 2020. Well, ladies, we're very grateful for your volunteer work, but also for your advocacy and your education. So if you would come around, I'll present you a proclamation. We'll thank you properly. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're um, I'm, we're going to finish with the presentations, and then I'm going to call up. We've got a number of people here, I think, on one particular item. We'll call that up uh, after this. These last two presentations. The the next is the um, uh, FY23 annual comprehensive financial report, the CAFR, presented by David Irwin, from our external auditors Malden and Jenkins. Welcome, Mr. Irwin. Good morning, everyone. Um, I, I tell you, this is a tough act to follow to come behind the proclamations. Uh, it, it was it was nice to sit here and uh, and hear about all the great things that are going on in the city and, and the people that are doing them. So I, I do want to take a moment to congratulate the recipients 
and, uh, and, and thank them for their, for their service. Um, but again, my name's David Irwin. I'm with Malden Jenkins. I was the partner who oversaw this year's audit of the government's financial statements. And uh, I, I do appreciate the opportunity to be here and discuss you all the results of this year's audit. Uh, I won't take up too much of your time, but uh, the purpose of today's presentation is to provide you all an overview of our independent auditor's report, um, talk about the results of the two compliance reports that we issue in conjunction with the audit, um, hit a few of the financial statement highlights, discuss some information that the auditing standards requires that we report to you all, we, we disclose to you all, and then obviously uh, to, to answer any questions that you all may have. Uh, now, what the government is required to have conducted annually is a financial and compliance audit, which is what we conducted and what we are presenting to you all this morning. Um, there are several different types of audits. Sometimes, sometimes there's a little bit of confusion over what a financial and compliance audit is. Um, but the objective of our audit is to obtain reasonable assurance uh, about whether the financial statements are free from material misstatement, whether due to error or fraud. Uh, the purpose of a financial audit is really just to enhance the degree of confidence of the intended users of your financial statements. That includes citizens, uh, investors and creditors, management, uh, and elected officials such as yourselves. So uh, management is responsible for the preparation and presentation of the financial statements. Part of our responsibility um, is to identify and assess risk of material misstatement and design and perform our audit uh, procedures to respond to those risks. We don't review every transaction that occurs during the year. Um, rather, what we do, we examine on a test basis um, evidence regarding uh, amounts and disclosures in your financial statements. So again, um, just wanted to kind of further clarify what a financial and compliant audit is and, uh, and why our governments are required to have that on an annual basis. Uh, now onto the audit themselves. Again, the, the, the financial statement themselves that have been presented to you all um, are the responsibility of management and members of the council. As your independent external auditors, our responsibility is to issue an opinion on these statements. Uh, we conducted our audit in accordance with generally accepted accounting standards and governmental auditing standards, and I'm happy to say that we are issuing a clean or unmodified opinion on this year's report. Again, this is what you want. Uh, this is the highest level of assurance we can provide as your external auditor. What this means is that, in our opinion, the financial statements are considered to be fairly presented in all material respects in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. Uh, as part of the audit, there are two compliance uh, reports that we also issue, uh, the first of which is the single audit. Um, again, a single audit is a compliance audit uh, that is required when an entity has over $750,000 uh, of federal expenditures uh, in, in any given year. Uh, you all had approximately $23.6 million of federal expenditures during FY23, uh, which resulted in a single audit of four major programs. As was the case with the financial audit, uh, we are issuing a clean or unmodified opinion on the single audit as well. Uh, the second compliance report is something called the Yellow Book Report, uh, which is a report on the government's compliance with, uh, with, with laws and regulations. Uh, we did have one audit finding uh, this year involving the tax commissioner's office uh, and, and really just the overall timeliness of financial reporting. Um, due to turnover and understaffing of that office, uh, bank reconciliations were not being uh, prepared on a monthly basis. So therefore, there was a delay in getting us the necessary information we needed in order to get the audit uh, com completed. Um, you know, much of the information that we requested from the tax commissioner's office at the beginning of the audit uh, was not received until December or January, uh, which obviously resulted in a delay um, in, in the government not meeting uh, the, the state's 1231 uh, deadline. We have discussed this extensively with, with the tax commissioner's office. They have con concurred with our finding. Um, they believe that have, improvements have been uh, made to prevent such delays going forward. Um, has, as regards to the overall audit, um, I, I do want to uh, thank Angelica, Jody, um, and the entire finance department um, for all their hard work this year. Um, they were very accommodating to our audit team and worked hard to address all of our questions and, and get us everything that we needed in order to get the audit finalized. Um, you, know, you all obviously are one of the largest cities in Georgia, so there's obviously, obviously significant financial activity for which you all uh, have to account for. In addition, with all the new accounting standards, 
and, and changes and, and really just how complex the financial reporting process has become. Um, your finance department did a great job this year and, and we certainly appreciate their hard work. I do also want to commend your audit committee. Um, it's a new committee this year. We met twice with them during the audit. Our last meeting was about two weeks ago. We had about an hour conversation. Um, they were very involved, very thorough in their questions. Uh, we had about an hour discussion where again, they, they asked some, some really good questions and, and we were able to go over the financial statements in more detail uh, than, than I'll be able to do so this, this morning as a result of time. Uh, but again, they, uh, they didn't go through the motions. They were very thorough and uh, with a community as, as big as you all are, I think it's, it's important to have such an audit committee. So again, I just, I wanna thank them uh, and commend them for all their hard work as well. Uh, now for a brief overview of your financial statements. Uh, you know, you all prepare what is called an annual comprehensive financial report, uh, otherwise known as an ACFR. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> uh, now an ACFR requires the inclusion of additional information that goes above and beyond the basic financial reporting requirements. Uh, this document is submitted annually to the Government Finance Officer Association, uh, otherwise known as GFOA, and they put it through a pretty stringent review process. Uh, they have not only professional staff, but also a special review committee uh, that looks at this document. And they, you know, when they look at the government's act for their goal is not to assess uh, the financial health of the government. What they want to do is make sure that the necessary information uh, is in your financial statements so the readers of your report can do so themselves. And uh, through this review, uh, the GFOA has once again awarded the government the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting. And uh, for FY22, and that certificate is included in this year's report. And uh, I believe this is the 33rd year in a row that the government has received this certificate. So, um, you know, we audit around 175 entities throughout the Southeast uh, that received this certificate, and, and very few can, can say that they, received, they have received it for 30 plus years. So, again, that's just a, another example of you all going above and beyond and, uh, and continue to raise the bar. So, uh, Again, this is an impressive document and certainly something you all should be proud of. Uh, as you look through this report, uh, one section I always like to point out is the management discussion analysis, otherwise known as the MDNA. This begins on page five. It's right after our audit opinion. Um, if you can, I would strongly encourage you all to read the MDNA. Uh, the purpose of the MDNA is to make it easier. Uh, for a broader audience to use and better understand your financial statements. And it does this uh, by providing a, a narrative explanation of the financial statements from management's perspective. So um, if you have a question about any fluctuations in financial activity um, or anything unique or unusual that occurred during the year, oftentimes you can find your answer within the MDNA. Uh, there's also quite a bit of comparative information in this section, meaning financial information for FY23 and 22 is included. <laughs> Uh, which to me, it adds a lot of value to the reader. You know, it gives you much better understanding of the current year information when you have prior year numbers available for comparative purposes. So um, if you can, please take the time to read through the MDNA. Uh, now the government's basic financial statements are broken down into three components. Uh, the first of bit, which being the government-wide financial statements. Uh, the government-wide financial statements, they provide a broad view of the government's operations in a manner similar to that of a private sector business. Um, all of the government's funds are combined into two columns depending on the nature of the fund. You have a column for your governmental activities uh, as well as a separate column for your business type activities. There are also separate columns in this statement um, for your, your discreetly represented component units. Uh, we have a slide here um, that summarizes the government's financial activity for the year from the government-wide perspective. Um, I obviously won't talk about every number on this slide, um, but you, as you can see, we have a column for the government-wide I'm sorry, for the government itself, uh, the government's component units, your fiduciary funds, and um, the combined total. But um, you know, again, component units, they are, they are legally separate entities, uh, but due to their relationship with the government, they're still required to be uh, reported within the government's financial statements. Uh, fiduciary funds, they, are, they account for assets held in, in a trustee manner um, for outside parties. And examples um, uh, of these funds are your pension trust funds, uh, the tax commissioner's offices, the probate court, et cetera. But uh, you know, due, to, due to time, I'll uh, you know, just briefly talk about the government itself, uh, which again is on that first column. But as you all can see, uh, you ended the year with assets of around 1.3 billion. 
um, approximately 592 million of which are your capital assets, net of accumulated appreciation. Again, when I talk about capital assets, that's land, buildings, machinery, equipment, vehicles, et cetera, that are owned by the government. Um, total liabilities were around 722 million. Of that amount, around 511, are long, 511 million are long-term in nature, meaning they're not due within the next fiscal year. Uh, the government had revenues of approximately 415 million. And that's an increase. Um, of around $48 million compared to prior year. Again, uh, much of this increase uh, is attributed to the various taxes that you all received, uh, such as property taxes, sales taxes, um, hotel, motel, hotel motel taxes, business taxes, taxes et cetera. Um, expenses total $338 million, which was an increase of about $14 million compared to 22. Public safety expenditures uh, represented the majority of this overall increase, and uh, this resulted in ending that position of $547 million, uh, which is an increase of approximately $77 million for the year. So again, from a government-wide perspective, a, a, a good year for you all. Revenues increased by about 13% uh, compared to an increase in expenses of only about 4%. And again, this, uh, this resulted in an overall increase in your net position of approximately 16% for the year. Uh, the second component of your financial statements are the fund level statements. Again, this is what you all see uh, typically throughout the year. Uh, this component focuses uh, on individual parts of the government and reports your operations in more detail than that of the entity-wide statements. And, you know, of all the funds that you all have, uh, if, I'm in, if I'm in your shoes, my primary focus is on the general fund. Again, the general fund um, is the main operating fund of the government and accounts for the majority of your revenues received and funds expended. We have a couple slides, uh, the, the first of which um, is a chart that breaks out the general fund's revenues for the year. Again, this is just the general fund. But uh, total revenues were around $238.9 million. That's an increase of about $13.3 million compared to FY22. Um, you know, again, like nearly all governments, the majority of your, of your revenues are derived from taxes, uh, which were a little over $208 million for the year. You know, as I mentioned earlier, um, the increase in taxes is, is, is really what attributes to your increase in, in, in revenues in your general fund. Uh, but again, to break down the, the $200 million a little further, property taxes uh, made up $72 million of that. Sales taxes were just under $100 million, and, uh, and other taxes uh, were approximately $37 million. When I talk about other taxes, that's your occupational tax, insurance premium tax, et cetera. Uh, a couple other significant items here worth mentioning, charges for services. Uh, were about $18.7 million for the year. Uh, this next chart breaks out the general fund's expenditures for the year by function. Uh, total expenditures were just under $209 million, uh, which was an increase of about $5 million compared to prior year. Um, once again, no surprise, the majority of your expenditures are for public safety, uh, which was around $121 million. And that additionally, that, that accounted for your, your increase in expenditures for the general fund. That $121 million, that accounts for approximately 58% of the general fund's total expenditures, uh, which, which again is right in line with what we typically see of, of governments of your size. A couple other items worth mentioning, you all had general government expenditures of around $58 million and public works expenditures of right at $14 million a year. And uh, you know, when you factor in other financing sources and uses such as transfers in from other funds, transfers to and from other funds, uh, the general fund's fund balance increased by about $11.3 million uh, for an ending balance of $135.4 million for the year. And uh, th these, this next chart, these next two charts are, are really quite interesting. Um, this next chart, it shows the fund balance history of the general fund over the past five years. And, uh, you know, it's, it's always interesting, interesting to kind of reflect back on where you were uh, compared to where things currently stand. And, and, and again, to me, this chart speaks volumes. Um, you know, as you can see, not only have you all uh, done a great job of increasing your fund balance, but it's more than doubled since 2019. And, and to go even further, it's, it's increased by almost $100 million since 2018 uh, when, when your fund balance is right at 45 million. So, you know, with everything that has gone on uh, during the past five years and, and the economic uncertainty that has followed it, um, it, it's impressive to see how you all have consistently been able to stay within budget and increase your fund balance. So that is certainly something uh, that council, management, everyone involved in the city should be proud of. So, so hats off to you on that. And, you know, one thing I always, you know, want to remind people when it comes to fund balance, 
Fund balance isn't what you all have in the form of cash for discretionary spending. Uh, fund balance is merely the difference between assets and liabilities, uh, only a portion of which is available cash. Um, you, you know, to break down your fund balance a little bit further, uh, a portion of your fund balance is non-spendable in nature, such as inventory or prepaid assets. Um, I'm sorry, prepaid expenditures. Um, you all also have uh, portions that are committed or assigned uh, to future expenditures. So of that fund balance, um, you know, well, additionally, one thing, another thing to keep in mind is that the general fund incurs uh, expenditures of around $17.4 million per month. So you all ended the year uh, with an unassigned fund balance equal to approximately four months of operating expenditures. You know, again, with you all being a June 30 year in, it's important that you all have a strong fund balance uh, to, to get you through the, the, the months of July through November uh, when your revenues are, are, are lower than they are uh, during other times of the year. And, and just to further provide some further thoughts on this, you know, um, a, a question I am often asked, you know, as long as we're able to pay our current obligations, you know, what's really the, the, the point of maintaining a strong fund balance? But, uh, you know, there's several reasons to do so. Uh, one of which I, I just mentioned is, is that property taxes represent a significant uh, portion of your revenues, and they're cyclical in nature. You're not getting them on a monthly basis throughout the year. Um, so a strong fund balance provides you the, the cash flows necessary, uh, again, as I mentioned, to cover expenditures during months when revenues are typically lower. Um, a couple other reasons worth mentioning. Uh, you know, it covers significant emergencies and unanticipated expenditures. Um, it provides the government with the flexibility of discretionary spending. Uh, there's a potential for, for better investment rates, or better, better interest rates when you all uh, issue debt, which would save you money. And, and really just, uh, it's important in uncertain economic times. You know, from, from the financial crisis that we all witnessed in 2008, uh, to the global pandemic in 2019, 2020, to the, to the weather-related issues that we sometimes unfortunately have to deal with being in the South. Um, you know, again, if I'm in your shoes, it's awfully comforting to see that we all have a strong fund balance uh, to, to, to kind of get us through those, those, those uncertain events. So again, um, hats off to you all. That's, that's certainly something that you all should be proud of. Um, a few other funds I, I want to briefly mention um, are the government's three enterprise funds, uh, which are the, uh, the Integrated Waste Management Fund, the Civic Center Fund, and the Transportation Fund. Um, again, enterprise funds are used to account for operations in a manner similar to that of a private sector business. The goal of these funds is to be, uh, to be self-sufficient and to generate um, sufficient operating revenues to, to cover their operating expenses. But uh, this chart shows the, the revenues and expenses for these funds. Um, you know, as you can see, um, all three of these funds had a decrease or net loss uh, this year. Um, you know, this isn't really something I would be overly concerned with at this point. You know, the sky isn't falling, uh, but we would just recommend that you all um, keep an eye on these funds going forward to make sure that this isn't a recurring theme and that, uh, you know, it, it doesn't result in, in these, th these three funds um, having to be reliant on, on other funds for their operations. So, again, just kind of want to briefly highlight that, highlight that for you all. Um, a couple items that we, we were, came, became aware of during our audit that, uh, that we see as just operate, opportunities for, for strengthening internal controls and operating efficiency that I briefly talk about. You know, these, weren't, uh, these didn't elevate to the nature of an audit finding, but again, they're just items that, uh, that we want to briefly uh, talk to you about in, in, the form of a management, in the form of a management letter. Um, but again, during our testing of the tax commissioner's office, we noticed some overpayments were made uh, to the government and to the school district. Um, it is our understanding that the new IT system was, uh, was adopted in the prior year. And uh, during FY23, some of the information used by the system uh, to com compute and allocate distribution amounts um, were not appropriately updated. So again, I think, I think this, these overpayments were essentially just a, a, a kink in the system as far as updating or, or implementing this new IT system. Um, but we've discussed this with the tax commissioner's office. Um, the appropriate steps um, have been made to correct these issues. The overpayments have been, uh, have been corrected uh, as of now. But again, we just want to highlight this and, and recommend uh, that the tax commissioner's office implement the necessary controls and review procedures to ensure uh, that these overpayments aren't made in the future. Um, number two, uh, excess funds in the Superior Court and, and Sheriff's Office. Um, again, all constitutional offices have a function of receiving funds 
um, through fines and fees and then remitting those funds. And during our testing of the Superior Court and the Sheriff's offices, um, we noted excess funds uh, through which no determination can be made who these funds were owed to. And um, our recommendation is, is just uh, that these offices make every effort they can to determine who these funds are owed to and, uh, and, and disperse those funds. If a payee cannot be determined, uh, we just recommend consultation with the, with the government's attorney um, as to how these funds should be dispersed. I will say uh, this is a very, very common uh, management point that we have for, for county governments. So, uh, again, it, it wasn't important enough to elevate it to an audit finding, but um, it, it, it is something that we typically, it's, it's not unusual to see uh, for, for, for constitutional offices. Yep. Okay, uh, uh, Councillor Crabb is queued up. We'll, we've got a couple of questions. I, I'd like to go back to the fund balance um, slide. <coughs> this one? Yeah. Yes, thank you. So you're showing growth in these slides, but then you mentioned how um, in the fund balance for June 30th, 2023, there is committed funds and we only have four months um, of usable funds in this fund balance. So if you were to take out all the committed funds, where would it be on that chart? Because let me just, this is how I'm, I'm um, translating that that really we've, we're putting some debt into the fund balance because we owe that money to certain entities or, you know, it's committed. So therefore, it's really kind of debt. We have to pay it to a certain... Well, a significant portion of that is committed to future capital projects uh, for, for future years. Right, and, so and again, it's not you're, you're, usable. You're, you're unassigned fund balance is essentially what, what you can use right now. Right. And, and that's four months worth. And, and again, four months is right in line with what GFOA recommends. They recommend between three to five months, depending on your year in. Um, so with you all being a June 30 year in, uh, again, your revenues are typically lower in, in July, August, September, October. So that, that four month time frame, that four month unassigned fund balance um, is, is really appropriate for your year in. I guess my question is, this slide is deceiving because we really, I don't think that, you know, that um, fund balance going up to 140 million is really the four months. Four months is in a hundred, is that showing just the four that's, months? That's show, this, this slide is showing your, your total fund balance. And again, your fund balance is the difference between your assets and liabilities. That, that's right. what you all have left over. And you all have committed some of that fund balance some of those assets already for, again, future capital projects, debt service, et cetera. Right. Uh, so th this is your, I'm sorry. This right. is, this is looking like our fund balance is growing and our, and our fund, our days, our months, I mean, of the fund balance is growing, but I want to know if the committed funds in there are growing also. I'd, I'd like to see this where it has, broken you know, like it's broken so. down into, you know, like maybe a part is uncommitted and another part is committed because I'm wondering if the committed part is growing um, at a larger amount than our total fund balance. I don't, have those, I don't have those numbers on me right now, but I will say your unassigned fund balance has grown this year. I, I don't have the exact figures. Um, but again, to, to your point, if, if, if all of this fund balance is already committed for, for other projects and you had zero dollars un, unassigned to fund these operations July through November, that would be a concern. I, and I understand where you're coming from on that. Uh, but but you know, as far as your unassigned fund balance goes, it's, it's, it's around four months. Uh, but, but again, I, I, can, I can provide some additional information on, on, on that breakout. Uh, I guess I just had in my mind that we were shooting for a six-month fund balance of, uh, and, of and, and, flexibility. And so that kind of concerns me that it's only four months. Well, and, and Mayor, if I, um, 
may, and certainly we can provide the counselor and this council that information, but um, the uh, GFOA, as I understand it, recommends no less than 60 days in fund balance, two months, GFOA. Uh, our administrative policy, our administrative policy says our goal is 90 days fund balance. That's three months. I've just heard the auditor say that we have four months unassigned fund balance, not 60, not 90, but 120. So GFOA 60, administrative city policy 90, you just said we have 120. That, that, that's correct. And I don't have your fund balance and so, policy on hand, but that does sound familiar. That, that is, is our policy. Right. I'm giving you the policy. And so what we will do is make sure that this council see the numbers in the fund balance. And I believe that's about $74 million in value, cash value that we have in fund balance. And so we'll show you, and we typically do show you all of the obligations that we have with economic development and other projects. And, and that is separated from um, the, the fund balance that we enjoy. Um, and and I, I heard you um, say that, you know, your words, great job of increasing fund balance. Uh, in fact, you said it has almost doubled and we should be proud of it and we are proud of it. So I just wanted to Thank make sure we understand what the GFOA city and what he said. Okay, Councillor Thomas. Uh, would you go back to uh, that one? Uh, the excess funds in Superior Court and Sheriff's Office, could you give us an example of what you're talking about there? Who gets those excess funds? What, what does that mean? Well, I mean, you said the, the Superior we, we Court had excess funds that they owed some other entity. Well, the, the sheriff's office, you know, they, they receive fines. And, and sometimes they have to, to, to remit those fines once the, the, the process has run its course. Well, there's excess funds. And over the course of time, there, there have been excess funds that have come up where there's not a termination on who those monies are owed to. And again, this is a very common uh, uh, issue or, or situation that we see with, with uh, uh, fiduciary funds, custodial funds. Uh, it's, it's nothing to be overly concerned about. It'd be a lot worse if it was the other way. <laughs> Somebody owed you money, you know who it was owed to. Uh, at this point, you have excess funds. You have more money uh, than you really should have because it's owed to somebody. We're just not sure who, who those funds are owed to. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, again, it's, 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 a common, it's, it's a common thing in what we see. I guess it concerns me that we don't know who they're owed to. I mean, I can we, we understand can. that the sheriff's office and the superior court collect fines, mm -hmm. and at some point, those fines need to be remitted to the city. Mm -hmm. uh, but are there other entities that get those funds? Pay the fine at, at some point. I'm sorry. It could be an individual who paid so, a fine. I mean, there, there could be certain. Uh, so, Mayor, if I, if I may. Yeah. Um, so, you know, when, when the court, when people pay fines in the court, I know you know this. Um, you know um, that, that there's a portion of it may go to. Uh, the sheriff may keep a portion, a portion may go to various entities, uh, and certainly I Such know Such as? Um, you want to name them. I, I, don't, I can't name all the entities. I don't, I don't need you to name all of them. Just yeah. tell me one of them. Yeah, well, <laughs> the Sheriff Retirement Association, she said. Sheriff Retirement Association would be an example. Uh, and so these dollars are to be distributed as the law says they are to be distributed. And perhaps he's got funds there that have not been distributed. I don't know. I didn't do the audit, of course. I'm just sharing with you that 
every time a person pays, if you go to, and you pay a speeding ticket, a percentage of those dollars go to three or four different sources and they've got to distribute those dollars. And what I hear you saying is that those dollars have been collected by the sheriff and they've got to be distributed. And the law decides, tells you where that, those dollars are, are to go. They've just got to distribute those monies in accordance with what the law says. And, and I hear you saying they've got excess dollars there. Those dollars are sitting there and they've got to be distributed, distributed in accordance to what the law requires. So I, I don't know what's, what they've got, but we can, we can certainly inquire. Well, I guess it, it concerns me that we don't know where those excess funds should go. We do know, you know, I'm not sitting, I don't have, just like you don't have it before you, I don't have it before me. The, the law, and, and certainly Assistant City Attorney, you can pull up the, the law and it'll tell you where the dollars goes, where they go, and the sheriff has that information and can distribute. I'm not trying to answer for the sheriff. I'm just trying to bring yeah, clarity. And, and, and our recommendation is to, is to make that determination yes. of the, where those funds need to go. And if you can't make that determination, just consult with your attorney uh, to, 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 to verify yeah. where those funds uh, should be dispersed to. Yes, ma'am. Councillor Tucker. Um, in reference to the Superior Court, um, I do recall that I think um, Clerk Danielle Forte had made mention to having legal counsel and the money where we say excess funds, they're actually going through Tyler recording system and being reconciled there and then also through Odyssey. So I'm trying to see if we had annotated that what in reference to how their funds are being dispersed um, when they are collected. It's two, it's actually two systems. So all exits, and you know, I'm sure most of the people that are watching, they know the legal things that happen um, in a superior court uh, concerning some money that was missing a large sum, I think close to $9 million. So they consulted with a legal team and they actually put those things in place for excess funds. So those excess funds in Superior Court are processed through Odyssey and Tyler. Um, I'm not sure if you all didn't see that, but um, the clerk had mentioned that a, a while ago because she gave a whole presentation when we had an audit um, in reference to that. So, so that's the accounting system that they're-, they're Yeah, so all things are collected and dispersed through those two systems. I, you know, we had just got that letter not too long ago, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, we're not saying that those funds have not been recorded. Uh, we're just saying that, that it's unknown at this time who those monies are owed to. And, and, and again, so. Well, and there, um, the law says who the, where the money, who those mm -hmm. monies are owed to. Correct. So it's not that. We can't break, I can't break down for the sheriff or the superior court, but the law says when they pay a fine in superior court, that superior court clerk knows that the law says this amount or percentage goes to this entity and this goes to this entity until those funds are dispersed. Now they hold those funds sometimes and you know, I'd like for them, I mean it's no different than the tax commissioner when the tax commissioner collect taxes, she knows the law says 60% go into the school district and 40% go into the city. She knows where the money goes. You just gotta dis disperse the money. And we are calling, a lot of times asking the tax commissioner, just using it as an example, you know, when are we gonna get our check, you know, the deposit. So they know where the money goes, they just have not dispersed it. That, that's what, and, and so I wouldn't say that we don't know where the, where the money goes. We do know, they do know, the law says so, just for clarity. All right, that's well, all the questions. Just, uh, real brief, just a couple of the slides. Okay. 
and, and you know, again, the third uh, recommendation is something that you all obviously are aware of uh, as it pertains to the backlog of, of business license and, and alcohol license uh, renewals. I won't go into this in detail, uh, but again, uh, this came up during the audit. So anything that comes up during the audit that pertains to the audit, we feel like we need to, we need to implement in the form of a management letter. So that's why we're doing that here today. Uh, but again, we recommend the, the management continue to, to develop a greater understanding um, of the causes of this matter and, and just then determine uh, the, the appropriate corrective action. Um, one final item uh, to discuss to you all, again, it's just certain information that the auditing standards requires that we communicate. Um, but again, you all received a clean opinion on this year's audit. Uh, we did have one audit finding that I mentioned earlier, but uh, we received full cooperation from management and staff. Uh, there were no disagreements with management um, on any kind of accounting or financial reporting issues that would have affected the financial statements. Um, there were no uncorrected misstatements. And again, we are independent of the government as required by government auditing standards. And um, you know, with that, unless anybody has any specific questions, any other questions, uh, that concludes my presentation. But um, again, what I've, there's a lot of information in this document. What I tried to do is just hit the highlights, what I think is the most important to you all. Um, but if there's anything that you all have any questions on that, uh, that I didn't address, please, uh, more, I'll be more than happy to, to answer those. But uh, again, thank you to your finance department for all their hard work uh, and, and for this community. And uh, we certainly appreciate the opportunity to be of service to you all and uh, look forward to working in the future. Mr. Irwin, we appreciate it. And thank you for waiting to uh, make, that, make that presentation. Thank you and thank Malden and Jenkins. We appreciate you. All right. We... Um, I've got one quick presentation, uh, and I know we've got a lot of folks here from Public Works. We want to get to uh, item one, but we've also got we've got to get to our first readings uh, or, or be close to the violation. This one shouldn't take long, uh, but it's a very important opportunity to uh, to recognize uh, our, uh, our emergency management uh, office and uh, Homeland Security. Uh, First, I want to introduce Jason Ritter from uh, the, he's the area director from uh, GEMA. Yes, sir. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council, uh, for having us here today. I, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I work for the Georgia Emergency Management and Homeland Security Agency uh, out of Area 4. Uh, my office is in LaGrange, and I cover 25 counties, uh, including uh, Columbus, Muskogee. I'm thankful to be here today um, uh, for recognition of Chance Corbett and some of the work that he has done uh, over the last few years. Um, Chance and I, uh, not long after coming to Columbus, we had the opportunity to uh, camp out at the Civic Center for months and months and months. And so uh, I got to spend time here and, and get to know Mr. Hughley and Mayor Henderson and several other uh, representatives here. I'm thankful for that relationship that's continued to grow. Uh, but this year, uh, Chance has achieved a very uh, specific uh, recognition that not many people uh, in emergency management achieve. Uh, as you all know, he has been your EMA director for the last three years or so. Uh, but for the last 23 years or so, he's been involved in emergency management uh, across the river in Alabama. Uh, as more specifically with uh, Auburn University. Uh, Chance holds a master's level certification in the state of Alabama for emergency management. Uh, in Georgia, uh, we have three levels of certification. Uh, every uh, nominated EMA director in the county is required to achieve the basic level certification within two years of that nomination. Uh, Chance has not only uh, achieved his basic level certification as an emergency manager, He's also achieved his advanced level uh, of certification as an emergency management uh, director. And this year, uh, just recently, uh, Chance has achieved our highest level of certification being the professional uh, certified emergency manager. Uh, I'll just speak for a few minutes about that certification. Uh, it requires uh, over 500 hours of training. Uh, it requires uh, participation in development and implementation of a full-scale exercise. Uh, it requires five contributions to the profession of emergency management. Uh, Chance over the years, along with his team, uh, has uh, done that very well, and in his time here at Columbus has made vast improvements 
uh, to the emergency management agency here uh, in, in Columbus. I'm thankful for Chance and for Quincy uh, Prayer and their uh, dedication uh, to keeping the citizens safe and working and coordinating with all the public safety agencies here in Columbus uh, the way they do. Uh, and on behalf of uh, Director Chris Stallings, uh, I'm here today to present Chance with his professional certified emergency management certificates. Thank you, uh, Mayor, City Manager, Councilors. Um, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Appreciate Jason coming and presenting this. Uh, he brought this binder. I guess he brought it back to me because this was what it took to actually just the application <laughs> for that. Um, and it was, uh, you know, obviously you're you're judged by a panel and and you hope that you've made that to that point. Jason mentioned a few times my careers. You know, I did. I was the director in Russell County for seven years before I was went to Auburn University and started their program. Spent 13 years there before retiring, taking the job here. Um, it has been my privilege to work for you and to try to make this program the best that we can. I, my goal is for this program to be the best in the state. Um, Jason mentioned the, the different levels, the basic, the advanced. Um, we are required to have one in the office that is a, a basic CEM, Certified Emergency Manager. Not only do we have two now, but Quincy has already received his advanced. And we will be pushing him into the professional level after he has the five years of experience in emergency management as well. So um, we're proud of this. I'm proud of this personally, but as a department, and I appreciate all the support that the council and the mayor, city manager has given us and me to be able to get this job done. So thank you all so much. Thanks. Councilor Crabb. I, I can wait until this is over, but okay. as soon as we're finished with this subject, I... Sure. Councilor Tucker. Um, I was going to say something in reference to um, Mr. Corbett. When you first showed us the um, now it's the real um, time crime center, but I told you that it brought memories when I had joint operations um, duty, which they call job duty. Um, and just seeing how advanced um, that technology is and now seeing where you brought it and where it is now using using it as um, a crime fighting tool. Uh, thank you for your vision um, for that. And I don't think uh, many people know about the Real Time Crime Center, but you can actually see vividly um, individuals, uh, if they're conducting in the progress of conducting a crime, you can get complete facial recognition is just like we're actually looking at the person, you know, as they say, live and in living color. So just thank you for your vision because you really were the individual who came up with something new um, and was the conduit to us having that real time crime center. Um, I appreciate you greatly um, for what you do. And then even also in the emergency uh, management system. I thank you so much for what you do. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate that. Very quickly, Jason, first of all, thank you for what you do for GMA. and appreciate you coming down from LaGrange to present this certificate. This is a big, big deal. Uh, there, aren't, there aren't many folks that attain that level of uh, professionalism and, as evidenced by the certificate. Yes. Not just right quick, I yep. did fail to mention that only uh, less than 30% of the state of Georgia EMA directors have obtained this certificate. Yeah, it's it's kind of rare air, and and uh, we don't want to pump Chance up too much because he won't let me forget it. But but I but I do I do want to point out that it's, it, he's sort of a hybrid, and that's unusual in itself. He for a city this size, he handles not only the emergency management, but he also handles uh, homeland security, and he's accredited in both. He's been a paramedic, he's been a post certified officer. So I don't know what we're gonna to do to follow him. I'm glad we got Quincy in there because Quincy is uh, is is kind of learning uh, is along the lines that Chance is. But but I just want to tell you we're proud of you. We appreciate the service you provide to this community and keeping us all safe. Thank you, Mayor. Thank yep. you, Council. Thank you so much. Oh, Councilor Crab, do you have something? Thank you. I do. Um, I see a lot of public works people here, and when I was coming in. I saw three garbage trucks parked behind the library. So I'd like to um, I'd like to make a motion that we delay the waste 
one cart system vote because we have a lot of discussion and I don't want them to have to sit here for a long period of time and not be doing their job picking up the trash in the city. Well, so, but we have a lot of discussion on on this on that topic. I, so, I'd like to call for. I'd like to make a motion to delay that vote. That was a motion and second, uh, Councillor Huff, to the motion. We have how much discussion do we have before? Is there a pushback on having this implemented for July first for the budget? Yes. On this agenda, we have this and we have an RFP for vendors for integrated waste. We have a lot of discussion that I don't, I don't think that they have a clear path going forward and we're going to have to discuss that. And I don't think we should have that discussion while all of these, these workers are here instead of doing what they need to be doing, picking up the trash in the city. I mean, we're talking about, we're talking about an issue. They were here last, they were here last week just talking about how stressed out they were because they had more work than they, they could handle, yet they're sitting here in this audience. They what we need to be careful about is how we discuss this openly. Uh, they are people like we are, so we need to consider the work that they do, but also the, the feelings that they have. Um, they will understand that you're saying you need more discussion. But what my question is, I hope, well, when we get through doing this, I hope that we are headed toward the one cart system because this can never work. I don't care what we discuss or what we come up with. This will never work until we get to a one card system because we are constantly giving in to the community to do things four and five different ways. And we can't afford to keep doing that. With all due respect, we this body did um, agree for us to start selling carts, for citizens to have extra carts. And I'm not sure that's been implemented yet. I believe that if it starts being implemented, then a lot of the garbage bags and things that are on the street are going to go into that extra cart. And so I think there's some steps that we've already taken that need to be implemented and see if those work. And then if that's not working, then we discuss the next step. But we have to put something in motion to get the public moving in the did. right direction. No, we, we have did. not. We have not put anything in motion for the one cart system. All we've, we, talk, all we've talked about we is made, how to make it possible to work out extra carts for the low income, extra carts for people to purchase. But we don't have anything in concrete saying that come July 1st, the city goes to a one cart system. Well, and that should be in the budget discussions, I'm sure. Couple, couple of challenges we've got um, right now. We've got uh, some advertised public hearings for on first reading that we've got to get to. Uh, I think if these individuals are here, I don't. I don't think that there's anything wrong with letting them listen into the discussion about this, because this affects them, and that that affects us, all of us. The uh, the citizens in this community. So, so let's let's. If, but but there is a motion. There there, there is a motion in the second uh, on on the floor uh, to to delay it. And because the motion has been properly moved and seconded, we will we will hear it. Uh, so, uh, are there any more discussion on the delay? Is there a time certain to delay to, or just indefinitely? It just. I don't, I'll take suggestions from the group that can be that we can have discussions about it. Well, so we've got a motion to delay indefinitely. Uh, if all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. All right. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. One, two, three, four, five. How does Councillor Allen 
Mayor Pro Tem vote. Okay, so that's an inconclusive vote. So we'll move back to the agenda. We've got, I'm sorry. Madam Clerk, did you have? No, no. Okay. I just want to Council announce Mayor Pro Tem's okay. vote. Councilor Thomas? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, before we leave your agenda, I would like to um, bring to Council's attention um, the fact that we are about to enter the budget uh, season. Um, and I want to go through with you this morning some of the uh, dates that you need to put on your calendar that we're going to meet. Uh, on April the 30th, which is a work session, um, the mayor will distribute his proposed budget to council. And then on May the 7th at 9 a.m., the budget committee will hold its first meeting for, to uh, take a look at the, at the mayor's budget. <clears throat> During that meeting, uh, the mayor will present his budget to the budget committee and any remarks and overview of the budget by the city manager and the finance director would be held that morning of the 9th. And then we'll take a short lunch break and at one o'clock begin presentations by department heads and city officials who wish to have the budget committee take a look at what has been proposed for their, um, for their portion of the budget. And any of those things that we choose to add to the add delete list um, will be uh, done at that time uh, for those people who, those departments and city offices that are here. Uh, and I'm looking at probably a three o'clock adjournment of that meeting. Then on May the 14th is our regular council meeting. And uh, we uh, do not have at this point uh, any recommendation for uh, a budget committee meeting on the 14th. On May the 21st, um, which uh, I would like for us to have a, our second budget committee meeting at nine o'clock. And what we will do at that meeting is to complete any department presentations that we have not already received. And council then will um, go through the add delete list. Um, as you recall, if you, uh, if we as a council or if a um, department head or so forth wants us to make a change in their budget, we have to add it, but then you have to show us where we're going to delete something to get that, that um, money. And we will uh, finalize on the 21st the budget uh, to go to the mayor. I recognize that May the uh, 21st is election day and that some of the people sitting around this table are up for election and may want to uh, do some other things later in the afternoon. So we will meet at nine o'clock and move as quickly as, as we can. Um, on May the 28th, which is a regular council meeting, uh, this council will adopt the budget uh, and authorize public hearings uh, to go forward. In the month of June, the finance department and uh, the, the city manager's office will um, provide for public hearings. We, have, we are required to have so many public hearings. We are required to have uh, publication in local uh, in the local newspaper, and that will happen during the month of June. And then on June the 25th, which is a regular council meeting, uh, we will finalize uh, the budget, taking into consideration things that come to us from the public and from that um, meeting, I mean, from that uh, uh, posting on the ledger, and adopt the final budget. Then um, the the budget will go into effect for FY25 on July 1. So I just wanted to go through that so you can put on your calendar um, those extra dates that we're gonna meet and uh, hopefully we'll uh, 
we'll get through and not, um, not prolong it. I do want to say to the department heads and to the um, office, the, the city officers, uh, we welcome you, we as the budget committee, welcome you to come to, to one of these meetings. Uh, the city manager's office or the finance office will arrange a schedule for you to appear. They'll be communicating with you as to how to do that. Uh, but we encourage you to come and to, if there are, particularly if there are things that you want this council as the budget committee to know and understand about your budget. Um, we also, I also uh, hope that um, we will have uh, members of the public here uh, to listen to this discussion, as well as members of the pub public to come out for the June meetings for um, their input into the budget. Uh, and with that, Mr. Mayor, unless there are questions, that would be um, the uh, budget committee chair's recommendation for this budget season. Okay, Councilor Tucker, is a question? Not in reference to, to this, it was actually to um, the card system, and I'm gonna be very brief. Okay, uh, let brief. me, I think, it, uh, Assistant City Attorney, did you have yes, something have. on the budget? Yes, I had comment on the budget. Okay. Um, we will need to coordinate on the June schedules because typically we are legally required to have two, a first reading and a second reading on the budget ordinance. And then on a third regular meeting, we will actually, at the end of June, finally approve the millage ordinance, which runs a week behind the budget ordinance. So we need to coordinate when the advertisements are run, when the two budget um, hearings are, and then when the... Um, Okay. And I, I'm sure that the uh, that the uh, legal department and the finance department will take into consideration these dates and so forth and make everything work. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Budget Chair. <coughs> um, uh, yeah. So oh, one is this to the budget? We're bu let's go ahead. <coughs> Do you have? Oh, I thought your light was off. So, so Mr. Mayor, um, I'll ask the finance director to get with. Uh, the budget chair, um, and I think I heard the assistant city attorney just mention about the last meeting in June in the past for those going to GMA and other things have been, we, we've changed the dates. And um, and so, Madam Budget Chair, we'd like to get with you on the June, that 25th date. Whatever date works, Mr. Yeah. City Manager, yeah. we'll, we can do that. Yeah. I think maybe June 18th is what we've done in the past. It's been not that last meeting. And then, of course, if there's a need, if something comes up between the 18th and the 25th, you can have that meeting, call meeting, though we normally cancel it, and you can still resolve it and be within the law. So we'll, we'll, I'll have her get with you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Councilor Tucker, thank you. Um, Madam Assistant City Attorney, if you recall, last week I sent an email asking that we waive the additional cart fee for low-income um, households. Uh, I appreciate the city manager for providing me with the information regarding how many low-income um, households that we actually have. It's 278. I know that you advised to do it in June. I think you said June. Right. However, since we have already put that $55 um, amount out there for people to actually call in and get an extra cart, I would like to, um, to do the ordinance, go on first read for the next uh, council meeting, and only because it will help with putting the carts out, and it'll be really, we putting the, the cart after the horse now. So we had to get some things, <laughs> some things in line first. We need to actually get these extra carts out so we can do a one cart system. If we if they don't have the extra carts, then you're still going to have individuals putting out um, bags. I rode through Carver Heights area today, and you can see some people. A lot of senior citizens only have one cart, but when you see multiple multi families, they have 
the extra bag. So, and I know some of those areas are low income. So if we just go ahead and implement this one cart, um, not one cart system, but implement the 278 low income households to receive a fee waiver if requested, but we need to get that information out to them when we do approve it. It's, it's roughly about $17,000 um, that will that will cost us if we did that. Well, let me briefly comment, and the city manager probably also will want to chime in. As I read his resolution that was delayed from today, that was approving the concept of a one-cart system. And then everybody recognized it would not be implemented until July 1, and that there would be a lot of very exacting changes to the ordinance done during June, or they could come a little sooner. What I would recommend is if you want to allow people to begin to get the free carts, make that an amendment to the resolution stating in concept that council approves the one cart system before we, so that we have a need to be giving carts out. I would like a separate ordinance. I, I, would, I would like a separate ordinance for this, just like I requested last week, that we go to this low income household fee waiver for the carts um, and to bring it up on first read at the next council meeting. Certainly, thank you. What you request? No. All right. No. No. Are you saying to change the the one that we voted for the fifty five dollars? No. No, she's not saying. No, I think I think what I mayor, if I may. I think yeah. I heard you say that she could amend the ordinance that's on the agenda today. The resolution. The, the resolution and include that in the resolution. But just be mindful that even if it's not included or if it's included, um, what we're saying is that if, if the one cart system is going to be implemented and they approve the resolution today, then we have until July 1st to educate people, remind them, that two and a half months from now, um, there's going to be a one cart system. And if you're low income, you get a free card if that's what the council approves. And if you're not low income, you want to purchase a card, it's $55. And this has nothing to do with the RFP, but yeah. All right. We've, and now, listen, I'm going to ask y'all if we can, if you're speaking about carts, if you can hold off, we've got to get to these first uh, readings on the. Uh, on, Thank you. on the rezoning. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So I'm going to, uh, Councillor Huff, I'll come back to you. I know it's on the carts, but we are going to get to there, but we've got to get to these these first readings. Um, Thank you, Mayor. Um, our first rezoning is at 6943 Flat Rock Road, going from light manufacturing industrial to general commercial. And um, is the owner or applicant present? You'll come forward. We'll see if the counselors have any questions. Doesn't appear to be any. All right. Um, does the staff have any comment? Is there anybody in the audience who would like to be heard on the rezoning at 6943 Flat Rock Road? Appearing to be nobody, we thank you for being here and it will come back for a vote at 5.30 on April the 23rd. Thank you very much. Our next rezoning is at 1615 Winton Road. And that one is going from neighborhood commercial to residential multifamily one. And both the planning department and PAC recommend approval. Is there an applicant here? Mr. Griffin? I, I don't think Rooney's here. All right. So we will continue that one. And the next one is at 1000 Winton Road on behalf of the Columbus Housing Authority. And it is going from light manufacturing industrial to general commercial and partially residential multifamily too. Ms. Johnson, thank you for being here. Um, does anybody from the audience wish to be heard on this rezoning? Any counselors have questions? Doesn't, doesn't appear so. No. 
you know. All right. Thank you. Thank um, you. We will take a vote on that at 530 April the 23rd. Next, we have um, 4834 Warm Springs Road going from single family residential one and neighborhood commercial to residential multifamily two. Um, Mr. Smallman, I see you're here on behalf of the applicant. Um, does council have any questions? Does anybody in the audience wish to be heard? on the rezoning at 4834 Warm Springs Road. Thank you for coming. Um, we will take a vote by 30 April 23rd. Next, we have 2911, 3005, and 3007 Third Avenue going from LMI zoning to residential multifamily two. And um, McBib LLC is the owner applicant. You're present. Yes. Do councilors have any questions? No, ma'am. Anybody here wish to be heard on the Third Avenue rezoning? That we'll be back for a vote on that at 5:30 April the 23rd, sir. Thanks for coming. All right. Our sixth rezoning is a text amendment, which I will let our planning staff. Um, Describe briefly, it changes the single family entrance limits in a couple of places in the UDO and introduces the concept of rhythm spacing on streets. Mr. Johnson? Yes, ma'am. Uh, got a couple of them here. Um, the first one is dealing with the limitation of single entrances on uh, housing developments. Uh, the fire code used to be 99. The fire code has now changed to 120. So we're updating the UDO to reflect the fire code. And then, I'm sorry. 122? 120 houses, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Or units if it's a multifamily. And then the other one deals with... Um, Essentially, given BHAR uh, the power to um, set setbacks in a historic district, for instance, um, if the street, every house is set back in the historic district downtown 10 feet, and the UDO says 20, what that person has to do is they have to go to the BHAR and then turn around and pay $200 to go to BCA get a variance. They have the power of rhythm of spacing of buildings on streets. They have that now, but they don't have a definition for it. And the definition means the relationship of spaces between buildings on a street that should be retained when constructing new buildings and additions. And then under the powers and duties, we add that they have those decisions. So you don't have the redundancy of having to go to two boards to get it approved. And then if you get, have that, one board says yes and the other says no, then you've got a citizen who's at an impasse between two boards. So the historic board knows more about the districts and the things in the district than the BZA does. So that's why we brought that forward. Any more council questions? Councilor Tucker. In the public wish to be heard on the UDO changes. Councillor Tucker has a question. Hello, Hello. sir. Question. Uh, it's an area, I guess that F section, where it talks about a single entrance road to a subdivision shall serve no more than 120 lots or units. Mm -hmm. Can you explain the lots and the units? In, in particular, does that mean like an apartment? Yeah, um, units, units is going to refer to apartments. Um, and lots are going to uh, be mainly for townhouse and uh, single family homes. Okay. So, hmm. so if an apartment unit has, let's say, 200 units, they've got to have two ways out. Okay, so apartment with 200 units have to have two ways mm -hmm. out. 
what's the um the maximum for one way out for apartments? One twenty. One twenty. Mm -hmm. If this passes, one twenty. Right mm -hmm. now, it's ninety nine. So one twenty for apartments. Mm -hmm. For apartments and single family subdivisions. Okay. Is it separate? Can it be? I'm gonna say similar to what we saw with Macon Road. Um, Macon Road, we would count it is just be the first hundred and twenty. Got to have access. Uh -huh. Then the next hundred twenty. So will it be a hundred and twenty um, single family? It'd be a mix. Slash. For a situation like that, it'd be a mix. We just count to hundred and twenty, whether they're units or lots, and that sets it. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Appears to be all the questions. No other questions or comments? We will move on to item seven, which is a demolition ordinance for five properties. We will have Director Pruitt go through those with his slideshow. Uh, thank you, Madam Assistant City Attorney. Uh, good morning, Mayor, members of Council, Mr. City Manager. Have a uh, proposed ordinance with five um, demolition cases on there. So I do have a brief presentation. Um, if we could pull that. So I did briefly before we jump into this list, did want to touch on the demolitions that were approved in January of 2024. Uh, so there were six approved, four of those have been demolished uh, by the city. Uh, one of those is scheduled to start uh, tomorrow. And then when that one is completed next week, they will hit the last one on the list, which is the, the property on Second Avenue. Um, so here are the list of the five properties. The total uh, cost of all the demolition is a little over $66,000. The first property is 1655 Elvin Avenue, Mertsuza Ali Khan owner. Is, it, is anyone here to respond to that? Okay. Second property is at 2545 Pi Avenue. Clark Property Management LLC owner. Is there any response to that? Next one is 32 Woodland Circle, Edna Anderson owner. There is. Yes, ma'am. Would you come forward and state your name for the record? Yes, I'm Edna Anderson. I'm sorry? I'm sorry? Her, she stated her name, Edna Anderson. Ms. Anderson, did you want to uh, present anything to Are you speaking on, about the property at 32 Woodland yes, Circle? Yes, it is my property. I inherited it from my mother when she died. My son got involved and was living there, and then he was going to sell it. And they were going to repair it and knock off the porch and fix it up and they of course have done little to nothing and I've stayed on them and stayed on them and hadn't really got behind it like I should um, I talked to them a few weeks ago and they had someone that was coming to work on the roof since the tree next door had come through needless to say it's not working with them they're not doing anything haven't done as much as they should have so I've just assumed total control over it. I got the letter, the certified letter to, um, to estimating the price, the condemnation of the property. And I really want to at least um, get my own estimate for, for condemning the property and cleaning the lot off. And also check into the possibilities of selling it as is to someone uh, like I get a dozen or so cards in the mail every week wanting to buy the property as is. 
Uh, and I understand from the letter I got, the only thing I needed to show was if I wanted to sell the property or, or deed it over to them, that they had the funds to correct and fix the property up. So I'm just asking for extension on the time uh, before you make a decision on it. Ms. Pruitt, I, 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 haven't we in the past just left it on the list because it'd be another two weeks before it's voted on and it'd be some period of time before they ever scheduled any demolition. In the meantime, you should be able to get that estimate for your own demolition and do a quick search of anybody who is interested in buying it and can provide the bank records and a timeline that they will put into place to make sure that the house is brought back up. So you'll have some time. I think if, I don't want to speak for Mr. Pruitt, but I think if, if you work with him, he will tell you, you've got a pretty good bit of time. I, that's not what I was told yesterday. That's why I've been sitting here for so long today. Uh, I, well, we don't, this is a, a little bit of a special exception. When homeowners come in and if they have just gotten control of the property our our objective is try to protect those neighbors right so it's not it's not to destroy your house and it's not to take it from you it's simply to try to come up with a reasonable way right. to be able to let you try to take advantage of the inheritance but at the same time make sure that the people that live next to it don't live next to it in disrepair I understand. yeah so mr Bruce, is that accurate okay thank you um Yes, Mayor, you are correct. Like I said, the, the ordinance would not pass until two weeks from now, and then you know, typically after the ordinance is passed, they're going to work their way through the list, which takes another 30 to 60 days. Um, so we definitely, I do know my office, uh, Ms. Anderson, did contact us. She did a, attend the demolition hearing, which was all the way back in December of, of 2022, so it has been on the list for, for a couple of years now. Um, but she can certainly keep in contact with our office, and, you know, if she's able to demolish it herself, obviously, or, you know, find a, a buyer that has plans to rehab it. We'll certainly work with her over the next month or so to make that happen. Oh, okay. And you can just let her know who she needs to contact in your office to be able to make sure that Correct. She that yeah. And we do have her, her contact information so I can reach out to her okay. after okay. today and, right. and coordinate. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Thank you for coming, Ms. Anderson. Next, we have the property at 2903 10th Avenue. Dustin Cooper, owner. Anybody uh, here to speak to that property? Councilor Thomas. I, I do have a question. Uh, Mr. Pruitt, if you look at the picture on the right, um, that white building in the back is, um, I drove by there yesterday and saw it, is all boarded up. But it did, the, the house was in a fire. And that's why it and hadn't been, nothing has been done to it. Will that building in the back also be demolished? If it is on the same parcel, yes. It, we, take, we take any structure, any accessory structure, because once you lose your primary structure, you, know, you really can't have an accessory structure. So we do take um, any structure on the parcel. I'm not familiar if it's, if it's on an adjacent parcel, then no. But if it's on the same parcel. It as, is on the same parcel, then, I believe. Yes, it would, it would come down as well. OK, thank and you. I, I did want to mention too that this property is in the Waverly Terrace Historic District. So as previous discussions about properties in historic districts, we did uh, talk to Bihar at their meeting yesterday and um, they did, uh, were fine with us moving forward with the demolition. They did have some requests. They do want to come uh, kind of do a complete survey of the house. So that way, whenever something is rebuilt, hopefully on this property, it can uh, resemble what was what was there before. Oh, you can look completely through that house. I mean, it's right. All right. Thank you. Next, we have 2409 Heard Street, estate of Catherine Green, owner. Anybody here to speak to that property? Please come forward and state your name. <coughs> Yes, my name is uh, John Green, and that home uh, previously belongs to my mother. My mother is now deceased, and I would like the opportunity to try to clean up that property. I have received several uh, letters in the mail from people offering to buy the property. I hadn't at this time decided whether I wanted to sell it or try to rebuild, but I would like the opportunity to do something with the property.
um, you heard the earlier time frame. Of yes, I did. The administrative the chance to work it out. Yes, ma'am. I heard you, that. Sir? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. You have a question? Okay. Yes, sir. It um, if, if you can reach out to Mr. Pruitt. Uh, and, yes, sir. Uh, I, I need to get that number. Yeah. And unfortunately, and it's not coming off the list. I understand. And, and that's just to make sure that both parties are doing the best they can. To try yes, to sir. I, I'll that. get right on. Like I said, it's, it's still in my mother's name. I have to take control of that. Uh, but I, I would like to have the opportunity to do something with it. All right, Mr. Pruitt, does that work for you? Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We appreciate thank your you. being here today. Our last item is an ordinance for demolition of two properties next to each other on Broadway at 1118 and 1120 Broadway, Mary C. Wolwinder owner. And since this is rather a larger scale dom demolition in a prominent area, we thought we'd give you the opportunity to look at it specifically. Yes, and I do have a, a separate presentation that kind of goes through the timeline uh, and the history of these projects or of these uh, properties. Um, if you have been in to Uptown uh, lately, you will notice that there's these two buildings have been fenced off and the sidewalk and parking in front of the buildings uh, have been fenced off. Um, this is adjacent to City Hall on the Broadway side. Um, so here's a picture of the fence that is currently on Broadway, the two structures, um, that are 1118 and 1120 Broadway are the two two-story structures on the left-hand side, kind of behind the tree a little bit, but the lighter colored uh, buildings. The owner uh, also owns the one-story building, which is 1112 Broadway. Um, and again, this is uh, right past these buildings to the north is the breezeway that connects you from uh, Broadway to the city's parking garage adjacent to City Hall. So that's where we are at in the 1100 block. So a little bit of the history, we were, Inspections and Code was notified on August 16th, 2023, that the interior structure of 1118 Broadway has collapsed. Um, you know, we were aware that these were vacant properties. We were not aware before this of the uh, condition that they had fallen into. So when we got this report, of course, we immediately went out, visited the structure. Uh, and at that time, we recognized that it was an imminent danger to neighboring properties in the public. Um, and so we immediately closed the adjacent sidewalk. We got some temporary barriers with the help of Public Works. Uh, and then we did end up putting a more um, robust barrier with some temporary fencing. Uh, in addition, we, we sent some correspondence to the owner, notifying them of the condition of the properties and, and ordering that they take immediate action. Um, of course, that never happened. Um, they have never responded to our correspondence and, and have been um, silent on any of our correspondence. So in the following days, we assessed the condition of the neighboring properties. Again, 1118 was the first one we were aware about. Uh, we did evaluate 1112 and 1120. Again, all three parcels owned by the same individual. Uh, 1112 had some work done uh, not too long ago where they redid some of the foundations, did some structural work in there. So it uh, is not in as bad as condition, but 1120 is uh, just as bad as 1118. And so we did bring in some outside uh, consultants, some outside professionals. We worked with Wright Engineering, which is a local structural engineering firm that has done a lot of uh, the structural work on properties in downtown. Um, and again, the, their recommendation, as well as mine as the building official, is that these properties uh, need to be demolished to remove the blight as well, and more importantly, to remove the danger that they currently pose uh, to the uptown area. Um, again, if the properties were not to be approved for de demolition, uh, in my opinion as a building official, is we will have to keep the sidewalk closed in order to prevent uh, any danger to the public. And so I just have some, a couple photos. The left-hand side, this is the interior of 1118 Broadway. Um, parts of the roof structure and the entire second floor have collapsed, causing a further collapse of the ground floor structure. Um, eventually all the way down into the basement. So really all you're left with is the brick um, outside walls. And you can see in the picture on the right, 
If you go out there today, this crack that's forming between the front facade and the southern wall is bigger than it was when we took these pictures several months ago. Um, so again, the building is moving. It, it's lost its structural integrity. Um, and again, in my opinion, that they need to be to be taken down. All right, Councilor Kogel. Do we, um, once the, or if, if those buildings are taken down, um, will we require a, um, some sort of barrier to be put between the sidewalk and the interior of those buildings? Kind of like on the west side, there's that wrought iron, um, I don't know what you want to call it. It's not really a gate, but it's kind of, it goes the height of the structure. So we've, when we um, demolish the properties, the intent is that the contractor would backfill the basement to bring it up to grade. And so, you know, there wouldn't be any hole, there wouldn't be any facade left. The um, 1112, which would remain, um, you know, would have its exterior wall still there. And so it would really just be two vacant lots, um, you know, that have been brought up to grade. Right. So can we, uh, can we, require either can we do it or can we require the the property owner to block off the facade of that so that it doesn't get end up it doesn't end up getting used as a cut through or various other things happen there clean it up so i mean i guess i, I don't i'm not clear on what because when we're finished it'll just be a vacant there won't be any structure left it won't be Right, I understand that. Like on the on the west side of the of Broadway, mm -hmm. there's a there's a an empty lot that people use as a con, um, parking. Uh, I mean, I see a CPD park back all there back there. All that there's it, they use it as parking structure um, from Front Avenue, I think. And so and so um, my question is, and there's a a black wrought iron blockade to, that blocks the entrance from the sidewalk mm -hmm. into that lot. Um, can we require that on the east side for for that lot, or does it just remain a vacant lot that things might happen? So yeah, it? I mean it will be you know a vacant like I said lot just brought to gray. We have you know of course we east east of it of course is our parking deck, so we could you know if we felt the need to install a barrier to keep people you know from cutting through the parking deck or you know walking across that, um, we could certainly do that you, you know there was um some concern and we, we have communicated with uptown about this issue of what you know what it needs to look like you know if we plant grass and someone's gonna have to cut the grass because the owner's not going to um, right i think the concern is, is that there's either people will, will accumulate there or trash will accumulate there or it will become a, a cut through where it's just not i mean it's not um in line with what uptown should look like so i don't know if we if we require that of the property owner or if we just put that barricade up the yeah, councilor has a good point i think particularly since the proximity to uh, government offices i think some type of you know and, and the challenge there is to make it aesthetically okay right so you don't you don't want orange barricades and, and, and barrels out there but i, I agree with councilor Kogel. i think that there should be some way to block foot traffic going into that parking structure so we just check into it yeah no I mean, we certainly can add that um you know to our demolition process okay thank you councillor begley oh, um so i did check it's under uh, mary wolander on our access site uh who was the mailing address was america's I also see there was a Mary Wollander who was from Columbus and passed away in America a few years ago, uh, but the taxes are still being paid. Have we had any contact with the people who are actually paying the taxes each year since it looks like Mary passed away a few years ago? So, and again, I'm not She's, sure the entire family oh, dynamics, but we have um, the city attorney's office did receive some correspondence or one email, I think, from an attorney who claimed they were representing um, Ms. Woolwinder, and then um, several, when we put the barricades out, of course, we got a lot of questions from some of our local uh, developers who have reached out and actually made contact with the owner in an attempt to buy the property, and nobody's had any luck and, and really gotten anywhere with that. Um, so we do know that our correspondence is getting to the responsible parties. We just have not received any 
of substantial correspondence. Yeah, there, there have been multiple attempts and with some success in contacting somebody who's a decision maker and for whatever reason can't get it moved and there there's and there and I would anticipate that continues because there's some pretty pretty prominent developers that have been kind of working on that. Councilor Davis I'm sorry. Councilor Davis. Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. This this seems really unique. It seems challenging and yet extremely complicated. And this might be a matter that's going to sit there for a long, long time. I'm concerned about that. I'm concerned about the cost of what it's going to cost to demolish and to take care of this. And I'm assuming you got to take it all out. But this looks like something that could go on for a long, long time. And I, I'm asking myself the question, is there another action that we can take the state level, the federal level, because of the danger of this property. I mean, the danger of it to pedestrians, to people coming by. Um, is there anything else that we can do to try to expedite this matter? Because it, it's, like I said, it can get real complicated. And we're putting up 330 plus thousand dollars to take care of this. And that may be on the low side once you're get in there and you start having to deal with some of the things, some of the challenges. Um, so that's my question. What is there something else that we can do here to expedite this? And the assistant city attorney may encourage a transaction, you know, may um, want to chime in too, as far as my role in, in actually removing the nuisance, you know, we, we did look at if there was any temporary cheaper, temporary things we could do to stabilize it in order to just eliminate the danger, just, you know, be able to go in there and make a quick, easy repair um, that would be cheaper than the total demolition. And just with the condition of the buildings, there's really no way to safely work in them to get people in there to do any work. So as far as abating um, the nuisance and the danger, you know, and my understanding is our only option at this point would be to take it down. But I don't know if the assistant city attorney has any other comments. No, I mean, it is set to be in the process now, and it can be a top priority because of the safety concerns. But um, we did look at other options, shoring up, boarding up, and I don't think those were engineer feasible engineering-wise. Mm -hmm. And um, before we close out this, I would like to just confirm that there's no one here in the audience who would like to speak on behalf of um, Ms. Wolwinder, the owner. Well, I'm, I'm talking about I don't think there is. I, I'm talking about, de you're talking about demolition and construction. I'm talking about another action to either seize, acquire that property or whatever, whatever we need to do because of the, the hazard that it's uh, producing and will cause to the pedestrians in the uptown area. It's a, like I said, it's unique. Most of them that come here, but in the, the type of money we're talking about, um, you know, it just seems like, we're, and by the way, what fund is this coming out of? Demolition. So, yeah, there was still um, enough balance between the list, the five houses and this property was enough budget left in the overall demolitions for the past um, budget year as well as some money that had been rolled over from previous years to take care of it. But I hear you. I agree with you. Um, well, was there an I, answer I, to that question? <laughs> from the demolition? No, we know that. What? Yes. No. At this point, yeah, we don't see any kind of condemnation yeah. that would um, be possible. And, We've looked at that, but and, because it is a private property owner, yeah. there are certain concerns. We can continue to explore and see what um, hazards the property presents, et cetera. But um, currently we think demolition is the clear legal way to handle Well, and that. I'd like to ask the staff to encourage, maybe to, uh, I'd like to encourage you to maybe have some discussions on some ways possibly to expedite a transaction with this property. Expedite what? A transaction. Yeah, well, you mean to purchase or, uh, let me just say that, I, you know, we've all, <laughs> put our heads together. I, I've been in the meetings with 
the inspections code with the lawyers and deputy city managers and mayor and everybody. And they've attempted to communicate directly to uh, the owner uh, and been the buffer is a lawyer and everything. I, I don't think there's another option other than demolition. And, and it would come from our demolition fund and it will eat up our demolition monies that we would be able to do other demolitions out in the community. Um, and, and the thing we would do is, of course, there'd be a lien on the property and it, it's going to accumulate interest. And I think eventually, if we do it and with the cost of demolition and the interest that we incur, it's not going to be long that we're going to, we'll have to take the property. And I think that is the only avenue that I see that we can get to ownership um, that, um, but, but public health, public safety, I, it's terrible. And, and it's a blight, uh, it's an eyesore on our uptown. And so I think we got to do something and this is the only thing that we've concluded we can do. I, I don't like it either, but you know, that's what we've got. Any That's other all. comments? Well, that concludes our agenda. We will need to ask for an executive session on potential litigation there. Okay. Do I, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Councillor uh, Kogel. Um, this city manager, or assistant city manager, attorney. Sorry. It's not lunchtime yet. Um, can I make a, 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 we've discussed it before, but can I make a formal request that um, we redline the ordinances that are uh, on um, whenever we're amending an, uh, an ordinance that it be a red line on the, um, the agenda so that we don't have to continue to search for the old ordinances to see what we're changing? Well, let me speak to that. Every item you've had since you asked for that should have had a red line if it was changing an existing ordinance. If it's new material, there's nothing to red line. Um, and on the um, text amendment to, that was presented today, the reason there wasn't a separate red line is because the um, planning department's staff report provides you with a side-by-side -side comparison of what was and what is in the ordinance. All right. Well, I must have missed that. Thank you. <coughs> All right. Um, and we are going to call up item one on the city manager's agenda because we've got a lot of people here, I think, that are here for that particular item. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So um, at the last meeting, there was a public works uh, driver on public agenda, and she was accompanied by um, a group of public works employees with green vests on, like what you see here today. And they stood at the podium and they explained to this council that they are tired, is what I heard. Uh, they are tired because of the antiquated system that we are operating by investing in high dollar trucks that are automated, that go down the street and they are able to quickly in less than 30 seconds or so uh, empty the trash, return the trash can to its position and move to the next. Uh, the reason they're tired is because we have an extra driver that's in a truck, a white truck, that's going to drive along behind them like I saw when I was en route to this meeting this morning. The white truck with inmates was driving along behind an automated truck with a single driver. And those inmates were picking up um, uncontainerized trash and they were picking, they were emptying actually garbage cans that are out that don't meet our criteria that our automated arms will go pick them up. 
So they were out on Ilges Road, Rigdon Road, Ilges Road when I was coming in. And that's what they were doing as I watched that white truck. And so if we had the cart system policy, the standard, the standard that has been addressed or adopted by other communities in Phoenix City and across Georgia, if we had a standard, then they would have to put their trash in a receptacle, purchase another receptacle, or be gifted a receptacle that you would not need that second truck. That second truck requires diesel fuel. We got to pay a CDL driver. We got to have two inmates. We got to have maintenance on those white trucks because they are following a, an automated truck. And there's no need for that truck and two and, and a driver, and that driver could be off picking up yard waste, doing whatever else they need to be doing rather than following another truck. We cannot sustain that, and this has nothing to do with the RFP. And so that's why they're here. And so, Director Short, would you? I mean, that's why you're you're as the director, and you've been in every division over every every division that I know of. You've been with the city 40 years. Mm -hmm. 40, and you go to the American Public Works meetings and you know what's going on across the country. This is your, talk. what, what are yeah, you asking? Th th this is the, natural, the national trend. This is what the best practice is considered for the United States of America. It is not to have people on the back of a truck throwing trash like we used to do back 20 years ago. It is to have the automation in place, to have a standard for your community that not only helps get the trash off the ground, but it helps your community stay cleaner. And I'm gonna ask, Mayor, I have to say this, for department head privilege, I'm gonna ask for all of Public Works to stand. I was gonna ask you all to come up here, but I'm gonna ask you just to stand where you are. These people, I have to, I have to say this, Councilor Crabb, I was completely disheartened by your comments about these people. These people work hard. They work in six days a week. They don't see their families. And if they were dressed in public safety uniforms, nobody would question their presence. And it really hurt my heart that you would consider them so low on the total pole yes, that they can't come yes, and, yes, and speak and be present for Direct, something that's going to director, affect their lives. The manager. Uh, okay, three, I'll just come. That's, that's I agree. Mayor, Mayor, I agree. it's out of order for agree. this counselor to be addressing down this. Listen, this my everybody, everybody, stop where they are, Councilor Thomas. They were her comments, Councilor. Councilor Thomas, Mayor, this has been Mayor. this has been this has been suspended. That's been done. So, Director, confine your comments, please, to the information that you're bringing with regards to the project. <clears throat> well, when I came into this position, that's where I'm going to speak. Councilor Davis, you told me you said, Miss Short, you've got a hard job on your hands, and you're right. It is hard. But I thought I had the support of this body when you voted before my time to purchase 40 ASL trucks. When you purchase a different type of equipment, you're changing your program. This is a part of the change in the program. It is not something that other communities have not successfully implemented. They have. I don't understand why it is so hard for us to implement it. But I will say that these trucks are here. They're going to do what, what we need them to do. We don't need to continue to invest in old trucks that require three people to operate it. That's all we're saying. That's all we're saying. We're asking for this community to trust this body in the decisions that you made, upgrade the program, because that's what you're asking us to do. And that's all we're trying to do. That's all we're trying to do. Not make life hard, not make it so impossible that people can't do it, not based on your economic status, but based on a standard 
that our community has put in place. To not have litter on the ground, bulk waste on the ground, but to have it picked up. And as we continue to move forward in this program, there are gonna be other changes that we wanted, we're gonna be wanting to implement as far as the process. I go through my neighborhood. I see where my neighbors are putting out all three of their carts at one time. They don't wanna take them back and forth, back and forth and back and forth. And it makes sense. So there are things that we're going to be bringing forward to you. That's not because we just want to do it. It's because you invested in 40 new ASLs, that's $16 million worth of trucks, to implement and upgrade our program. And that's all we're trying to do. They're trying to get home to their families. And all they can see is a body that's not willing for them to be at home to spend time with their families because they're having to work six days a week. So I'm asking that you support us, help us to do the job that I know these people could do. You've got the best. They've got the best equipment. They just need support. Mr. City Manager. Uh, thank you. And, and so Madam Mayor, we do have this item and you know, I, yeah, this is an emotional thing for them. And uh, I applaud them for the job that they do. And for this director who's trying to move us to a, a standard. And, um, and so, and, and I, you know, I pray for civility around this table both ways. You know, I mean, we, we, you know, we don't, we're not a certified city of civility with GMA because we can't get there. And so we're asking to, this is a, you know, if you're going to give low-income persons a second cart, give it to them. If you're going to sell carts to others, sell it to them. But we need to use the automated trucks, equipment, and we do not need trash in bags on the ground where animals are getting to. We need a standard. Other, folk, other communities have established a standard. Why can't we have a standard in Columbus, Georgia, when it comes to waste collection? And so, you know, they, they're saying they're tired, and they are, obviously. But we're asking you to approve for July 1st that we will go to a cart system and items must be contained within the cart. It is just that simple that, that is what, what's been requested here. And so council can either vote it up or down and we'll move on. Got it. Councilor Huff. Uh, thank you, Director Short and Mr. City Manager. Um, let me get closer to the mic because I'm not speaking that loudly today. This is really simple for us to implement. Whatever we need to work out, we have the rest of April, May, and June. So I'm sure it's enough time for us to get everyone carts between now and then. Uh, the pushback, I'm waiting for the conversation that we will have to see what the pushback is. But all I've seen over the past couple of years, I was here when Director Bigler was here and she started bringing forward what the future looked like. And she lined up all the carts here up front for everybody to see. And this is what the future looks like. We are going to have limited number of trucks running. We're gonna have limited number of people working. We can do this with a one man operation on each truck. They get their work done and timely manner and they get to go home. Um, I've just been just baffled over the past four or five years now on the simple things that we need to do to move forward as a city. Columbus is in constant competition with Augusta, but we are being looked at across the world. I get phone calls from across the country, from other states. Um, recently about, you know, people moving here to work here and paying them to come. We need to be a city where our public works people feel appreciated. We need to be a city where people want to move here because it's a great place to be. We shouldn't have to pay them to come. 
I've been here now, as I stated the other day, I volunteered for 30 years. I've been elected 14 years. The other 23 years I spent growing up trying to go to college and play baseball. So my whole life has been here and Columbus is not where it needs to be. We've always been a good city. We got a lot of good people, but we have to come together. We have to work better together. But I'm just having a hard time understanding today how a one card system will not work. It works everywhere. Like I say, I've been watching it for since 1990, however long that is, 30 something years, that's just almost 40 years or so. It works everywhere, it works well. I was in Phoenix City the other day watching it work. They're a smaller city, less money, but they seem to do things a lot better than we do sometimes. And I have that discussion with their elected officials. How do you all come together and make this work? And they always come back to me and tell me, you have to sit down and have our discussions that we will have, but you have to listen. You have to see what best practices are and you have to move forward. And, you know, this, this is not political for me. I appreciate all of you all. I do understand. As a kid, I watched the old garbage trucks come by and that was somebody's job to feed their family. The people on the back were not prisoners. They were everyday people like you all. And I've watched this whole thing come forward to a one card system. So know that you are appreciated. I don't want you to feel any kind of way today. Uh, I apologize for anything that you may be feeling right now. I can do that from me. We love you, we appreciate you. We're gonna work hard up here to try to get this done. And hopefully two and a half, almost three months, we should be able to come together as a body and figure out how to get carts picked up, get them out to everybody. If low income people need to have discounted carts, free carts, whatever we need to do, we will get everyone a cart so you all can do what you do. Because as uh, Director Short mentioned, as I was leaving home this morning, this is my day. Everybody has at least <clears throat> the garbage cart and the recycling cart out. But those that know that you're coming back to pick up the green cart, they rolled them all out this morning to be lined up appropriately. So all I see at this point in, in, in my neighborhood for the ones that are using the system well is just the spacing of the carts so you can get in and out. They have them too closely stacked together, but that's all I see that we need to work on. But thank you all and hopefully we as a body will come forward and hopefully we can move this forward today because like I say, they're just requesting that the cart system be in place by July 1st. We have two and a half months to work out whatever we need to work out. So I uh, personally will move for approval of this. Second. All right, Councilor Tucker. Um, thank you, Director Shore. I, I know you're very passionate. I honestly, this is a hard, a hard situation. Um, back in 2021, when we first started talking about spending a portion of the American Rescue Plan dollars to automate the trash pickup, I was really the first one, and I actually said it to the ledger, that I had some issues. And this, this right here with our employees standing before us, that's the reason why I had some issues because I felt like we needed to have more conversation around it, meaning, as I just mentioned, with the low-income individuals, actually putting the cart after the horse, not going out and buy, buying, buying the trucks and not actually having the conversations that we needed to have in 2021 where people would understand what this means when we go to purchasing 20 trucks that are side loader trucks. It's, it's a lot of steps that we will need to make a lot of, and I'm just being honest with you, I don't think a lot of counselors, and I'm just speaking to the ones that I spoke to, they didn't really understand 
really the ramifications of going to those 20 trucks, what that meant and what that looked like. So now we're here having these ungodly debates, meaning we're being really emotional and not factual. We're speaking a lot of rhetoric and not reality. The reality is people did not know what questions to ask. Directly short. They really did when we went to this one card system. They didn't realize that it was going to come to a day such as today that we were going to do away with not picking up the trash bags. These are conversations that have been had. They, they really didn't think that we would be right here. That's number one. Number two, it was so many other questions going on around integrated waste, meaning whether we should contract it out. Um, we had questions regarding the yard waste. We know we was hit hard during COVID. I think I call probably every day or send you an email in reference to issues, not just in District 4, but if I'm, I'm riding around and I actually see it. I reach out to you and I'm thankful for you and Mr. Pittman and all the employees because I do know they work hard. And I think I had sent a text or something when I told you they were out at 7.30 p.m. in the nighttime and I was concerned about their safety being hit because I know how people don't pay attention when they're driving. The item was delayed, but it was not denied. Like, we're not denying it. It was just delayed to have conversations. One of the questions that I wanted to know is, do we have enough cards? Do we, how many cards do we have currently that we can truly deploy putting the cards out into the community? Because that's going to be step one to ensuring that we can really go to this one card system. People getting additional, additional cards. And as I mentioned, I did, I rode through district four, I rode through part of district one and district three today because I dropped Megan off early. And I did see in the areas that I grew up in, in East Carver Heights, a lot of trash in those areas. And when you talk about, you know, at the bottom, you know, whatever, on Carver Street. Some of the senior citizens, of course, they got one car out there. But some of those individuals on down the street near um, Edgewood, they got a whole bunch of bags in one car. And then I asked my, myself today, and that's the reason why I went with the assistant city attorney to say, hey, we need to just go ahead and implement doing the low-income family because think about that area. I'm sure it's a lot of low-income households in that area that need a, an additional cart, but probably can't afford it. So these were the questions that I had. I don't know what the uh, questions the other counselors had, but it was not to deny. I think that we had time to actually have these conversations because we're trying to implement something on July 1st. So if we even delayed it just one meeting it would have helped to have further conversations. I think sometimes we get really, really caught up in emotions, period, all of us. All of us are guilty of getting caught up in emotions. All of us are, are tired. I know they're overworked and probably feel underpaid. And think about it, if we did not implement that above and beyond um, pay, <laughs> they really would have been feeling underpaid and underappreciated. But the council appreciate them enough to say that we need to go above and beyond in reference to that pay increase. It's a lot of things, a lot of conversations that can be had. And I know that we want to be emotional, but please, let's stay in the facts. Let's stay in the facts. And the facts, the facts are we got a lot of challenges here as far as trying to implement this process. Ms. Mayor, if I may. Um, well, we've got several counselors in queue. Let's try, so let's try to get. Before you go. So I just want to 
thank you. But seriously, it was delayed but not denied. I think we have time. So how many how many carts do do we have? Do we have enough carts yes, now? Yes, yes ma'am. We are yeah. constantly looking at our inventory to ensure that we have enough carts to at least start the process <coughs> of affording individuals a second cart. We've got more than enough for those that have already called in requesting it and for those that are on low income that would have requested. And the new residents coming into Muskogee County. Yeah. So, so that was like one of the questions. How many carts, you know, do we have? Um, in reference to the plan for us distribution, um, how many carts have we actually since we approved that? How many carts we have distributed um, throughout the city? Meaning, after we approve the um, addition, the fifty-five dollars. Like, have we actually? We have not at this point. We're waiting on the waterworks to finish upgrading their, not upgrading their system, but making the adjustments to the water bill for the uh, fifty-five dollar additional charge to be placed on the water bill. And I've already spoken with Miss Clark, and they should have it done within the month. Okay, so within a month. Mm -hmm. um, what What would your thought process be in reference to the? low income people, far as the waiver, how long do you well, think that would take? My, my thought is, first and foremost, is we don't want anyone to have to buy an additional car. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. I know you we want people to recycle. We will show them how to, we can audit their trash, show them how to recycle, to reduce the amount of waste that they are putting in the black cart, thus the need for an additional car. We've had people to take us up on that, and they, they are thankful. So I think a lot of people need to give themselves some credit as far as what they need to learn in order to make sure they don't have to have that additional expense. So we are still able, willing, and ready to go out there and do that for anyone that calls us in regards to that. As far as, I forgot, what was your question again? Water bill. Yeah. Far so as the low income. The low income, my thoughts on that is, again, the majority of the people that are on your low income are your elderly residents. Um, very few of them are younger residents, if you will, uh, which you would think would have the larger amounts of waste. Um, so I don't know that that's really going to affect your low income, but I'm not saying that there aren't going to be any that won't need it because there, I'm sure there are some. Okay. But the majority of your residents are on are seniors that are on low income. Okay. So that that was the the main. Um, two questions really about the inventory and saying that we're waiting probably like a month did you say mm -hmm. a month time for she the water bill about a month to get it situated on the water bill so and they're working on that right now so it's just a matter of time of them letting me know when they're ready to start okay so we have the inventory mm -hmm. just waiting on the process for um, the water bill correct we can implement the low income based on if they actually, you know, need it. They if they need, need it. it. Um, but yeah, it was really just trying to make sure that we get the carts out because what, what will happen for those individuals if they leave their trash still doing the same process? Like what, what is going to happen? Well, every route has a supervisor and that supervisor would tag the, the, the home and set up a time that they can speak with the resident to make sure that they understand the process. We can tag the cart that they're using. We can also put it on their door hang, on their door nods. Mm -hmm. They call I, for that kind of assistance. Yeah, and I know that we have really been involved with the media. Can mm -hmm. we circle back around again to all the media outlets? Absolutely. And actually um, say that. And I, I would say this: one of the things, and I, you know, that I like in reference to. Um, to what election and registration um, does. They go to a lot of churches. You know, you're going to get a lot of people, especially some of the larger churches, and just talk to people, inform them. You can do the demonstration in reference mm -hmm. to what you can recycle um, and just really get that word out so we can truly feel comfortable with, you know, implementing this process. But just getting a, the getting a word out. I know... Um, in my neighborhood, we actually uh, printed out when we did, when we voted to approve that 55, and we went to every household in our subdivision, letting them know that 
you'll soon be able to purchase, you know, another car if you need one. Um, but yeah, just just getting getting out. I mean, getting a word through neighborhood watch um, groups. But as I said, it was delayed, not de not denied, um, because we like you said, we know that we ha we have to implement something because we have trucks. Mm -hmm. So we know we're gonna have to move forward. So I just wanted to make sure that I said that. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Graham. Thank you, Councilor Thomas. I appreciate your words. Um, my comments were misconstrued. Last, last week you were here and you came in front of this body and you talked about how tired you were and how overworked you were. And all I could think was this could be a long conversation and what is that going to do to your day? How much longer are you going to have to work tonight in order to catch up and finish your job? That's, that's what was my concern. And I didn't mean to be disrespectful in any way. You have a very important role in this community. And we're trying desperately to make the right decision. As Councillor Tucker said before, we didn't know to ask the right questions. We didn't have enough information. Even Counselor um, Huff mentioned how we can work out more the, the details between now and July. I don't want to piecemeal this, this situation because when we do, you guys suffer. And I don't want you to suffer anymore than you already are. I'm trying to look out for you. I'm trying to look out for the citizens that need you to take care of them. I have to look at the whole picture and no way would I purposely insult you. And so if you took it as an insult to you, I apologize with my whole heart because there's no way that I don't appreciate you. And if I don't say it enough to you personally, I'm saying it now. I appreciate you. I, I say it to Mr. Pittman and to Ms. Ms. Shore, but I don't see you guys. I'll try and wave at you while you're driving by and things like that, but I don't get the opportunity to tell you how much I appreciate you. And I was trying to show it today. And if the words that came out of my mouth didn't come out properly, <clears throat> to show you my appreciation. They meant that I was looking out for you. And so I apologize, but I really do want to have as much of our ducks in a row before we implement this and before we're, we vote on this. I don't want us coming back four and five times between now and July with piecemeal. You're going to give us a little bit of information here and a little bit of information there. And then we have to, you know, we get frustrated be because we've made decisions that we didn't know, you know, three steps down the road, what that was going to result in. So I like to see the big picture and I'd like to see, I'd like to see it all together not in five different meetings. And I'd also like to see options. You know, maybe this isn't an option, the one cart system isn't an option, but there are a lot of options within the one cart system that we should be able to see and decide upon. Thank you, ma'am. Councilor Begley. I'd run it short. Um, I appreciate you moving us toward best practice. Uh, if it's working in other cities, I'm sure we can figure it out as well. Um, I also appreciate deadlines. I feel like a lot gets done when we put a, a goal there. Um, I, I do have two questions. Um, you know, I, I can support the, the, the goal dead date. I just have two questions. I'll make sure I either understand how to explain them or make sure we've got some kind of solution between now and then. I guess the first question is um, the exception. So. You've got people who 50 weeks a year, one cart is sufficient, and then two other weeks, whether they've got 
a party. They just moved into their house uh, Christmas. And so, again, not 50 weeks, they're, they're good. And they're like, I don't want to buy a cart for those 50 weeks. I just need it for two. So what do we tell? So my first question is, what do we tell those residents? Okay. So during those two weeks out the year, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and any other large waste generating holiday, we will have rear loaders there to pick up that additional trash. We will do that. Okay. Not a problem. We've already got it built in to our program to go along with the ASLs so that we can get that up as well. Because we recognize during okay. those holidays, you're going to have an abundance of waste. So, but so just to clarify, like if it, if they moved into a house on August first, not a, a a big trash holiday, and they're like, I don't I don't need one forever. Just I, I moved in and I've got a bunch of boxes for, or mm -hmm. I got a bunch of stuff because I just moved in. What do we tell those people? They just need to call three one one and put in that request. Okay, all right. Yeah, absolutely. The the second question for people who are non compliant, right? So your, your neighbor's non compliant, and I know we we can put the sticker on there, right? Uh, but but after like three weeks, you're like, my neighbor's non-compliant. Uh, what is our plan to get them compliant? We do have two compliance officers that can enforce the waste management, the waste, uh, what's the right term? Call it waste collection ordinance, okay. if you will. And they can issue them citations and take them to court. Okay, so 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 make sure I capture everything. So if you if you have a big weekend that's a one-off, call 311. Uh, for the big trash generating holidays, we're going to have additional support for the rear loaders. Absolutely. And then if someone, if your neighbor is non-compliant, they will get cited. They can be, yes. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Councilor Davis. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, look, I wasn't here last week, but I'm trying to pull all this together. And, and I'm not, I'm going to try to leave everybody out of this and just talk straight from a business perspective. And what I do, if I was at a board, meeting in a room with all my general partners trying to figure out what's the next best step and how we move forward. I'm still trying to figure out what we're talking about here. The All the information we've been given it relates to aesthetics. Is it aesthetics or what we see here is the burden on the labor force and we got employees saying that I'm I'm being asked to 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 work long hours and I'm overworked. So is what are we really trying to address here in this whole thing? And then I hear the presentation, which, look, I said from day one when uh, Director Criddle was here that we were going to have challenges. When we were in the Trade Center, I brought it up, I said it, and it's all coming to fruition. And I'm not convinced the the the... The word used or the phrase used, a clear picture, the bigger picture is appropriate. It's very appropriate. Because I get the sense now that we're piecemealing things, and it was just said we're going to have more challenges and more issues, and we'll deal with them as we get there. I, that makes me really, really uncomfortable. And I still haven't got to the point that I'm comfortable with, when are you going to hit me with the bill? Because all this is going in a direction that it's going to cost more money. And what we're talking about today is not going to – address either one of them. In my opinion right now, I have been convinced that either one of those issues, whether aesthetics or the amount of pressure that's put on the labor force is gonna be addressed because you still have the same amount of garbage. Wonder if all 58,000 people want a second cart. That's a lot of time, that's a lot of workload. The process, a lot of this stuff is symptomatic of the automation system that everybody we talked about during COVID. We used not to have these discussions. Before COVID, we did not. We talked about funding sources. We never talked about this. Everything was going great, and we were kudos to our staff and our operation because they were getting the job done. We didn't have what's being expressed now. We talked about funding. We got to go up higher on the integrated waste bill because we got to buy trucks, equipment, landfill closures and all the rest of the stuff. We're not even having that conversation here, which is important to me of adding all that in there. This is not a today determination. It's going to be a five, 10 year determination for the strategy and how we're moving forward with this city, what we're going to need to do, because we're going to continue to be what I heard today confirmed it. And what I believe is that we're going to be continued to confront challenges. And at the end of the day, it's going to take more and more funding to make that happen. 
And I don't have a clear picture on that. You're asking to make a determination on what today? Statics? Uh, well, or, hang on a minute. I'm not finished. Or are you asking me to make a decision to relieve the, the workload burden on employees? Because I'm going to tell you something. I think it's going to be a misconception. It's going to be a misconception if you think the cart system, the automated cart system going to one cart when you're all asking people to buy carts, because the people are going to have a lot of traffic. They just buy a cart and put it in there. You pick up one cart, you got to light it down, then you got to go get the other cart and let it down. Then you got to go up one side of the road, do the same to everybody and back down. That does not solve the time matter. In my opinion, I haven't been convinced that that's going to solve the time matter. What it tells me is that you're going to have to buy more trucks and hire more drivers. And you're going to have to shorten routes, which is going to be an excessive cost if you're going to continue to go in that direction. Nobody's had that conversation or even convinced me to that point. And then we've got the landfill closure matters. And then we've got extra costs that's being asked for in the background. I think it's been prudent that the council has asked for RFPs. Not only an RFP, what I'm looking for is an RFP on just totally turning the waste management system over to the private sector or going back to the hybrid. You know, we weren't having these issues when we, we were doing the hybrid. When I say hybrid, it would be we were doing uh, garbage household waste in-house and then we were letting private vendor doing the yard waste and all. Now, yeah, it costs money, but it was working. It seemed like it was working there for a while and got caught up. But now we've gone back to, we want to get into the automated. We want to do it in-house. And I, I just don't think because we're having this conversation that we're going to have one car to go to one car and allow people to buy carts that the status of what we're talking about is going to change. I, I don't want y'all to think that all of a sudden it's gonna change. I don't think it's gonna change. I think we're still gonna be confronted with that challenge. But I do know that it's prudent as leadership to understand where we're going in the future. I wanna know what it cost to turn things over to the private sector like other cities have had to do. Times have changed. I mean, times have changed and you're gonna to have to get in a position where you either restructure, you get left behind, or you're gonna deal with these challenges that you're dealing with. And then you're gonna to have to keep throwing money at it. And that's gonna be an excessive burden to push that off on our citizenry. We can't, we just cannot do that. And it's gonna to get too expensive. I've said that this is gonna get really, really expensive. And William, we have that, uh, uh, what do we call her, a cost, uh, uh, analyst that comes in here and tells us what we need to charge people. That wasn't really, that wasn't a, a cost benefit analysis. That was just somebody telling us, here's where we're going. This is what's going to cost. This is what you need to charge. Well, I haven't really seen a, a detailed breakdown, but we have asked for those cost benefit analysis because there's several factors that the consultant doesn't include in her equations. I mean, when I watched the presentation, I mean, she just wanted to throw more money at it and come up with a way to, on the second cart, we're going to start charging 10 more dollars a month. I'm waiting for that to come. I don't even know if that's going to happen, but it's going to happen. And, you know, I made a comment right here that we probably better off just charging $5 increase on the integrated waste fee and raise those funds because really she was saying the same thing. It was just different, different approach. You know, I don't know if that was meant to be or not. But the other thing, the RFPs, a hybrid, back on a hybrid on the R, a competitive, comp we have not done competitive bids. We have not, RFPs. And we need to see what that looks like. I think it's prudent on this council, on the leadership of this council, that we need to address that. It's the right thing to address. Now, everything that I'm hearing is all management. It's a management issue, all right? And you can take that any way you want to, but I, like I said, I'm talking about business. The stuff, the <laughs> stuff we're talking about is a management matter, and it's the decisions of the management. The management is making these decisions, symptomatic of a a, a single car automation system. That's what it is, and you have to work within that realm. And your labor component is part of that. I'm sorry, I'm not like I said, I'm not talking. To, we, we appreciate the people out there doing the jobs, but I'm talking about business, a labor component, 
or the employee component, you have to have that. <laughs> Whether you're in the private sector or working for the city, it's the same thing. And we, we need to understand those challenges and, and where we're going and what and determine that cost or else the next time that we have this conversation it's going to be something different it's going to be another thing and another thing and we still are not able to provide the assurance to the citizens that we're getting it we're getting it done okay and that's not a that's not your i've said it you know you inherited director short a lot of this so a lot we a lot of employees have to you've inherited this new system. Councils had questions, management wants to go in that direction. So the other thing is I've talked about, we've talked about the cost benefit analysis. I've yet to see that. We've talked about RFPs, yet to see that. And I've talked about years about creative ways of generating new revenue. And I'm just gonna take it as I've been dismissed. I, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm not, I'm not Okay, Director Short, I, I, I see that face, but I'm not talking about you. I understand. Cause you, you weren't in the position when I've, I've been talking about this for years. Um, I mean, I can solve that deficit right now that we're talking about what we saw from the uh, external auditor. I can solve that today. But why is there no will to do these things? Why do we just keep pushing the burden on the 58,000 people and just keep pushing it and pushing it on them? That's not, that's not right. Like I said, times have changed. Mm -hmm. You're gonna to have to do business different. You're gonna to have to restructure. And I think it's prudent, whether we do these things or not, I think we need to look at them. And I think of where we're at today and saying and summing all this up is that I would like to have the answers. Before I move forward, I would like to have the answers to some of those. And I, I, I guess you're asking for the first, but. Why couldn't we continue this to the end of the year and get some of these things answered and addressed, and then we can figure out what to do with it? <laughs> uh, so, all right. whenever I can talk, let me know. Okay. Well, maybe I don't want you to talk. I, I don't <laughs> well, think you do. <laughs> we'll, we'll cut. So anyway, that is just, and, and, and I'm not looking for answers, Ms. City Manager. I just I, made I a summary just, of where I'm at yeah. and why I'm going to vote. So I'm not asking for I know. any I, comments back in the well, I do want to come in, though. But you said a lot. I've asked for some things here that I'd like to see, and that would be my reasoning behind my vote. I, I, okay? I understand. Yeah. And so, you, Mayor, he asked a couple of questions. And it's clearly my opinions. I, yeah. I get it. But he did ask a couple of questions. That yeah. Be. You ask if, it, if it's aesthetics. Or is it, you know, well, that wasn't a question? You asked but, but it there, were, there were some comments made that the city manager might be able to shed yes, some light on as the administrator, so we're going to let him. Well, first of all, in, in, in my opinion, it's, it's aesthetics because we want a standard. I don't know when you drive down your street what you see. I don't know if where you live you see bags of trash sitting outside the trash can, you know, and, and all that. But but it's not a good pretty Mind sight, finish. and uh, and so it's aesthetics, and it's about if we didn't have one truck following another, I, we basically we've got twice the number of drive you know drivers out there. One truck following another, you you're burning diesel fuel. It doesn't take a rocket scientist. Well, if how are you gonna? Counselor, 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 allow Look. him the. Respect so I'm not finished. Finish it. So. <laughs> uh, but so it's both. And so if we had the cart system, we wouldn't have duplicate duplicated uh, labor on a route with inmates. They could be out doing the inmates could be out doing something else. And so so we want a standard. When you go to other cities, they are they have standards. Columbus, Georgia deserves a standard. I hope you want a standard in Columbus, Georgia. A clean, when you drive down the street, it should be neat and clean and not trash all over the place or animals out get, I, I mean, it's a standard. And the, it's a rhetorical question. Do you not want a standard in Columbus? I do. And so, and that standard, if we set that standard, would give these drivers relief that they would not have to be sitting here like they're doing now, crying out to you, this legislative body, 
help us. They're saying to you, listen to your, my management. That's what they're saying. Because they believe in trust management with 40 years of experience. They know what they're doing. And we've brought study. I've been bringing studies here for 15 years. I, I'd love for you to say, Isaiah, bring me a book of every study. And I'll bring them and put them right there on the table. Because, and, and the consultant that you've had here multiple times over the last 10 years, the consultant has, has said to us, here is, you know, and they, they've done it for Macon. They've done it for all Bennett. They've done it for Metro City. They have credentials to show that we've done this for other communities. Columbus has not listened because I guess we figure we, uh, you know, we, we, we got it all figured out. We don't have to listen to a paid consultant. So you asked a question, I think, Mr. Pittman, you wanted to respond to some things that the counselor said, but it's both. Absolutely. Uh, from a, uh, a operational business perspective, and to deliver some facts to you, all the things that we brought before you is from facts. You know, the facts are that we know that the one cart system will work. We know that the one cart system implementation will relieve and reduce the cost, the operating cost that we do daily. We're working 40 hours plus 10 plus 10 is 60 hours a week. If we implement the one cart system, the staff that we have that's picking up the additional garbage on the ground is our staff for our yard waste. So that's where the, 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 the confusion comes in that we got more than enough staff. I've been doing this for 30 plus years. And I'm gonna tell you, I've seen it work, the one car system. Everybody put their garbage in their can. We run the minimum amount of routes. We create efficiency in the operation and everybody gets to go home. We don't have to work additional 10 hours because we gotta go pick up yard waste on a Wednesday and a Saturday. You know, it, it's, it's not set up and designed that way. The facts are, it will work. I've done it, I've been a part of it. I've been a, even been a consultant in this business. I've been a department director. I've been a manager. I've been a solid waste worker. I've done it all. I've started at the top and worked my way all the way up. I've started when they were going to the back door, picking it up by hand, taking it to the curb. You know, it's, it's a no-brainer. You know, it's progress that we are making. We don't want to be left behind. We want to move forward. So what we're saying to you is that we want to be better. We want to be more efficient. We want to be exclusive. We don't want to be mediocre. We don't want to be in the middle. We want to be sitting at the top. So when somebody calls the city manager or one of you guys up there and ask about the city of Columbus, well, we are progressing. And that's what we got to do. We got to take care of our people. My staff is not robots. They are people just like you and I. You know, we got a system in place where we work 40 hours a week. We can't even honor that. You know, they call off on a Wednesday, they tired, they wore out, they broke. Saturday, same effect. But we gotta get that yard waste up. We gotta get that garbage up, it's a priority. And that's what we're gonna do. Now we can't wait until the end of the year and try to figure out something. We gotta do something today. We gotta make a decision today. You know, it impacts us, my staff, the community. You know, make a decision. I'm telling you from facts, from experience, the one card system works and it will continue to work. All right. Thank you, Mr. Pittman. Councillor Kogel. Well, you, you're, you're next. You can, I'll yield to Councillor Dirks. Okay. Michael. Please. Thank you, sir. We're not, we're not entitled to respond only to staff and you. Yeah. <laughs> no, sir. Your light okay. is on. The right. floor is yours. Well, Mr. City Manager, I want standards too, okay? We've got ordinance on the books. I would like better uh, uh, beautification when it comes to litter. I'd like all the sign ordinances enforced. I'd like our tree ordinance enforced. I'd like a lot of things enforced, but it doesn't get done. I don't think just to say because we go to a one car system that all of a sudden everything's just going to clear up and it's gonna look better. All you're telling people is that you want them to put less trash out. That's all you're telling no, them. No. And if they get a second car, they're just gonna take the stuff off the streets and put it in the second car, which you gotta pick that car up too at the same time. So 
I'm looking at this more from business. I mean, I'm not looking at it like from a standpoint of just throwing out assertions or a political aspect of this to just provide a footing for the basis of people's positions. I'm not doing that. I've told you that I have not been convinced yet that we're going to be able to make this, uh, uh, that we're going to be able to accomplish this. I don't see that going away. I don't see people still, what are we going to do when they just put out trash? We're not going to pick it up. We're only going to pick up the cart and move on. Is that a question? And we're going to, what are we going to tell them? I mean, you're going to have to get the second card and then you're going to have to pick up the second card or you're going to have to get, take it somewhere else. I don't know. It's not a question. Okay. I'm just posing it as a thought. <laughs> okay. I'm posing it as a thought. But that does not negate some of the things I've talked about that we really need to understand. And before we make a decision, if that's what it takes to get some of these things accomplished, then that's what I'm saying. And, you know, what we're doing today, I know where it's going to lead, but I'm still getting and trying to get answers to some of these other questions that are out there because at the end of the day, eventually it's going to lead to an excessive cost. But when you show me we can start doing some of these things to help out, then, you know, we would be in a better position to move forward. Thank you, sir. Councilor Kogel? Um, I appreciate all my colleagues' uh, comments, and uh, I think they really sum up um, what we're asking for here. Uh, uh, you know, we're not, we're definitely, like Councilor Tucker said, not denying um, and not voting down an integrated one waste cart system. We're trying to not spend the next six or nine, however many months, chasing our tail and trying to um, and trying to react to an issue. What we're trying to do here as a as a body is put all of the information out before council so that we have all the information that is in front of us. And Mr. City Manager, we want a clean, structured city just like you do. We, we, want, we want to look down our street and see order and, and all the trash lined up. It's, it's pretty, I agree. It's a pretty sight. But what we're, at, I mean, we have asked, we have uh, begged, we have demanded, we have gone every route in the last year, probably a little bit more now than a year, for a cost, cost analysis on how much it costs to run public works so that we can lay it out beside a competitive RFP and we can look it out, we can, we can look at what public works costs, we can determine whether it is better for our citizens to privatize, to hybrid, or to go to public works. Because when it comes down to it, we have a responsibility for our, to our citizens to have a very pretty, structured, and uh, clean city. We have that responsibility, but we also have a, a responsibility, and I would argue a little higher up on the on the food chain, we also have a financial responsibility to our citizens to let our citizens know how much this is going to cost in the future. And so when we have an analysis or the, the lady come and give us a presentation over a presentation of what it potentially could cost, we don't have a commitment on how much this is going to cost. And so to say, yes, we're going to implement this July 1st, I'm going to have to respond to my constituents, well, sorry, I don't know how much this is going to cost you yet. We're just going to, uh, we've just approved it for July 1st, and we'll figure it out before July 1st. And so we sit here and we're chasing our tails all the time, and we're trying, we're, we're being a reactive government and a reactive um, council body because we're not given all the information all at the same time. We're left here to piece it together over and over and over again. And you're forcing us to do the work at the table. And so <laughs> we end up, it's, it's true. Really? I mean, yeah. I mean, we've had, we've had conversation over conversation, presentation over presentation over the last, I, I've been here for 14 months. 
we haven't had one consolidated conversation that says, this is the competitive RFP, this is what, uh, this is our cost analysis, this is what it costs to run public works, and this is what it would cost to have a hybrid. And this, these are the options we could either, uh, we could add a fee to our water bill, we could add a fee to all of the citizens in Columbus, or we could add a, you know, a fee to just the, the people who, who have trash collection. And, and yet we have to sit here and we have to waste valuable time having these discussions where we can't just come together and, and put it all out in, in one, conversation. We're sitting here, we're chasing our tails all the time. Well, Mayor, if I may just quickly, I, I've got good news for the counselor. One piece of good news, it's not going to cost your constituents anything to go to a one cart system. They just need to put trash in the cart. And if they need a second cart, it's available for $55. That's good news. And the other good news is the RFP is due on May 3rd. And, and I can't wait for you to see what it's going to cost, and and I'm all for contracting it out. Pay pay the private sector what they're going to charge you to contract it out. It's going to be real interesting to see, and so that's good news. And uh, and so as I said earlier, I've we've had over the years. I can bring you 15 presentations on. And I think when Weatherington was the mayor, I brought a book to council that thick with every presentation that had been done and recommendation. And I gave a book to every council member we, we, way back we, then. And so, and so we've continued to do those through this day. And so we bring the information and we have professional consultants giving it to you. You just have not accepted it. Well, and, and we've got a couple of counselors lined up, but I'm going to, I'm going to go to Councilor Garrett. Garrett. He has to leave uh, for a, uh, appointment this afternoon uh, counselor just briefly um I, I mean i'm all in favor of skin the rfp but everywhere that i've seen that they do private waste pickup they use an asl and they're almost all one cart systems uh, it was that way uh, in montgomery where my wife's from uh, multiple other cities places i've been i've had trials i've seen it so if anything, we would be getting our citizens ready for what a RFP would probably be the response if the RFP made more sense. The RFPs are due in May, so I think we've got plenty of time to uh, find out, you know, any and all of our questions regarding cost analysis, and that can be compared to the RFP. But uh, right now, I mean, you know, if we go with an RFP, they're probably going to say we can only have one card. I like that the city's making a compromise right now and allowing a second card, and it's at a very affordable rate. Uh, I'm in favor of this. I do have to leave to go to the doctor, but I would uh, move for its approval. And, um, you know, if, if there's other people that need to speak on it, you know, certainly I can, but I'm going to call in immediately and I vote on it. All right. There's a motion and a second. <laughs> motion second to approve the uh, one cart system. Uh, Councilor Tucker to the motion. Uh, all right. Well, then we have nobody queued up to speak to the motion. So all in favor of approving the one card system, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? No. All right, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. One, two, three, and uh, Mayor Pocchio is voting in favor. Okay, so it's... I guess he's offered you the Yes, I'm sorry. And uh, all those opposed, please raise your right hand. One, two, three, four, so it's inconclusive. All right, Councillor Tucker. Yes. Uh, when we had Amways picking up the yard, yard waste, was that actually helping with the workload of the staff? Well, at the time we were short staffed. That's the only reason why okay. we had to go to a private vendor to help pick up the yard waste. We didn't have enough drivers. Mm -hmm. So my, my question is, and we were short staff, if we would bring in something like M waste to do the yard waste, would that help with um, the workload of our our staff? Well, absolutely, if, because we yeah, would no longer if, yeah. need them. <laughs> it would, the question is, you know, our integrated waste fund is busted. 
And where, where are you going to get the money? We can't pay another $10 million to M Waste yeah. and, and still run in a great waste. Okay. How, we can't afford it. How many, when we had M Waste, I know when we originally did it, I think they was only doing, and please forgive me if I'm misstating um, this, is it five routes or five? They started with five routes. They ended up with all 14 routes. So they started with five routes. Correct. And that the five routes was one point seven seven million dollars, right? Oh yeah, Toy. Yeah, I was about to say <laughs> call my first name. Say yeah, Toy was reading because I was kind of trying to prepare for it just this day. But it was one point seven one point seven seven million dollars for the five routes. For if you you said it's fourteen routes mm -hmm. total. Um, hmm. I thought somebody said something. I'm sorry. So it's 14 routes total. So I guess you would multiply that by three um, to get the full cost of how much all routes. Is that how it would work? Well, uh, yeah. You said they went up. We can let the finance director address. So. It was seven million. So, so what are you trying to do? Figure out how much we paid them. So here, here here's my my thing. I know that we have um, some funds that have not been extended through American Rescue Plan dollars, and my question would be, could we to um, get us through the process of having these discussions and trying to determine an actual resolution for our workers to take the workload off of them to actually have someone, I don't know if we can just call Amway's back and possibly do the five routes for the 1.77 or if they went up, I know um, the director is about to give that amount, we do have the RFP process going on right now. And in that RFP process, we said to do multiple ways, meaning a hybrid, they're doing all, all the, the, the waste um, collections, that this is part of the RFP. But for right now, I'm asking if it is possible. I don't know if we wanna do five routes or if we wanna do 14 routes, but I do know that we have extra funds in the American Rescue Plan dollars that have not been extended. If we can use these funds to help our dearly beloved workers of public works to do the um, yard waste. And that way, while we're trying to come up with a solution for, and this, this is not coming out of our budget, per se, it's coming out of grant dollars. So putting some grant dollars out there and paying with the grant dollars, that way we can have these conversations and actually have some, some time within this, this time period. I think the RFP closes May 4th or 3rd. <coughs> so we'll have some time um, in between that just to kind of offset the workload would that be something that will help the employees? You, you know about the ARP dollars. <clears throat> oh, no, I was going to speak to the cost. <clears throat> Initially, the cost per route um, under the yard waste RFP and waste was $29,630 per uh, route. Uh, then they so went can, up. Can you rep repeat that? It, it what, was, what they went up to? It went up to $31,400 per route. And that's what we uh, were paying them, but there was a request that was made from Amways. Um, and I'm trying to find that request. That's the only piece that I'm missing now in terms of the additional amount that they wanted to charge, which is initially, <clears throat> excuse me, while we got out of the private yard waste collection business, um, towards the end of 2023 but was because they were going up. So they was going up. It was going 30. up beyond the 31,400 per route. 
I mean, thirty-one thousand four hundred per route. I'll get that information in terms of what they were asking us. What to it is come okay. up to last. Year. You said, can you repeat? It was thirty-one thousand. They were char We were paying thirty-one thousand four hundred per route per month. So on an annualized basis, that would be five point two seven five million. Okay. So, um, in reference to that, the thirty-one four per ramp, and I, I mean, I'm just brainstorming here, just trying to come up with some things. But um, I know the city manager wants you to speak regarding those American Rescue Plan dollars. So I'll wait to hear that. I'm sorry, what was the question regarding the American Rescue Plan? If it's something that we can she utilize. She said she knows that we have ARP dollars left and wants to know if we can use those ARP dollars to hire someone like an Amway's back to contract out versus go into the one cart system. And and so that's and, and I will say I'm not saying versus going to the one cart system. I'm saying until we, the RFP closes May 3rd. Um, and normally, once that RFP closes, what's the process? Okay, so, yeah, right. Because mm -hmm. that's when all the proposals are due. They're due by May 3rd. So then there's a process, right? Once we mm -hmm. get the proposals, we have to go through the proposals and make sure that all the proposed offers qualify, right? Meaning that they present it. Uh, proposal to us that has all the information in it that's required to be in the RFP. Um, then there's a committee that's selected. Um, usually it is the department that's requesting um, the RFP to uh, com comprise the committee. There's a, usually three to five voting members on the committee. And once the committee is established, then there are meetings that take place with the committee um, really sort of subsequent to when we receive the proposal, that process could be, I mean, it really just depends on the time and availability of the committee, to be quite honest, and how many proposals we receive and how much time it just really takes to evaluate those proposals. But it could be anywhere from two to, two to three months to go through committee. And once it goes through the committee, um, there is a recommendation of the committee to either accept an offer, a proposal, or not. Um, but if an offer is, um, a proposal is acceptable to a committee member, then it goes on the city manager's agenda to come before the council to accept and approve that proposal. And one of the things that would not be on the agenda or discussed openly would be the cost. Because an RFP, um, the, in an RFP process, the costs are negotiable. So we don't disclose those costs. Well, and, and I will say that I want to figure out a way to speed up that process with the committee. Yeah, well, I mean, we'll do and, that. And because I really want to get that back before you. And I, I, I hope that we're able to move forward with contracting out waste collection. And as far as. Uh, and whatever the cost is, is what the cost will be. As far as the ARP dollars, I mean, all of the money that has been allocated to the city has been spoken for, so to speak, um, and that council has approved in phases how we would spend that money. Um, what we'll have to do is um, take a look at if that plan, if that spending plan is still feasible, to be quite honest, um, to see about potentially reallocating some of the ARP money. So once we um, possibly reallocate some of the ARP dollars, that what involvement does council has have? Do they have it after you all have decided how to reallocate it, or does council have a voice in um, some of the priorities that council sees and to be able to provide those um those well, priority items. Well, as executive management, we're going to do what executives do, and then we're going to bring it to the legislative body so you can do what you do. So we will look at it, and we will, based on what we know operational demands are, 
um, we'll have a, a, those things that we recommend and we'll bring it to you and you can approve it or change it or do whatever you want. Um, you don't have to listen to what staff bring to you. Okay, is it not that? Not and this listen. thing sort of changes every day, quite honest, with the ARP uh, and how we can spend those monies. I mean, we were under the assumption just recently that there was a certain cutoff to certain types of costs as of uh, December 20, uh, 31st of 24. And now we've received um, information from uh, the Treasury, Treasury. that uh, some of those costs that were once not allowable beyond December 31st of 24 are now extended through December 2026. So that does changes. I'll say that one more time. I'm some sorry. of the some of the costs, some of the costs for the some of the programs uh, that were set to end, like we had to have all of the monies the allocated um, sort the of allocations. spent for a particular type of cost by the end of this year. Mm -hmm. They've extended that to 2026. To 2026. Okay, so. I, I think from, I think it was a presentation and I know that we had put allocations in, but we didn't use all those, those allocations of funds. And I'm not trying to go up to the $7 million. It, it really is just some relief um, of the routes. So if we could look at kind of what would be best as far as re relief on some of the heavier routes that have yard waste. And I know that um, Amways was giving us, I guess, like a month-to-month -month cost versus mm -hmm. the, the cost with, for the year. It was, like, different for the year versus the month-to-month. -month. Is that what? No. Actually, it was the same amount per month. So regardless whether you do month-to-month -month or do a year annual well, contract. What we wound up paying Amways was the same amount that was under the annual contract okay. in terms of the month to month. So if we could use the American Rescue Plan dollars to help offset some of the workload, could we look at doing that based on kind of those high routes that heavy routes that, that need yard waste? Through, I'm just saying some of the routes that probably, based on um, you all going out, you know which routes have like way more yard waste it, than it's others. It's not the yard waste that, that we're talking about. It's yeah. the ground waste, which is... But yard waste is being picked up on Saturdays. Right. So because that's... We're using the yard waste drivers mm -hmm. to drive trucks to pick up the ground waste. Exactly. So if we do yard waste with some of these American Rescue Plan dollars until we get the RFP process done, it will alleviate, alleviate that Saturday pickup. Still have to do all 14 and on Wednesdays, correct? Yeah. You, you wouldn't have to do the Saturday pickup, though, meaning well, that they don't have to work on Saturday because that, that has been the main comment is, is them. Well, they're working open. six days a week, not five days a week. They're working six days a week when they normally work four tens. Yeah, so that's Monday through Friday? Monday, for working Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Okay, so if Standard, we did... Standard, normal. So if we did yard waste, which yard waste is being picked up on Saturdays now, mm -hmm. if we did yard waste, that means that they would not be working on that Saturday. They would only be working those four days. Is that... I see what you're. I see what you're trying. I, I, I think she's saying that, you know, since we do yard waste on Wednesdays and Saturdays, right. if you hired Amways to do yard waste, then our drivers wouldn't work Wednesday, Saturday, picking up yard waste. Maybe maybe and, not Saturday, uh, but they'll still be working on a Wednesday. Yeah, for sure, and, because and, you got ground waste. But I think the first question is, can you use ARP dollars for such a task? We'll check. I check in that, as far as the ARP, and uh, what it would take in terms of. Because like I was mentioning earlier in terms of the now allowable, ex allowing the expenditures, some expenditures to exceed um, beyond 2024, now we have to reprogram how we um, had originally budgeted for those dollars. I mean, extending some of the, the, the shelf life on some of the expenditures for another two years that has to be programmed into 
the reallocation of the cost. Um, but I'll check into, we'll check into the use of uh, those dollars to see what's available and just to see if there's enough funding to um, accommodate the privatization of yard waste for a certain period of time. Yeah, I mean, it's not the whole right. the whole year. Mm -hmm. It's just the offset because we're just looking at that RFP, mm -hmm. you know, process just to provide some relief on that. Okay. And also, since we're talking about ARP, can we bring the ARP presentation back during the next council meeting that way? I mean, it'd be a good thing to look at it, especially since we're about to go into the um, the budget season. Mm -hmm. All right, Councilor Davis. Thank you, Mayor. Um, to kind of add to some of the comments my fellow colleague made, Councilor Tucker, I just want to say that, look, there, there may be a way to make all this happen and I'm not against the one court system. I will tell you though, as I said, I, I feel like we're at a place in time in this city that we've got to strategically plan and we've got to look five and 10 years out. And I'm talking about the big cost items in the big picture that I don't know if we're gonna be able to, to make those adjustments. And then when I add what I hear here, it just tells me then are we delaying the inevitable of what could come in the future? Uh, hybrid system, if you need more money, I mean, we just talked about it, but I can I can find you six, seven million, six, seven million dollars you need right now. I mean, if you if you're willing to approve it, Miss City Manager, if you're willing to put it on the agenda, I'll approve it. What, where are you going to get it out of fund balance? So we're going to charge a transit user fee, a closed landfill well, closure make the motion. fee. We're going to do that. Make, make the motion. Okay, then we'll head that way. I, I've been asking for it for I, a I long mean, when time, you say transit no... user fee, you're talking about charge people who don't necessarily get a water bill. Uh, what are you talking about? Anybody that gets a water bill. Anybody that gets a water bill under our current collection si okay. system. If you've got a water bill, you're staying somewhere. You're you're mm -hmm. you're paying rent somewhere or yeah. you have a house. Well, I mean, I, I don't oppose that. I never have. And I'm just saying if that's what you want as a council member. Well, I'm, you I'm can... throwing these solutions out there, but yeah. I'm telling you, they're falling on deaf ears. You're saying it now, but I've never heard you say what you just said. I, I, I received an email from you. That you said. How many years have I been talking about a transient landfill closure fee? I, Councilor I, Thomas, have you heard me talk about it for a long time? So then, but look, just like but, around anyway. this table, you all make motions all the time. Why haven't you made a motion? We'll, we'll do that if you want to do that, and then the mayor can add it in his budget. Councilor Thomas. Well, I, no, I'd no, like to. Permission. Anyway, Miss City Manager, I think that we can find the funds needed. We just don't have to keep impacting, putting the impact on the 58,000 people out there. I've said this over and over and over. The district I represent is challenging because not everybody's going to be able to, the one cart system is not going to work. I got people with large acreage, lots of trees, big yards, lots of leaf, lots of straw. I've got people all over the board that's different from the characteristics in a lot of other we're talking Areas. household waste is what we're talking about on the one cart. Household. It will work. Household waste. We're going to continue in the yard waste or we're going to continue doing what we're, we're doing? We're, we're not talking about yard waste. No, point. but are we? Yeah. Or are you going to one cart there too? Are you asking me to prove that? I have not. No one is talking to me about a one cart for yard waste. It's all only about household waste. Uncontainerized trash that's sitting there in a bucket or in a bag or wherever along the- So are we gonna to continue to pick up the the carts and the bags that people put out for yard waste? As far as I know. Okay. All right, that's good information. Yeah, so what we're talking about here, if it wasn't clear, has to do with household waste. And, 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 and because one truck is following another, it's forcing them to work off days when they typically work four days 10 hours a day. I, I, you know, I, I think management, you heard John Pittman talk about his history, his background. He's worked in these industries. Drill Short has been here 40 years. We got to listen to them. They're, they're the professionals. They go to the APW or whatever, 
Uh, they know best practices, but we're not listening to them. Well, and I would, I, I tend to agree with one of the things the counselor said, and that is I'm not sure unlimited yard waste is sustainable. I think at some point you got to go to some type of maximum number of bags or something, because as Councilor Davis pointed out, there are different areas of our community that have different size lots. And it's really not fair for going back to Councilor Tucker, the senior who is on a postage stamp size lot to be paying the same thing as somebody that's cutting an acre and a half. That's just, that just doesn't make sense to me. Councilor Thomas, I'm sorry. I uh, Mr. Mayor, we have now had two votes on this issue that did not um, were not sufficient to pass, and we have had people sitting in this audience to, on the public agenda for four hours, and I would like for us to move to the public agenda. No, oh, we were going. We we listened to the conversation around here talking about an item that this council was interested in talking about. And I, I appreciate the recommendation. We are trying to move as quickly as we can to these individuals. There is nobody else. You were the last person, by the way. So, does anybody else have any comments before we move on? All right, we will move to the public agenda. And, um, <coughs> Public agenda, um, what we'll do is each of you will have five minutes and we will very politely at the end of five minutes tell you that if you want to continue, you can come back for another three at the end of the clerk's agenda. Um, and we'll start with Mr. Patrick Davidge, Davidge regarding illegal immigration city county, city county policy. Welcome, sir. If you just state your name and your state of residence. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. My name is Patrick Davidge, 7401 Blackman Road. I have a very simple question, Mr. Mayor, since you're the executor of the city. Is the consolidated government of Columbus, Georgia, Muscogee County considered a sanctuary city for illegal immigration? No, not to my knowledge. Are you aware that there are actually four separate counties in the state Clark County, Clayton County, the the cop, the cop, I can't pronounce it. The cop, thank you, in Gwinnett County, that are sanctuary cities in the state. No, I I missed the last two, but no, I wouldn't be aware. Uh, my understanding is Georgia law prohibits sanctuary cities in the state of Georgia. And this is has this is not in direct reference to what has happened in Athens. This is in reference to a friend of mine who was violently assaulted by an illegal immigrant, which she had now just moved out of the state and out of this city because of this incident, not about a month ago. Um, Unaware. If I may dovetail slightly to the issue of street litter and roadkill, and I apologize, this was not on my agenda list, and this well, has nothing to do with the one can system. Unfortunately, sir, that's why we require people to that's sign fine. up for their topic. That's so fine. I can't let you speak on that. All you right. can register or sign up and come back next. I'll, next then time. I will do so. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you for waiting. All right. Next is Mr. Marvin Broadwater, Senior, regarding the Charter of Columbus, Georgia. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem online. City Council members, Mr. City Manager, Madam Deputy Assistant City Attorney, I pray you all are well. Mr. Mayor, you can go ahead and give me my three minutes at the end. You got it. My name is Marvin Broadwood Senior. I reside in Columbus, Georgia, 31909. Thank you for your continued service to our fair city. I'm here to address two items of our charter, which I believe are the crux of the matter of a great number of disconcernments with our community. I have, I have committed myself to attend as many council meetings as humanly possible. This allows me to make certain assertions and speak to this council in a wise and prudent manner. I have thought about this for the last 21 years. 
my, since my journey led me to this community in 2003. After each council meeting, I pondered it as I drove home, why is there a discombobulation between this council and this community? Only would, only, uh, one would only have to view the last council meeting to formulate this overbearing question. It is my belief that it can directly be attributed to our charter. You see, chapter two, section 2-600 references that the mayor and council are elected in nonpartisan primaries and elections. I do realize that some of you believe that because you are not aligned with a political party during campaigning, it allows you to vote your conscience and not be held accountable to a group once elected. However, the same can be said, one may campaign one way and govern another. Hence, what we just saw a few minutes ago and last council meeting. You may ask, why do I believe this to be true? Let's explore the evening five citizens stood at this podium to ask about taxes being lowered. Not less than five minutes after, a motion was made that $2 million be removed from the injured care fund, taking funds from the poor. I do realize we live in a democracy and I am keenly aware that everyone has the right to be heard as I have fought and continue to fight and always will fight for the right of everyone. I do mean everyone to be heard. I learned that from former Councilor Evelyn Turner Pugh and the namesake of the man on this building, Mr. C. E. Red McDaniels. Even if I disagree with my fellow citizens' beliefs, I must at least listen and respect their opinion as long as their retorts do not infringe on my rights or my civil liberties. Because in a democracy, that is the basic fiber of, of the foundation. You see, changing our charter would only require a simple addition to your legislative agenda, which I have attended on several occasions. My second point, this, this afternoon is to ask you to consider revising the requirement of the charter review from 10 years to five years. It's time that this council become a little more progressive and adopt the philosophy of a changing society. If there were no forward thinking in the beginning of this country, after the construction of our constitution, there would be no Bill of Rights to protect individual liberties. There would be no women voters. Or there would not be, in 1971, 18 year olds having the ability to vote. I have 15 seconds. Society is constantly changing. You all must change with it. I thank you for your time, and I'll be back, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. See you in a little bit. Thank you, sir. All right. Next is Mr. Gregory Foster, representing Chatham Woods Subdivision. Mr. Foster, thank you for your patience today, sir. No problem. My name is Gregory Foster. I live at 5446 Chatham Woods Court, Columbus, Georgia. I apologize in advance if I'm too boisterous. My wife often tells me you're standing inside, Foster, not outside. I guess 20 years, 11 months, and 18 days of service, the United States Army has eroded some of the social graces my parents worked so hard to instill. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been asked to represent my friends and neighbors who reside in Chatham Woods subdivision. Collectively, we are opposed to the rezoning of the property located at 5201 Macon Road. That change would allow the construction of apartment buildings, townhouses for rent, 
and commercial businesses as part of a planned unit development, or PUD, which we believe would cause the residents of our subdivision a great deal of harm. Consider this. Friendly Avenue, Greensboro, North Carolina. Cedar Point Road, Jacksonville, Florida. Loudoun County, Tennessee. Marat Island, Indianapolis, Indiana. Union Township, Cincinnati, Ohio. And University City, San Diego, California. Within the past several years, each of these communities has opposed rezoning that would have allowed the construction of multifamily rental properties in their neighborhoods. And each of these communities cited nearly the exact same reasons for their opposition to rezoning such as. There would be increased traffic. It would put a strain on existing infrastructure. Property values would go down. It would negatively impact the environment. There would be an increase in crime. The PUD could be mismanaged. The increased population density would cause overcrowding. There is the risk, the very real risk, that the PUD will not be completed as planned. It would change our community forever. Those sound just like the reasons we have cited for our opposition to the proposed rezoning on Macon Road. Now, you have absolutely no requirement to listen to the folks in North Carolina, Florida, Tennessee, Indiana, Ohio, and California as you well, you know, California. But you surely have an obligation to consider the concerns of our own people right here in Farmington, in Sears Woods, in Wintry, in Willow Bend, Sheridan Forest, Sears Pond, Sears Pond South, Shenandoah, and my friends and neighbors who have become family to me in Chatham Woods. As you all know, the home is the largest investment that most people will make in a lifetime. It is the home that secures the family and makes up the neighborhood where the home is located. It is impossible to separate the home from the neighborhood. Changing this neighborhood would, in effect, change our homes. And please understand, we're not just talking about structures and properties. We're talking about homes and the families that make them so. In Chatham Woods, we feel that constructing a PUD in such close proximity to our subdivision would degrade our quality of life. It would change the amiable character of not only our subdivision, but of all the other subdivisions that make up our greater neighborhood. This neighborhood is made up of thousands of hardworking, good-natured, and conscientious people. They are citizens in good standing that represent nearly every demographic in this, the most diverse country in the world. We are an American quilt. And we are sewn together by strong moral fiber and the just cause of serving, protecting, and defending our neighbors in our neighborhood. Respectfully, most respectfully, we ask that you heed our warnings, accept our recommendations, and grant our request to deny the proposed rezoning the 5201 Macon Road. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it, Mr. Foster. And, and you will have an opportunity to make your voice heard again when the rezoning comes to PAC and then comes back to this, this council. We appreciate it. And we're a big fan of this esteemed body. Thank you, we sir. We really, really recognize what you do for us all, and we appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you. All right, next is Mr. Edward Berry, representing the legitimation station regarding the purpose and mission of the state. Thank you for your patience, sir. Good afternoon, <laughs> Mr. Mayor, member of, members of council. Uh, my name is Ed Berry. I live at 2909 Fleetwood Drive. I'm here to inform council about legitimation station. Last year, there were some questions about what legitimation station does and what uh, purpose it has. So I thought I'd come before you and try to answer some of those questions. First and foremost, it's an outreach program and it is a beneficiary of the crime prevention grant. Around 2009, a little bit of history about legitimation station. 
around 2009, several of the uh, legal leaders, uh, judges, uh, Laura Mescon from uh, Columbus State University, she, um, a, a lot, as well as Sally Haskins with legal services and various members of the bar, got together and they were concerned about children being picked up in the middle of the night by law enforcement. Uh, and Judge Warner Kennan was involved. Uh, he started seeing kids that had very serious criminal activity uh, around them. Um, they started looking at the statistics uh, of these children that were picked up at night, and there was a common thread among them, and that was no father role model at home. In Georgia, if a child is born out of wedlock, and we all know this, but there are some people that don't know it, the law allows the mother to be the legal custodian, but the biological father has absolutely no rights. Um, only a superior court judge can bestow legal rights to a biological father of an illegitimate child. Due to that being the law, those agencies that I mentioned got together and formed Legitimation Station. We were housed in the Muskogee County Law Library for quite some time, and it was staffed by volunteer attorneys that would come in, and also lay people that were volunteers. And it worked very well. But a lot of times, Legitimation Station went uh, unanswered by fathers that came in because Volunteer attorneys uh, had other legal commitments and could not be there. All of the fathers that request help and assistance in their petition for legitimation must make less than 125% of the poverty level, level. We are very strict about that. Number one, we'd have too many people. As time went on, many legitimate uh, legitimation station uh, allowed illegitimate children to secure a relationship with their father. In order to keep the active and consistent, or at least legitimation station active and consistent, the judges recruited a, an attorney uh, that uh, could be put on contract and be available the first, second, and third Friday of each month. Uh, to answer questions about the petitioning and, and how to fill out the documents. Uh, I brought my, uh, another duty that I, uh, I have is to recruit volunteers. And my volunteers are here, that, uh, this is a, a portion of our volunteers and they've been sitting with me throughout this uh, time. Statistics show that when a child has a relationship with a father, that child, and it, it's a lot of, it's pragmatic common sense that that child will have less of a chance of being involved in the correctional system. Uh, there's a father role model. They're not out looking for other avenues to, to uh, get um, uh, acceptance, like gangs and things like that. Not only is the child helped, but we have found that fathers that actually become involved in the child's life, actually have behavior that is for the better because they know that they're going to have the child, uh, uh, at least an input into how the child is raised. So I just wanted to give counsel an overview of what Legitimation Station is about and I'm available to answer any questions if they have them. Ed, thank you very sure, much, and I'm, sure. I'm familiar with the program, and it is it is an outstanding program. Uh, actually, had an opportunity a couple years back to meet with some um, former gang members that had been incarcerated, and they, two of the three, I think, actually referenced the legitimation station as helping them reconnect and becoming fathers to their children. So. Right. Uh, so we appreciate what y'all doing. Thank you for your patience sure. and waiting today. Thank you very much. And appreciate if you'd you like, me. if you'd like three more minutes, you're welcome to them at the end of the clerk's agenda. Th that's all right. We'll <laughs> all <laughs> Thank right. you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. Next is Mr. Micah Asante. 
uh, regarding a request to have remaining balance of an invoice for EMS services waived. Mr. Sante, I hope that's the proper way to say your name. Yes, sir. Um, good afternoon. My name is Mike Asante. Um, I live in Columbus, Georgia, um, in um, 4532 Hitting Him Lane. Um, so I have received a um, mail from the um, EMS service, and um, and is about the payment of of a medical um, um, concerning that had, had occurred on um, February second, twenty twenty four, and um, as um, my uh, insurance ended up pay paying um, nine hundred out of the. Um, I don't know, not 100, but $751.19 out of the $958. And, um, and um, I am currently um, unemployed, and I'm currently um, um, a CSU student right, as of right now. So it's kind of hard for me to go ahead and um, pay the $206.81. So I was asking if, if you can um, waive the payment. Well, Mr. Sante, uh, just out of curiosity, I don't mm. know that it makes a difference, but is that is that uh, an invoice from Columbus Fire and EMS, or is it from another ambulance company? Um, Columbus Fire and EMS. Okay. All right. Well, it would um, uh, to the to the si assistant city attorney, I, I, it would take a motion and a vote of the majority of this council to consider that, and I know it. They struggle with issues like this because they want desperately to help, but they understand that by doing that, they open a portal and there'll be a precedent, and then people are lining lining up in the government center to but to to try to try to get some assistance. Councilor Thomas, um, Mr. Asante, tell me again how how much you are asking us to um, um, delete, if you will. Um, 200 and two hundred and two hundred two hundred and six dollars and eighty one cents. Two hundred and six dollars and eighty one cents. Yes, ma'am. Well, we don't really even have enough for a quorum if they did want to. And Mr. Santi, right now there is no no motion made. Uh, Assistant City Attorney Fay. Um, I sorry, just wanted Lisa. to ask if you've had a chance to talk with the finance department about possible arrangements before you came to the council. If we don't get a vote, that might be one way to handle it. Yes, ma'am. So you did you did talk to them about making a payment schedule or? Um, no, we talked about the situation of uh, the whole payment and uh, insurance, and we, we have been told that from our insurance that um, that that um, Northside um, Medical Center was not one of the um, um, places that they would support, but they end up paying regardless. Mr. City Manager. Um, Mayor, <clears throat> um, I, I'll have staff <coughs> to um, get his um, his contact information, um, and um, we'll I'll, I'll follow up with you. We'll follow up with you. Is that two hundred and six dollars? Two hundred and six dollars and one cents. We'll, we'll just get his information. Okay. Mr. Santi, the city manager is going to have his office and the finance uh, director look into this and see if there's anything that can be done. If uh, Maybe not a waiver, but at least trying to work out something so that you might be able to handle going going forward. I'm happy to see that you're upright and on your feet. If you were uh, utilizing our ambulance service, that's not always the case. And uh, we appreciate you coming in uh, and, and at least letting us know about it. So you can get with Miss Danielle and she'll take your information. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, and last is Ms. Teresa Elamine. I think she had sent me a 
Yeah, she had sent me a text, I think, canceling this morning. So, so that will um, that will complete the public agenda. So, Mr. City Manager, we're back to your agenda on item two. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I do know that the finance director did find the information about the Amway's charges, and so she can mention that at the end of my agenda. Um, First, I've got, uh, or the second item on my agenda, uh, and we've got Metro people here, but uh, is the Metro's 2024 Public Transportation Agency Safety Plan that's required by the federal government in order to um, be compliant and receive federal funds, and we're asking your approval. Motion and second to approve. Uh, any discussion? Hearing none, councilors, if you'd register your votes, Chris, if you put that up. And Mayor Pro Tem votes affirmatively. So that, that passes. So I've got the at no local match required, but the fiscal year 24 local road assistance administration fund. Motion second to approve item three. Any discussion on that item? And that's $3,016,810. <coughs> All right, Chris. Pl All right, so there's a motion to approve. Item, well, we're on three right now, right? So you want yeah, to include three. three, four, and five? So three, four, and five? Three, so, this, okay, so the motion's been amended to uh, approve items three, four, and five. And is there a second to that? Second. All right. Uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And four is no match, Georgia Recreation Parks. Councilor Allen votes affirmatively. Association is $1,000. And number five was no match. It's the Georgia Statewide After School Network Boost Grant. It's sixty thousand dollars. All right. Motion second to accept the donation uh, to uh, Liberty. Uh, any discussion? All right. So Chris Post put that up there, and the council will enter and, their votes. And this is a five thousand dollar donation. And the Mayor Pro Tem votes affirmatively. $5,000 donation from Luli and Harrison Wallace. Um, and funds can be used for the good of the Liberty Theater, uh, is what they say. Okay. Uh, then I've got purchases. All right. There's a uh, motion to approve items A through K. Uh, Councilor Thomas to the motion. I have a question uh, on item D. All right, so we'll pull D and we'll, the motion will be to approve A, B, and C, and then E through K. Is there a second on that? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, item C. Um, so the first one is a still signal strain pose um, for engineering department. Um, on an as-needed basis, uh, $275,000 is what they're accustomed to spending. B, so solar-powered bus stop lights, so that you know at night, uh, based on solar, uh, solar, our bus stops will uh, have some light for people catching after dark. Um, we got one low-floor paratransit cutaway bus, $201,477. We've got two, uh, well, E, Comparison, a microscope for uh, police department. I've got F, mobile uh, trailer with high resolution camera for engineering. Um, G, striker life pack, 15 monitor defibrillator for Columbus Fire EMS for the ambulance. Uh, H would be fire service apparatus with equipment. Um, there's a, a 1.3 million uh, for that, and then two Pierce Enforcer engines, 1.7 million, um, and um, total three three million eighty seven thousand six hundred twenty one dollars. Got Microsoft software licensing upgrade as I is 1.4 million dollars, um, and. Um, I've got uh, J, Amendment 17, Construction Manager, General Contract. Uh, this is for the Government Center, uh, Judicial Center Construction. It's $142,363,044. Uh, um, K, uh, Computer Aid Dispatch and 
records management system uh, project for a police department. Uh, I see uh, Mr. Lance Deaton here. He's been working um, on this directly, but um, it's, uh, um, it, and it's something uh, highly, uh, strongly enforced or encouraged by Columbus Police Department. Um, and then going back to D, Mayor, that was not approved. C, was it? D. 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 Yeah, uh, two variable message signs for the Civic Center. Uh, and these are just those variable message signs that you would use in the parking lot to direct traffic. They have multiple events going um, with messages. You know, you may have a softball, something going and something else, you know, whether it's a spring fling or other activities. And so um, these are variable message signs that actually could be used by engineering or anyone else if they needed them. Um, elections registration if they needed them, but but therefore the Civic Center. My question, Mr. City Manager, I, I assume that a, a veritable message means that you can change the message on the the actual uh, sign. Yes. And and the sign is movable. Yes. Port, yeah. So that if uh, when we start the construction and so forth of the um, uh, Golden Park, if we need to move these signs over to that that to direct traffic or whatever, mm -hmm. that could be done also. Absolutely. Right. Yes, ma'am. So mm -hmm. this could and be used anywhere. This says for the Civic Center, yeah. but it's mm -hmm. for that entire complex, if you will. Well, yes. and, and can be shared with other departments. That's if, right. You know, I mean, if elections needed to say, here's a new voting, you could they mm -hmm. could call the Civic Center and say, I need your available message. And, and engineering could use them as yeah. well. And we've always used uh, engineering's. That's where we have typically received them from, engineering department. Uh, and so the Civic Center wanted to have, because they only have so many to cover the entire city. And so this is something that we can use for the South Commons complex. So yes. that it does not, um, it's not restricted to the Civic Center. That's correct. No. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, is I there move a motion? approval of item D. Aye. Motion second to approve. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? All right, it's approved. Councilor Davis. Thanks, Mayor. Uh, Ms. City Manager, I'm just assuming on Amendment 17 that that's uh, by draw, right? Y yes. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, and so, Mayor, I've got some updates, and, and these should be short, like cure violence. I've got Reggie Lewis here. He was here at the meeting before the last meeting and did a presentation, a presentation, and then, of course, answer questions, but there was a question that came up at the last meeting, uh, I believe from Councilor Crabb, and you voted to approve the extension through the end of December for cure violence, which is through the health department. And I asked him to come back and though you approved it, still needed, wanted him to be here to answer some questions. So he doesn't have a, pre a presentation. He's just here to answer questions about cure violence. I think the question was, you know, of course, we funded up to 500000 Yes, sir. And um, uh, and you guys, as a non were, were to go and get your 501c3 and go out and try and raise some private dollars. Correct. And they wanted to know how that was going. And and just beyond our up to 500000 um, how are you going to stay in business? Yeah, so what we're doing is, as you said, we're working on getting the 501c3. That's the first part of it. That allows us to get private funding and also help with donations for people who want to get tax breaks. The second part is we're working with different partners like Urban League of River Valley, where we're partnering with them on one of the grants that they're applying for. And what we're doing is a little bit of a creative mindset of like working with like Pastoral Institute and other organizations to apply for grants collectively for a process or referral process that we have that will account for one or two, maybe the FTEs for our group. Sure. So that's what we're doing, not just solely applying for ourselves. There are grants that are starting to come out now for community violence intervention, which is by the Bureau of Justice Assistance. They have one out that now we'll be applying for that when it's opened up on April 25th. That one is up to a million dollars. Uh, so we'll be we'll be applying for additional grants outside of just that, uh, as well as anything that comes across from uh, appropriation and, and stuff like that from the federal government. Sure. And so that's the only question, uh, Mr. Mayor, that 
uh, that came to the table the last time. And so there may be some additional questions for uh, Mr. Lewis regarding cure violence. And so that's why he's here. Okay. If there are any other questions. I don't see any questions queued up. Thank you. Sir. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank so, you for so, sitting there waiting for that. Thank you, so, sir. And so next, Mayor, uh, it's not really a uh, presentation, but um, our, um, our um, IT has been working uh, on some things, and, um, and they received a grant, and he has a video, actually, and I wanted him to come and talk about that Smart Cities grant that he received. And so Forrest Tolley, Director of IT, would you tell us about the Smart Cities grant and Fire EMS would be here because it has to do with some things on the river. And um, uh, so, it, in, in fact, it's, um, it's protection from drowning through uh, AL-enabled, uh, A1-enabled, uh, camera AI. 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> you got to read better. And when you so, get our age, we read it differently. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so, uh, and and you know, we just had a drowning, as you know, on the river. Uh, but CCG and Georgia Tech uh, were awarded an International Smart Twenty Award. And um, and let me just you you talk about because I can read my notes, but you talk about what you got, and then show this brief video. It really is, um, we were awarded um, a uh, international award, Smart 20, one of the um, top innovative uh, IoT, which is uh, um, uh, artificial intelligent enabled device. And what we did was a prototype to uh, see if we could identify situations in the river where you weren't in trouble, you were in trouble, and then you really needed assistance. And with the help of the Fire EMS, and they're in the video, in order to test the prototype, we had to have them get in the river and do the different things that they had to do. The bottom line, though, is with their help and Georgia Tech's help, uh, we were fortunate enough to receive one of the top 20 uh, smart cities in the uh, international competition. So I think the video will explain it all. One by one, Swift Water Rescue Team members from Columbus Fire and EMS leap into the white water of the Chattahoochee River. They're hoping a camera mounted on a bridge more than 100 yards away will spot them and send an alarm. Here, but we're looking yeah, at, the system. Right at first, the computer algorithm that is analyzing images is confused. Researchers at Georgia Tech are watching this exercise through the internet from Atlanta, more than 100 miles away. A few tweaks in programming, and they keep trying. In the center of the city, the river is a huge draw for visitors. World-class white water is fun for kayakers and boaters. Views from exposed rocks are tantalizing for passers-by. But danger lurks. River levels rise in minutes, and even with warning signs and sirens, people are picked up and swept away. We learned that there were a couple of river rescues a month, and there were 11 drownings over the past three years. Rescues are difficult here. In this portion of the river, we can only access it by raft, uh, no motorized boat or anything, uh, which is problematic if they don't know exactly where they're at in the river. Location, access, time, all critical when it comes to saving someone's life. This camera system monitored real time through a program that can pinpoint location and danger level may dramatically improve the odds. We detect whether or not the person uh, in the water is in risk we create alerts for the res rescue team or the response team to identify the level of um, severity of the situation plus they would understand the exact location of a, a person if they're in the water we've created an alert system yellow alert lets them know someone is there in this area that's dangerous orange alert is they're there on the islands, but the water levels are predicted to rise. And therefore, they, if someone can get them off the island before that happens, obviously, then they there's no reason to have a, a rescue save or a drowning. Uh, and then the third level, which we've just finally been able to test today, is a, is a red alert. And that is someone is uh, in the water and there's no boat uh, present. After a half dozen attempts, 
the team finds success. Yep, there it is. Oh, there oh, yes. 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 We have the camera spots the swimmer away from any raft or boat and sends an alert to the team. The red flash calling for instant action and this time with precise location. I think this is really going to help, especially the fire department in locating if there is some kind of situations. I think it's gonna be a, a good asset to them. It's a game changer. We uh, send resources to the river uh, directly off of witness statements called into our dispatch center. Uh, if we have real-time cameras or real-time video feed that tells us where the problem is and what the problem is, then it takes out that middle person, which saves time and it saves lives. Members of council, this is city manager, uh, this deputy city, uh, Sorry, Deputy City, <laughs> City Attorney. Uh, we really appreciate the partnership with uh, IT and Georgia Tech. We uh, uh, this is just a prototype. Just to be clear, this is a prototype of a project uh, using artificial intelligence that we hope to expand with our next phase of uh, uh, partnership with Georgia Tech. We're uh, working with them. We're going to meet with them again. We met with them last week. We're going to meet with them again next week to discuss uh, a grand opportunity with the Department of uh, Homeland Security to allow us to move this prototype to an operational, uh, to an operational phase. Uh, and as we saw last week, unfortunately in our community, this is something that we, we desperately need. Uh, so we certainly appreciate the opportunity to work with IT. Uh, they have been fantastic in, the, in our partners at Georgia Tech and we're just, we're just fortunate to be a part of it. Well, it's, that's an outstanding initiative. Uh, I mean, I can't tell me times you and I talk and, and we know somebody's underwater and you have to use your uh, or you, your men and women have to use their experience with where the currents are and where the snags are, and to be able to zero in on real time is a is is in fact a huge difference maker. Councilor Huff, yes, sir. Thank you. Great presentation. Is this the same group you all brought to town a few years ago at the Trade Center? Yes. To present this from Georgia. Okay. Okay. It looks it looks good because I thought well of it then. <laughs> And uh, the fact that they could locate, because it would, will, will be needed and would have been needed in the past, uh, because they were real excited when they left here. I think we all were and everything. So it's Georgia Tech, and I think the young lady in the presentation was here, and the guy, I think they both were here. Correct. Okay. And they're okay. Georgia Tech professors. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay. And yeah. all the people in the water were for EMS. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for the update, because I know you all told me it would be coming back once they kind of fine-tuned it. Okay, looks good. Thank you. Well, thank Counselor. you, uh, Director Tolley and uh, We have uh, a few, Chief more, few more comments. Councilor Thomas? Um, I know that it's beginning to, um, we're, we're about to start the summer season, and I know that um, there are some rules and regulations about being on the river and being near the river, and also about when the, the dam is going to open and water is going to come down. Chief, could you just sort of remind folks what those, some of those uh, regulations are and um, how do they know that, that the water is about to rise? Absolutely. That's a great question, Counselor. So uh, the bottom line for people on or near the river is you have to have a personal filtration device, uh, which is a life jacket. Uh, and that's designed for your safety as well as the safety of our rescuers. Uh, the expectation is that if you're on the river and you hear an alarm go off, there's a siren that goes off and an audible uh, warning device that comes on that lets you know the river is rising. Uh, when Georgia Power releases water into the system, uh, there's a siren that goes off. So those people that venture out onto the rocks to do fishing or whatever it is that they're doing, um, the siren is there to, to warn them, let them know. Uh, and that was the case this past week. And unfortunately, uh, while we were able to rescue several people, uh, one perished. Uh, so we, we encourage people to, uh, to be safe, uh, to certainly have a personal flotation device. One of the things that we're working on, and, and IT was incredibly uh, generous with us in, is we are, we've just acquired a drone that will allow us to actually fly the drone to where a victim is in the water and drop a personal flotation device to that person. We can communicate with that person uh, verbally. We can send them, give them the opportunity to communicate back. 
Uh, so we're, we're leveraging technology to make it safer for our community, uh, but this is just kind of the first step, but that's a great question. And there are also um, stations, as I understand, where you can pick up a flotation device. Before that is you correct. We work very closely with the River Safety Committee. Uh, in fact, uh, there's, a, there's a River Safety Committee initiative coming up on May the 4th where you can, you can get a personal flotation device for free. Uh, we're going to offer that at our open house on May the 4th uh, from 9 to 11 at Fire Station Number 1 downtown. Uh, but also uh, there's a couple events on their website that you can see you can go to and get one personally for yourself, for your children. And I, I will tell you guys, I have had one of the uh, folks who are in our rescue squad tell me he's never pulled anybody out of the river that had on a flotation device. That's very Everybody true. he's ever pulled out did not have on a flotation device. That's so that true. ought to say something to you about how important it is to do that. They're ugly, but they also will save your life. That's true. We have a very, uh, I, I got to give kudos to our special operations team, our dive rescue and water rescue team. They are truly top notch. Uh, people come here from all over the country to learn in our, in our river, uh, but truly, uh, the folks that we have in this community that serve our, that serve this community are some of the best. Thank you, Chief. Yes, ma'am. We have we stood up that uh, River Safety Committee about four or five years ago, and they have really done some great things in terms of signage and pointing out some things that can be done. But at the end of the day, it's just it's personal responsibility. You just have to be careful. I'm not, don't. I've I've almost gotten punched in the head because I told a dad to please get his kids away from the edge of the rocks. Uh, so it's, you know, it's just, it's a matter of trying to make sure that people understand what's going on out there. Councilor Cogan. Yeah, um, thank you. Chief Scarpa, this is a pretty exciting um, thing that's happening. So uh, while you're up here, I know that there had been a little bit of discussion about um, putting large numbers or letters up on the, on the bridges and, um, just to touch, can you touch on that just so that the public knows a little bit of what's coming so we don't have to explain it later? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you may have noticed we have, uh, as part of our initiative to enhance the safety on the river for the people that come here and use the river, uh, a lot of people who come to the river sometimes don't know where they are, either in the river or on the river walk. And when there was an incident there, they call 911 and our dispatchers are trying to communicate with them and ascertain their exact location so that we can send the right resources to the right place. Uh, the challenge is particularly for, especially for folks who come from out of town, you know, I see a bridge. Well, there are a number of bridges on the river. Um, or I see a, a building, you know, and they can't identify the, the exact building. So what we've done is, um, in, consul in consultation with the River Safety Committee, is identified uh, a, sim a numbering system. Uh, I think it's one through six or one through eight. We have a bunch of four, I think they're four by four signs. There are just a, a number with a color and a shape. So a red triangle with the number four or a blue square with the number three on the bridges that are affixed to the bridges that you can see from either shore or from in the river. And so if you're on the shore and you see somebody in, in distress you can, and you call 911, 911 operator should direct you to say, do you see any signage on any, do you see a bridge? Yes. What number is on the center of that bridge? It's a number three. Or I can't see the number, but I know it's a blue sign. Or I can't see the, I can't see the color because I'm, I'm, I'm colorblind, uh, but I know it's a square. That information helps us get the right resources to the right place. Uh, so we're, we've got several of the signs up. We anticipate having the rest of the signs up this quarter. Uh, it's a lot of work to get those signs in place, working with GDOT and such. Uh, but that is the initiative that you're speaking of. Yeah, I think that's going to be a, a big game changer. And I know that they're not historically accurate. So before I get uh, emails about yes. the historicness of the of the signs that's what they're there for and uh, I, I think that just brings us to the next level as with water safety so yes ma'am thank you councillor huff uh yeah one last question did they determine doing the testing that where they were going to put poles up at different points for beak the beakers you talk about the, the cameras or the yeah to, so right now we have one camera up there that's uh we're trying to find a, a place where we can get a camera that had the power and had all the resources that we need. Uh, ultimately, I think we'd like to have additional cameras out there. Uh, we have to work with, as you can imagine, in real estate, there's a little bit challenging in terms of locating a camera. Right. Uh, so once we get the, the prototype operational, 
uh, to the point where it's operational, we'll approach our partners along the river and figure out where the best places are to put cameras, and I'll really rely on our partners at IT to help with that. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Fuller, Jeremy. Appreciate Thank it. you, Jeremy. Thank you. Uh, next, Mayor, I've got an Enterprise Zone update. Uh, Mr. Will Johnson from our, plan our planning director. Good afternoon. I'll make this quick. I know y'all have been here a minute. Uh, just going to give you an update on the uh, Enterprise Zone. Uh, for some of you who have not had an update on the Enterprise Zone since you've been in office, um, give you a little brief rundown on what it is. Uh, the State Enterprise Zone Program intends to improve geographic areas within cities, counties that are suffering from disinvestment, underprivileged, environmental justice, injustice, um, economic decline, and it encourages private businesses to reinvest or um, rehab re about habilitate thank you um i don't have it here i have i'm looking up here um such areas uh there's five criteria you have to meet three of them uh to qualify for the enterprise zone um it's pervasive poverty unemployment rate oh, look at that unemployment rate um, underdevelopment general distress and general blight Uh, commercial criteria, in order to, order to be eligible for um, the incentives, businesses must increase employment by five or more full-time jobs. That is usually one that is one of the criteria taken. Uh, maintain jobs for the duration of the tax exemption period. Uh, whenever possible, at least 10% of the new employees fill in the jobs. Um, satisfy the job requ uh, creation requirement. They want to employ people from that specific area where they have invested. Uh, provide economic stimulus, and such business or service enterprise may be new. It can be an expansion. It can be a reinvestment of an existing business or service. Um, one right now is Sun South that's building where the old Columbus Airport used to be on Victory Drive. Um, that was the last one we've done. Um, residential criteria was added, I believe, in 2000, and to qualify for that exemption, um, you must uh, do new residential construction, residential rehab, or other rehab of an existing structure. Um, the improvements must exceed the value of the land by a ratio of five to one. Um, in no event shall the value of the property tax accept exceptions uh, granted to qualifying business or service enterprises within an enterprise zone created by the city exceed 10% of the value of the property digest of the entire city. Um, if you go down Thomas Street over in East Winton near Carver Heights, you will notice some of the houses that were built um, using the Enterprise Zone, um, and they're still in great shape. Uh, the benefits. Um, the benefits are essentially you have a 10-year window in the Enterprise Zone where you get a tax abatement. The first five years is no property taxes paid, and that's, that's just our portion. Doesn't count the school system. So you don't pay any tax, property taxes, city property taxes for those first five years. And then it gradually increases by year six. Year six is 80%, year eight is 60%, um, year nine is 40%, and then by year 10 is 20%, year 11 you're to full property taxes. Additional incentives that the city can offer, especially if it's a big project. Um, building permit fees we can waive, sign permit, business license uh, admin fees, rezoning fees, engineering fees, any fees we can uh, waive. To my knowledge, I don't know that we've been asked to. Um, so I, I haven't personally waived any. Um, a little history of the Enterprise Zone. It was established in 1997 by the General Assembly. We established our first one, or we established ours in 98. 
1998, Ordinance 98-30. It is technically called the Columbus uh, Business Development Center. Um, in 2000, it was the state expanded it to allow residential um, development to uh, be under the enterprise zone. So we updated our ordinance in 2000. Um, in 2001, we actually expanded the boundaries, added 420 acres. This included Winterfield, the 30th Avenue area, Torch Hill Road area, and uh, the Winston Road area. Um, we readopted it in 2008 and then expanded it in 2014 uh, when we added Benning Hills, the Liberty District, Benning Tech Park, and the Bull Creek Trailer Park, which includes Elliott's Walk. Uh, initial funding uh, back when we started the Enterprise Zone was seven million um, in SPLOS money uh, to get everything going, and then a bond series of two million, um, which got us to acquire 200 acres of land um, in that Enterprise Zone. Some re uh, residential redevelopment since 1998 in this inside the Enterprise Zone. Uh, Arbor Point, which was the old Baker Village. Patriot Point, which is a 55 and older independent living facility. Avalon Apartments. Um, Liberty Commons Apartments, who used, they did use Enterprise Zone opportunities. Springfield Crossing, both of those are on North Lumpkin Road. Lumpkin Park Apartments, also used Enterprise Zone funds. Sheridan State's Mobile Home Park. Um, used enterprise zone funds. Um, we have new and rehab single family residential throughout the zone, which I just mentioned earlier. Thomas Street's a great example. And then Elliott's Walk. Commercial redevelopment that's used enterprise zone. Uh, BD and K Foods um, were really the first ones to take advantage of the enterprise zone. Chairman Foods, which you see down here, bought out BD and K, but they expanded. So they came back and asked to be eligible under the enterprise zone again because they met the expansion and the rehab requirements. Um, Anchor Pack on Casita Road, Wells Motors, McDonald's, Columbus Tire Company, and uh, I just mentioned Sun South. Some of the investments spurred by the enterprise zone and BRAC, uh, the Valley Healthcare System Office, uh, Walmart, which I'm really surprised they didn't come and ask for enterprise zone funds. Um, five new hotels, Bojangles, Waffle House, Taco Bell, Family Dollar, Dollar General, and uh, AIM, which is the moving company. Uh, they're on Victory Drive. And then our investments in this enterprise zone um, have been uh, us in the state and the school system. Victory Drive Overlay, the Follow Me Trail, Fort Moore Gateway, Martin Luther King Jr. Learning Trail, Liberty Theater Ownership, Resting Gardens, Brown Avenue Bridge, Casita Brennan, Fort Benning Roundabout, National Infantry Museum, uh, Baker Middle, Dorothy Hyde Elementary, Spencer High, Otis Spencer Stadium, South Columbus Library, we're demoing the State Farmers Market for a public use, and Fort, Street, Fort Benning Road Streetscapes. Um, and we have more projects in this area that are coming uh, phase two of the spider web, uh, the Buena Vista Road, I-185, uh, Divergent Diamond Interchange, which is about 57% complete. Um, 10th Avenue Victory Drive Signal, which I believe is imminent. It's coming quick. Uh, Military Drive, uh, which will connect, um, well, I'll say Infantry Drive first. It's ready for construction. It will connect South Lumpkin Road to um, Fort Benton Road. Um, near the infantry museum and then military drive will run perpendicular to that to the infantry museum in the Hampton Inn. Um, the I-185 I interchange with Casita Road, that is about 30% complete. Riverwalk repaving will happen in this area. South Lumpkin Road improvements, we've got a consultant on board. Liberty Theater block enhancements, that's underway. Uh, Andrew Road improvements and Brennan Road improvements. The state has kicked off with their consultants there. Same with Buena Vista Road improvements. Um, Casita Road improvements come along in a later band. 
uh, as does the Bull Creek Dragonfly Trail Connector. Um, and then resurfacing Torch Hill, 30th Avenue, and North Lumpkin were SPLOS funds used. And then, of course, you all know about the new Rigdon Road pool. And what we're looking at for 2024 is, is further expansion, uh, looking to encompass Warren, William, Warren Williams Homes, the Bull Creek, the full Bull Creek area to uh, complement where the uh, trail would go, and then the, Saint, the rest of the St. Mary's Road mobile home parks. And I'll be glad to answer any questions. See if I can work this thing. Do, do, do. Councilor Huff. There we go. Thank you. Uh, the property I was discussing with you earlier, that's Enterprise Zone property on Fort Benning Road. Let's see here. Sitting between. Uh, it is. It is now. Okay. If you remember. That was one of our expansions. If you remember, it was going to be the Columbus Industri the Industrial Park, right. and we never could get that to pan out. Right. But then when the school system came along and bought the property, we went ahead and included it in the uh, Enterprise Zone since any of the other parcels they didn't get that were on the street would be in the Enterprise Zone. Okay. So anybody coming in residential-wise will have to meet those requirements? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Are there Any other, other questions? Questions? Doesn't if, look like it. If not, thank you, Mr. Yes, Johnson. We're going to move right along to uh, Director Rob Scott, Homeowner Occupied Accessibility Rehab Program update. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here to give you an update on the Homeowner Accessibility Rehabilitation Program. Uh, we affectionately, again, call it the HARP program. Um, it targets the cost of necessary repairs and improvements to the residential dwellings um, to include American with Disability uh, Act home improvements. Um, this is going to be providing assistance to economically disadvantaged households um, through the city's prioritization of the preservation of affordable housing options. As you all know, this program has been uh, allocated $3 million from our local ARPA funds. Uh, the funding scope encompasses the following areas. Roofs, critical systems, which include HVAC, furnaces, water heaters, uh, doors, windows, electrical, plumbing, and ADA accessibility improvements. And the repairs are not to exceed $30,000 per household. Uh, the eligibility the eligibility criteria comprise the following income must not exceed 80 percent of the area median income for the columbus area the income calculations are based on all household members age 18 or older um, proof of income is required and the house must be located in muskogee county uh, the necessary documents include verification of home ownership legible social security cards for all household members evidence of full payment of taxes, documentation of up-to-date mortgage payments, if applicable, proof of homeowner insurance, and confirmation of a lien-free residence. Uh, the HARP process um, involves that works some like this. Uh, the pre-screen for the initial qualifications is an online process. Um, that is the very first step in the process. In-person appointments to complete the full application and collect the documents will be the second step. Uh, following the collection of the documents, there will be a home inspection and a work write-up. Uh, uh, estimate will be generated based off the work write-up from the approved contractor. A rehabilitation contract will be signed. A promissory note and security deed will be executed with the homeowner. Um, the work will be performed. The contractor will be paid directly, and a security deed will be filed. Uh, the information for this program will be available at the end of the day. The program overview is currently being uploaded to the Community Reinvestment website. Um, when you get to the site, you can hover over ARP and choose HARP. 
Um, then you, there on the page, you will see a, a language that says this is the below is the program overview. If you click on the program overview, it will allow you to be able to read it online as well as be able to download it. Um, reading it and acknowledging you read and understand the program overview is the first question in the pre-screen. Um, so you want to make sure you read over it carefully just to make sure you have a, a thorough understanding of what this program entails. Um, when the pre-screen application does become available, this is also the location um, where you will be able to go find it. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, Councillor Begley? So this is a loan? Uh, it's, it's a 0% of a loan. So in essence, it's a loan, but it's basically a grant. One of the things that the, the ARP language says is that um, we have to, to document in, um, ways to, to that we're spending the money and not just spend the money in a way where we can't preserve the affordable housing. So what happens is we secure it through a security debt, a need to secure debt, and that is what allows us to be able to make sure that the home is the principal residence and that the investment that we've invested into the property doesn't um, just get but, lost. But, but, but you pay it back. Um, no, well, at the, if they make the home the principal residence within the five years, then they don't. For every year that they've remained housed in the home, 6000 of the of the award will be forgiven. Right. All right, so there's, all right, so the promissory note covers the amount, but then, I guess I was trying to understand the payment schedule. So you said there's not a payment, but so, there's a... Correct. There's a forgivable amount. So we, if we give you $30,000 for every year that you make the home your principal residence, we will forgive $5,000, $6,000 of it until right. we achieve the fifth year in which we'll cancel the security deed altogether. Is that on, sorry, I'm going to that website. I'm trying to see where that's listed out. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I get that, that'd be the main question I get. It was like, all right, so how, how do I, if, there, if, there, if you're putting a note on the on the property and security deed, yeah, you're, it, it is a lien, right? So if you're putting that on there, how do they get it off? Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm just thinking about as I communicate this, a constituent's asking me the first question I get okay. is, okay, if you will, okay, say so this so this is how this works. Uh, the note is for five years. Okay? Yeah. Thirty thousand divided by five is six. If a homeowner makes the principal residence for two years, and let's say three years are remaining. That will relieve a balance of eighteen thousand dollars before that house could be sold. When it gets ready to get dispossessed, we will receive yeah. the eighteen thousand dollars that are due to us because that is the remaining balance um, outside. That's within the affordability period, which is recoupable. Uh, understood. I'm just trying to figure out where that's documented. Well, I, you know, it's it's a program that we've had for many years and. I think, he's, I think he's looking for a lien that gets canceled out. Yeah, it's like $6, if, the, if, the lien's, increments. if the lien's getting canceled out, where is that documented? So when I tell people this is how it works, I can. That, that comes in when you come into the meeting. See, the pre-screen is only going to get you on the list. When you come into the meeting, to the formal meeting to bring your documents, the program is laid out explicitly to the homeowner. That is possibly step three within the process that I just talked about. Yeah. So once they come in, everything is going to be thoroughly explained. The homeowner is going to know. The homeowner is going to know that they got to make this their principal residence. Yeah. They're going to know that at the end of it, this is who you reach out to. Yeah. If you need to dispossess in between, this is who you reach out to. So they will reach out yeah. to us at any given point in time to cancel the lien. And, and when they learn that they're getting $30,000, they're not even caught up in all that, are they? No. <laughs> uh, we haven't seen any so far. And I, I speak from personal experience. I. I when I first moved to Columbus, 26 years old, and back to Columbus, I should say, you know, they had a down payment assistance plan. Worked the same way. Yep. That's been since 1994, 84. So it hasn't changed. Councilor so are there Huff? any other questions? Councilor Huff? Councilor Huff. <coughs> and the person I spoke with you, I guess, when you first got here about windows? Windows, yes. Yeah. So they would apply for this program? Yes. Yes. And if it's granted, then mm -hmm. if it only costs, I guess, you know, $10,000, $15,000, it would be the same situation, $15,000 <laughs> over the six years? Five years. Five yes. years, okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yep. Rob, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I still owe you a call. 
Uh, next, Mayor, I've got critical vacancies. Uh, HR Director Rita Hollowell. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and Council. Um, I want to provide an update on critical vacancies. I've been providing the update uh, typically every six months. So we're just a little bit above our six month period in providing a critical vacancy update. Just as a reminder, as it relates to critical vacancies, these are positions that are typically vacant for at least six months or longer. They are absolutely required essential positions in order for the organization to function effectively. Uh, due to the nature of these positions being so hard to fill, uh, that lands them on the list of being critical vacancies. And these particular skills are usually very high in demand. Um, let's start with our public safety critical vacancies, and you'll see that if we start off with the police department, we have some really good news to report, and I'll have another slide here uh, for the critical vacancy positions in the police department of the 372 positions that are available to be filled. They currently only have 15 vacancies. Of those 15 vacancies, I've got that there are five pending new hires. There are actually uh, five, six pending new hires right now. And this report is as of March 31. Uh, so the police department is working vigorously and they may have several other uh, applicants in the hopper such that this number of 15 vacancies <clears throat> by the end of April or May may dwindle to zero. I know that's what the chief is targeting, zero vacancies, but keep in mind too, they still have some turnover, but this is really, really good. And I'll have another slide that shows the comparison of what they had uh, six months ago. I have not presented to you before the E911 communications technicians, but we've had a lot of conversations about them. And I wanted to share uh, some statistics on the this particular position with CPD. Uh, there are 60 E911 positions. Of that 60, uh, they do have 21 vacancies. You will recall when you approved the $5,000 pay adjustment for police officers, you also approved a $5,000 pay adjustment for the E911 communications technicians, and it was to address the challenges that they had and the recruitment challenges that they have. Uh, in the sheriff's office, we looked at the deputies and the correctional officers there of the 337 positions that are available. They do currently have 31 vacancies. 26 of those are deputies and five of them are correctional officers. Out at Muskogee County Prison, uh, the correctional officer position out of their 114, they have uh, 21 vacancies right now. And with fire and EMS of the 401 uh, available positions, they have seven vacancies right now. Um, with the public safety critical vacancies, uh, since we've been reporting on these every six months ago, this is just a uh, to show how they have continued to work at their vacancies over since 2019, over the last several years. Uh, again, as of March of this year, if we look at the police department, in July of 2023, the police department was recording 149 vacancies. Now, that did include the unfunded positions as well. To date, again, we're recording as of March 31, 15 vacancies in the police department. In the sheriff's office, in July, we reported 15 vacancies. Today, they have 31 vacancies. And at Muskogee County Prison, they were on a roll back in July of 2023. However, they have experienced some challenges and to date they have 21 vacancies. Uh, the warden will tell you that uh, a number of their, uh, what has created some of their vacancies is uh, other 
internal public safety departments. They've gone to either the police department or the sheriff's office and taken positions there. So that's creating a challenge for Muskogee County Prison. I also want to share the turnover rate for CPD. We always look at that. A uh, different change uh, for this particular slide, we typically would show it in the calendar year, but uh, the last time we did this report, there was a request to show uh, the turnover rate in the fiscal year. So that's what you see here. Again, this is still as of March 31, uh, from, and it shows us from FY16 up to FY24. If you look at the last column there to the right, FY24, where the police department has hired 112 officers in the fiscal year, uh, zero folks have retired. They uh, we're still seeing turnover. You see a negative 45 employees, uh, officers that have resigned, only one employee separated. So they're looking at a net positive of 66 officers to date. Um, and you see that that's the first positive in terms of us doing this report in the last three fiscal years. So those numbers look really, really good for the police department. <clears throat> Looking at our general government critical vacancies, we focus on the uh, Metro Transit Department, Parks and Recreation, Public Works, and Engineering for this report. Uh, for Metra, the bus operator positions, these are CDL positions. They currently have uh, 14 vacancies, and they also have non-CDL bus operator positions, and they have four vacancies right there. Uh, in the Parts and Recreation Department of the 328 full and part-time positions, they have a total of 121 vacancies. And you'll see that this is trending in a very good direction for Parts and Recreation. Of those 121 vacancies, 12 of those are full-time positions, and 109 of those are part-time positions. This does not include the uh, intermittent and seasonal workers that they will hire over the summer because they will hire another almost 200 uh, for the aquatics area, for pools, for concessions, and for summer camp. So it does not include their seasonal workers where they are uh, in the process of hiring for those positions right now. And public works for the CDL positions, um, the waste equipment operators and other equipment operators that require a CDL, that's 162 positions. Currently, they have 14 vacancies, and that's trending in a good direction. There are fleet maintenance tech positions. These are the mechanics. Uh, they only have one position. These are absolutely critical positions, so for them to just have one vacancies is really, really good. Now, the challenge is in their skills trades area. These are the HVAC technicians, the plumbers, electricians, and carpenters. Of the 19 positions there, they actually have 11 vacancies. And we talked about the challenges with these particular positions because in the applicants that may come to us, they'll come to us but for various reasons. But typically in the private sector, uh, they're able to offer a dollar more an hour, $2 more an hour. So a lot of times we have turnover in these areas. So these continue to be critical areas for us. I also wanted to report on the engineering department, uh, some critical uh, positions that they have there. The traffic engineer position, the project engineers, uh, traffic signal supervisor, inspector, inspector coordinator, and stormwater manager position. These are absolutely very critical positions. They are highly skilled positions, highly technical positions that are sought after in the private sector and very difficult for us to attract and to retain. Just looking at uh, our reporting on the... Excuse yes. me, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, um, actually, I've got Councilor Tucker first. I'm sorry. Yes, I was um, going to question about MCP. Sure. When <clears throat> you said that they relocated to, and I'm happy that they stayed within CCG, did they mention, do we do an exit review when they go to different departments? 
that's a question for MCP in terms of whether they actually do exit interviews from an HR perspective. Yes, we do exit interviews when they actually leave the organization. Mm -hmm. But again, what the warden is experiencing, a lot of his separations, not all of them, but a number of them are going to other public safety departments, including the sheriff's office uh, and the police department. Some are actually able to go to parks and recreation and public works because they have correctional officers there. And I, Typically, it, it, you would say that it's the pay, uh, but at the same time, the pay for MCP correctional officers is the same for those in the sheriff's office. But a lot of times what they're looking for is a better work opportunity in terms of maybe the shift that they're on, those kinds of things that are more uh, conducive to their work-life balance. Right. That's what I was going to ask. Was it? you know, pay or possible <laughs> burnout or scheduling. Yeah. Um, well, a lot, there's been a lot of overtime over there, obviously, <laughs> because of the shortages. Um, and, yes. and I know that some of them have opportunities, as, as the HR director mentioned, in like Parks and Rec, where they'll, as a post-certified uh, individual correction officer, they can oversee a crew that's doing inmates. right away maintenance. And they can, it's a little better working hours. Mm -hmm. um, but it's... But, uh, the city manager joined, sits in, but we have a public safety meeting every two weeks with all the public safety heads. And one of the things that they're looking at doing is collaborating. The police department has really found a, their stride with recruiting, and they actually want to try to lend some of that assistance to the MCP to try to help them fill some vacancies. So we'll see some cross uh, uh, organization uh, work, group, work yeah. group. So, yeah, hopefully that'll work. Thank you. Councilor Thomas. Um, Ms. Hall, the uh, 109 part-timers in the Parks and Rec, um, I, are some of those because uh, we have some of our pools that are closed right now and we don't need uh, lifeguards or those kind of things? And I guess my one of the things I'd like to know is how that 109 part-timers may compare to former past years, uh, is it about the same or is it uh, significantly larger or just do you, do you have that information? That's really a question for Parks and Recreation in terms of the comparison. This is pretty steady though, unfortunately. It's pretty. Part, yeah, this is steady in terms of the number of vacancies because unfortunately with Parks and Rec, just like so many other departments, the, we are competing for the same group of people a lot of times. Uh, the same folks that might apply for these part-time positions at Parks and Recreation, uh, the fast food restaurants are targeting those types of groups. A lot of times these are uh, students from uh, that have part-time ju jobs. They are college students and they have part-time jobs. So we are competing for the same people that so many other companies are competing for. And a lot of the things that, that, that is going to win out most of the time if they are paying a dollar more than we're paying or 50 cents more than what we're paying. But this is, this is pretty typical of parks and recreation in terms of the number of vacancies that they would normally uh, yeah, have during okay. this time. I just wondered how with um, the, not having those three pools open, uh, what impact that might have on the, particularly on the part-time positions. Right. I understand. Thank you. Sure. So in terms of the general government employees, if we report it, just looking since 2019, in terms of the bus operator positions, they currently have 18 vacancies. Uh, when we reported back in July, they had 13 vacancies. And I know uh, Metro is working feverishly to fill those positions. Uh, with the Public Works Department in terms of their waste equipment operator positions and other CDLs, they currently have 14 vacancies, and that is down from the 26 uh, vacancies that they had back in July. So they are trending in a very good direction in terms of the waste equipment operator positions. Uh, in Parks and Recreation, as we reported, they have 121 vacancies. As you see that in 20. In July of 2023, we reported 143, so that number is down. And so 
I wanted to also take a brief look at the new hires and separations for all of CCG. This is just for the first quarter of 2024. We are absolutely heading in the right direction. You see that we hired in the first quarter 199 employees and we uh, separated 163 employees. So that is headed in a very good direction. It's trending in a good direction. And I think based on some of the things that we're doing now, we'll continue to trend in that direction. So that's a positive of 36 employees to the good where we had been reversed before, but uh, we are definitely headed in a very good direction and positive direction. If we look at all of 2023 in terms of the new hires and separations, we're still doing trending very, very well. We hired 898 employees and 647 employees separated. Uh, that's all, both of those numbers are higher than what I would like for them to be, uh, but they are trending in a very good direction. That's 251 employees to the good in terms of retention. Uh, so we are, this is the right direction that we want to go in. Obviously, we want to be able to retain more employees, and that means we won't have to hire as many employees. But it also shows, of course, that we are able to hire. We are able to hire employees or seeking employment with the city of Columbus, which is very, very good. Our goal is obviously for those that we hire, we want to be able to retain. And then this is just a snapshot of some of our recruiting efforts uh, going out to various uh, different organizations and where employees are or where potential applicants are that we can recruit. As of uh, March 31, we had 132 positions that were currently advertised. And again, just some of our recruiting uh, hiring fairs. In terms of our recruitment strategy, this is not new, but I did want to share it with you all again, and just to share it with the viewing audience uh, in terms of what we're doing in terms of our recruitment as well as retention. And this is just for the first quarter of 2024. Uh, we have hosted or participated in eight hiring fairs. Uh, public safety is a regular out at Fort Moore. They go out there weekly, not just the police department shares, fire and EMS, human resources, we're all at Fort Moore. Uh, CPD does have a hiring event uh, for E911 techs. We talked about those. That is on April the 20th uh, to try to shore up the, the number of uh, E911 technicians. Uh, participating always with and partnering with Goodwill Career Center, uh, Fort Moore, the Department of Labor, and so, of course, we're on social media. Uh, we found that uh, with our recruiting, uh, the colleges and universities and high schools are an excellent source of recruitment, and that's where we found that uh, we've had some good returns on the investment. So we'll continue to uh, be very, very visible with colleges, universities, and high schools. And of course, we always post our jobs on at least 20 plus websites, including our CCG homepage, governmentjobs.com, ND, Glassdoor, and of course, we'll continue the work we're doing with colleges and universities. Of course, we do other things with press releases, uh, posting flyers in neighborhoods, uh, social media, we are there. And I, I did want to uh, just lastly talk about our, our retention strategy. And I say retention strategy is, re is really our commitment to uh, retention. And this is not uh, something new that CCG is doing, but uh, for many, many years, many, many years, we've uh, had a retention strategy. One of the things that's been extremely good, and uh, Councilor Tucker spoke of it today, I believe it was her, of our pay and compensation plan that was recently adopted in 2023. You, in order to retain employees, we have got to have a competitive salary and benefits for our employees. And I thank the council for approving the comprehensive pay plan that was presented to you all. Uh, our wellness offerings, that's ex extremely important to employees that come to us. They Not only uh, when we talk about wellness, we're talking about physical wellness, we're talking about their mental wellness, those kinds of things. One of the things that we are extremely <clears throat> proud of, and I hope you all will get to come and, and just take a tour if you haven't been to City Hall, we have an excellent uh, fitness center there. It's one, it's state of the arts fitness center, and all of our employees get a chance to utilize it. Uh, we offer aerobics classes for employees, lunch and learns. You can 
come in person to a lunch and learn, or you can uh, virtually participate in a lunch and learn. And they, uh, they are highly, uh, the employees participate and they gravitate to those sorts of things. Training and development opportunities. We have, um, I think that's one of our best kept secrets, which is not intentional to keep it a secret, but in terms of our training and development opportunities that we are able to offer now to employees, that's what employees are looking for. It helps them to be able to stay if they can hone their skills and if, if, if they need to work on their soft skills, they can work on those, those kinds of things that helps them to be a better employee. It helps them to develop professionally, personally, and, and professionally in the workplace. So these are really, really good things. Uh, some departments are able to offer a hybrid work schedule, a flexible work schedule. This uh, means a lot to employees, especially if they can get bonus time off too. Who doesn't want that, right? Um, and opportunities, I put this here, opportunities for employees to uh, congregate and, and have social interaction. Particularly uh, in this post-pandemic era, that is something that we see employees want a lot. They want to be able to meet up, if you will, and congregate and talk to each other and interact with each other. So we're always looking for opportunities to be able to do that. It, is, is, it works here for CCG also. It's not just in these other companies that y'all hear about, but employees are demanding a work-life balance. They want to work, they want to get paid, but they want to be off too. Uh, and it's something here uh, for the folks that I call them the old heads. They all, they know that this is a very family culture here in terms of what we do with the city. It's very family oriented and very sensitive to family. Uh, employee discounts because as city government, there's oftentimes that we're able to off offer discounts that other folks that other folks may not be able to offer. Uh, and so much more than that. One of the things I, I, I was gonna mention, I didn't put it on my slide here, but the, one of the things that I think is a retention tool here that I don't take for granted, and I think our managers don't take it for granted, and that is the stable work environment that we are able to offer employees, a very stable work environment, which is huge. You know, you're probably not going to show up tomorrow morning and, and there'll be a chain on the door and you can't get in. You know, there's going to be work for you. If you show up tomorrow, there's going to be work for you. You show up the next day. You show up next week. You show up next year. There's going to be work for you to do. And being able to offer a stable work environment is huge. And I'm thankful that's one thing with CCG that we do offer. Mr. City Manager, that ends my presentation. All right. Councillor uh, Tucker. Yes, this I, I like the information in reference to retention. Um, one of the things that we've discussed in the past um, is succession planning. I know we have a lot of, and it's nothing against our um, senior, our seasoned season. leaders. Um, nothing against them, but do we have some form of succession? planning for, you know, I just think since I've been here, I, I saw people, so many, not so many, but several of our directors um, actual retire. So just wondering, you know, how do we navigate um, succession planning? Um, and definitely when it, when you think about continuity, because really your continuity is walking out the door um, with some of our seasoned employees. So it's, Do. Yeah, it's, it's a real good question, and you're, you're absolutely right. Um, yes, succession planning. This is something that the city manager has pushed, and he has said to every department head that you have got to have a succession plan in place. And for, yes, if you're a department head, you know, that's why we do have assistant department, department directors in place. So that's one of the things that each department typically has is a assistant director or there is a lead manager that in the absence of the director, the lead manager, there's somebody that you can go to and say, okay, I got direction here. If there's an issue, you contact them. And it's not just with department head. That is something that you have to have really throughout the organization. And when I talk about critical vacancies, if you only got but one person that does that, one thing that's extremely critical, they better not get sick, right? That's right. That's right? Can't even afford to go on vacation. 
because mm -hmm. you only got one person that can do that one thing. And it is a challenge. When you have the kind of turnover that we're talking about having, this makes it extremely difficult to be consistent, to have the kind of continuity that we need to have. So it's a challenge, it's a daily challenge. But yes, as an organization, I would say absolutely, we're well aware of it. And it's something that we fight for every day. You gotta fight for the retention. You gotta keep people there long enough to learn what's supposed to be done and to be able to do it and give, an, give, give them an opportunity to actually do it and pay them so that they'll want to stay, have the benefits so that they'll want to stay. So it is a, it's a challenge. But uh, I will say this again, one of the things that we're going to celebrate in a couple of weeks here is our Employee Appreciation Week. Uh, I think it's the full, first full week in May. And in terms of continuity and in terms of longevity and employees staying and being able to learn the job, you, you've got folks that have been here for 30, 40 years, 25, 30, and they're not here just because they can't go anywhere else. They're here because they enjoy what they do, they're good at it, the family environment, the culture that I talked about, they know what's going on. But yes, it, it, is, it is a challenge. When you're talking about succession planning at the uh, top level, it is a challenge, but uh, it is something that I think is not a challenge that certainly can't be overcome and that we are not addressing and that we're not aware of. Yeah, so one of the things, and I know we're not the military, but we used to, we used to track um, the individuals like within our command or organization, but we'll see like when a person is, you know, two years out or one year out and you can be able to basically plan, kind of implement a plan of, you know, that succession plan that we were talking about. So do we track it based on um, individuals that will possibly be retiring? Well, one of the ways we track it, uh, the city adopted as a part of pension reform, <clears throat> the city adopt, part of that adopted a drop. We implemented a drop program. And what the drop does is, most of you all are aware, it allows someone who is of a certain age and have a certain years of service to say, hey, I'm going to go in the drop. And when you say I'm going in the drop, that means I'm going to be gone in three years. That's what it typically means. I'm going to be gone in three years or less. Because when you go in the drop, it doesn't mean that you have to stay for three years. You can go in less. But it says for sure, I'm going to be gone in three years. Now, what we did, we amended the drop, which also says I can stay for another three years. So y'all can stay for six years totally. But going in the drop does help the organization know that, okay, this person is on their way out the door. And the person who's on their way out the door needs to be looking behind them and saying, do I have somebody else can, that can do my job? If there's at least one person, at least two people that can do, it says to management, hey, I am going to be leaving. So you all need to be finding somebody else that can do whatever it is that I'm doing. So that's one of the things, in addition to what I've already said in terms of uh, succession planning, no, it's not the military where, it, where, <laughs> where when you say I'm going to be leaving in two years, they automatically put somebody on you and they stay with you for two years and that person's going to be in your job. No, not to that extent. But yes, I think from an organization per perspective, we are very much well aware. And there's not a whole lot that's going to catch the organization by surprise, especially if you're talking about a department head. Do we do we typically? Because I know you. How long? How long have you been here? You don't want to ask me. That. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Never asked this. But I know you that's have kind of seen. Like asking me how old I, know. I am. I'm definitely not going to do that. <laughs> I'm going to say you're 22. Okay. okay. <laughs> but typically, um, do we have? Is is it? a large number of people leaving at the same time when we talk about, you know, no. the drop plan? No. Or is it kind of like a trickle, you know, effect or? Yes, yes, when you go in the drop, it, you go in the drop at different times. There's no set time that says everybody that's, that wants to be in the drop goes in January 1. It's when that person, they've, meet, they've met the eligibility requirement and they themselves feel like, okay, I think I'm ready. I've, 
I've, I've decided that this is my course of action. So no, there's not there's a trickle, if you will. Mm -hmm. And now I will say this, and and I, I've looked at this. There were a lot of folks that were hired in the 80s, yeah. in in like the early 80s, 1982, 1986, 19. That was a lot of those people when they were hired. So many of those people, they actually stayed. They stayed, they stayed. And what I, and those people are leaving now. Yeah, they have already started the trickle. It started two or three years ago. So all, and that's a large group of people. And that's that, where I was getting. And those people that, are leaving. Yeah. Yeah. That's and that's what I because I'ma say in reference to that time period, people stayed on their jobs. You know, for a long time, my grandma worked for AFES and she retired from AFES and then she went to another job, but she retired at 65 and started back working because she was bored. But people, I guess in that generation, um, they typically stayed. They didn't do a lot of job hopping like we see yeah. now. Yeah. So that's why I was asking, um, are we capturing that? Is it going to be kind of like a a big, great um, 80s retirement party. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so, because again, it's already started uh, in terms of people that came, especially if they were came in 82, 82, 84, most of those people have already retired. They've already gone into the people now from 85, 86, 87, 88 that are still here. Those are gonna be trickling out if, and they've already started to trickle out. But in the next two, three, five years, they're gonna be gone. Yeah. I guess it would just be good to see like an overall number of how many people were in the drop plan. So, oh, yeah, we can absolutely provide that. I'll get it to you. Thank you. Yeah, we've got uh, Councillor Davis. Director Harwell, um, thank you for the presentation. I know since COVID, we seem to hear that term a lot. Uh, critical staffing has been used a lot in, um, in various ways, but I'm just, uh, I'm wondering, you know, and I'm not, I'm not showing any disrespect to any of the labor type staffing agencies that are out there because they, they feel a need, they feel a, a niche, and, and, and certainly um, they help many, many people. But I'm talking about more of the professional staffing, uh, human resource type solutions that are out there. I'm talking about the, the uh, entities that have tens and thousands of employees, all categories, professional employees that can fill mm -hmm. in on a, a part-time basis of it. I've come to realize that a lot of our just in travels, you know, a lot of our sister cities or uh, other communities out there tend to rely on them quite often and uh, to, to fill the need and fill the gaps and to fill uh, the importance of, of those positions. Do we, do we, do that? Do we take advantage of those type agencies that are out there that can help us when we term a critical need or a critical staffing position? When, and, and I think it sounds like you're talking about for professional level type positions, not uh, entry level positions, correct? Uh, well, they actually would, they actually would cover a lot of different categories of employment, well, yes, I guess, we, at the professional we do utilize, level. Sure, we do utilize temporary services. Um, we contract with, I believe, two temporary services, mm -hmm. and we have used them. We will seek them out, especially, like you said, post-pandemic, uh, and, and we're seeing our turnover. We were looking under every rock. Uh, and yes, the temporary agencies is one of the places that we looked. Uh, we have had some success uh, with the temporary agencies. It is more difficult with these skilled technical positions because again, everybody mm -hmm. else is trying to attract and, and looking for that same talent. Uh, but we have tried with our skilled labor. We've not been as successful. There are some positions uh, that for, for temporary temporary <laughs> agencies, they seem to be able to help us. Mm -hmm. And we utilize them where we can, but there are a lot of uh, other areas, I would say, from a 
temporary agencies, they just don't have the personnel either. So a lot of times, yeah, we are on our own and using our own skills and going out and trying to look for, attract those for those particular positions. Right, and you know, I, I need to say public safety would be a whole different entity you know, with the qualifications and all, but uh, on the general government side, I do know sometimes we say funding, uh, available funding, and then just you can't find anybody. So I'm just trying to figure out, we have a lot of vacancies, but you know, is it funding or is it just, we just can't find anybody or nobody wants to sign up at, at that point in time and can we you know utilize some of these areas where it's whether it's skilled labor or professional labor wherever it is in this government that's needed to deal with that um, that's yeah that was really what I, I wanted to uh, I wanted to know I just see a lot of other cities being successful in doing that I understand. all right I think that's it for the questions thank you thank you director Hollowell. Uh, Mr. Mayor, um, I've got two final presentations, Golden Park update and Judicial Center update. It's going to be done by inspections and codes. Okay. Director. We're barely hanging on to a quorum. So we I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you, Mr. City Manager. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of Council. Just a brief update on Golden Park and the progress uh, that we have made um, over the last month or so. So just a little recap of a timeline. Uh, February 27th, uh, Council authorized the execution of a design build contract with Brassville and Gorey, and also authorized the issuance of a limited notice to proceed uh, not to exceed um, $750,000. Um, on the 29th of February, Brassville and Gorey was issued that notice to proceed and be, immediately began work on design activities. Um, so that's 40 days that we have been working on this project and, and we've come a long way in those 40 days. So on March 11th, uh, a demolition permit uh, was applied for by Brassfield and Gorey to the Inspections and Codes Department for the selective demolition of portions of the two smaller structures in Wright Field that are currently located um, at Golden Park. One of them is the long skinny building that was kind of the former Lions office um, was in there. And then the other was the two-story building closer to the field in which the Sports Council had used over the years as an office. Um, so that permit was issued on March 13th. Uh, then on March 26th, Brassfield and Gorey applied for a site development permit. Um, that is currently, that package and all that information currently remains under review by the city. So the proposed site plan, um, we have it laid out here for you. Um, so you can see over to the right-hand side of the picture, you, of course, at the top of the screen is the ex existing skate park. That will remain uh, the same. The park project will not have an impact on that skate park. And then, of course, you have the parking area uh, for the Civic Center and Golden Park. As you come down, there's a new clubhouse and new batting cages uh, behind the right field wall. Um, and then you'll have a new entry plaza that, that takes you um, the procession from the parking lot into the renovated stadium. Um, of course, completely new field will be installed existing ballpark will be severely upgraded, you know, new seating, um, all those kind of, of things. And then the other major addition is behind uh, the, the existing stadium bowl behind first base will be a new patron amenities building um, that'll be constructed in that location. So this is um, the site plan. We do anticipate the design, uh, the architect and the design build team, Brassville and Gorey and, and Populous and Heck Bertishaw, and Moon Meeks to, to come in May and, and provide a more thorough design update of what it'll look like, what the finishes, show some exterior rendings. Uh, that's what they're working on every day right now, but we just wanted to share the site plan of what the proposed improvements are looking like. So there has been a lot of discussion about the trees at Golden Park. Uh, obviously it is a, a public area, it is a, the South Commons, um, and there are a lot of trees down there, so we certainly understand the interest in the trees. So a tree plan has been developed and submitted as part of that site development package. Uh, it is currently being reviewed by city staff and revisions will be made as necessary. Um, and I, I included a little snippet of it so you can kind of see a proposed layout again. The design is still fluid, it's still ongoing. Uh, the buildings, you know, we really just locked their location in and the size of those buildings two or three weeks ago. Um, so we're still routing utilities 
you know, still trying to figure out where the fire lines are going, water lines, sewer lines, how the power is going to go, where the site lighting is, and all those things um, do contribute to the final location of the trees. So some upcoming uh, milestones. Uh, the intent is for tomorrow, it doesn't look like a good day to do some work outside, but pending weather, uh, they would begin selective demolition of the existing structures, which includes beginning demolition of the existing stadium. They're gonna take out the seats, the netting, all the old equipment, those types of things, as well as the two smaller structures, bring those down to the slab level, uh, but leave the slab and foundations at this time. And then the schedule, in order to keep schedule, we would need our site development permit by April 25th so that we could begin land clearing activities on the 29th. Um, and then currently June 1st is the target date to begin foundation activities for those, those two new buildings I mentioned. And of course the ultimate end date is in April of 2025 um, when we need to be ready to play ball. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Doesn't appear to be any. Up, oh, we got one, Councillor Tucker. Yep. Um, Councillor Kogel had to leave to um, pick her daughter up from school. She had a question regarding the um, arborist having to sign off prior to breaking ground. Is that something that we're doing? Yes. Yeah, so you know, um, I'm the. A site development permit is required before any activity that would, would cause erosion uh, happens. So yes, that review and all that is being completed now so that the authorities issuing those site development permits have a chance to look at everything and sign off on it before we uh, start any of that work. So, so the, arbor, the arborist um, will actually sign off yes yeah that plan that i showed that's what's being reviewed and discussed right now between the arborist and the design team thank you <laughs> councillor davis a curious question is golden park located on a parcel or is it in total of the acreage there it is its own parcel how many acres <laughs> uh five it's somewhere in that neighborhood. I think we talked about five. Yes, yeah, that's pretty close. Okay, thank you. I mean, if there are no other questions, we'll move on to the next uh, subject, uh, Judicial Center. So jumping into the Judicial Center, uh, we do have some of our partners here that have been waiting very patiently uh, for most of the day. <laughs> um, we have Henry Painter with Gilbane Building Company, who is the, the general contractor for the project. Then we have our local architects that are working with us. Uh, Will Barnes and, and Paul Gibson. So um, I am going to turn the presentation over to Will and Paul in the middle. So y'all want to come on up to the front. So, uh, But I will run through just a quick update since our last uh, briefing a couple months ago. We have continued work. Uh, we have continued shuffling departments around within the government center complex. Um, so we have continued to move people out of the wings, including juvenile court, uh, accountability court, the parts of the district attorney's office that were in the wings, uh, parts of the solicitor general's office, and then the court reporters were all located in the wings. They are now in various locations in the government center tower. I uh, certainly appreciate all those departments and their cooperation and coordination with us as we work through this process. You know, obviously, it's they were some of the unlucky ones that have to move twice because they got to move now. And then when we get the new building done, they get to move again. Uh, but we appreciate all their cooperation. So really the only people left in the wings are components of the sheriff's office. And of course, we're getting very close uh, in the next several months of finishing the sheriff's office new building, their uh, 1005th Avenue. Um, and so when that building's completed, those folks and the rest of the folks in the wings can be vacated and then the wings will be completely empty and ready for the renovation. Um, so work continues on the early demolition package, which was approved by council in December. <clears throat> Major work activities currently ongoing uh, include demolition of some of the underground parking deck, as well as the mass excavation. So the foundation level is 22 feet below grade. So as the hole gets deeper and deeper, that's where we're headed in order to get down to the foundation level. Uh, council earlier did approve amendment number 17, which included basically all the next major phases, uh, scopes of work. Uh, pretty much everything but the interior finishes, interior partitions, partitions, drywall paint, those types of things were not in this package that'll come 
the council in a, in a few months, um, but all these things listed here were in what was approved today. Um, and since it was approved, foundation work will start in earnest in May. So that's currently the schedule that we are on. So do we have a few photos uh, from the site? So again, um, you can see this is the northern edge of the site. You can see the demolition happening here. So um, it's kind of another view, better view here. So that top level where the, uh, the wall with the plexiglass in the middle, if you were at the groundbreaking, that's the, the wall that you were looking out of. That is the plaza level. Uh, the, the first slab below that is the executive parking level. So if you've ever been uh, into the parking deck, Underneath the government center, that was the, the at grade level, the executive level, and then that next slab below is the P1 level. And then of course there is one more slab that we haven't got to yet that is P2. But so we as we go down, we're excavating, we're demolishing in order to make room for the new the new structure. And this is just a view looking back uh, northwards across to the Springer. Again, demolition continues on the structure, and then the excavation uh, will continue in earnest. So um, at this time. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Barnes uh, for some additional updates. Thank you. Uh, Mayor, Council, good afternoon. As part of Ryan's update, I wanted to give you an update specifically on the trees. And as you can see, the, the text part of the uh, presentation, um, just pointing out that there were 43 total trees to be demolished, and that was uh, submitted to the city uh, months ago as part of the demolition demolition plan, which is part of the tree plan, which I'll go over in a minute. Um, and two of those are um, existing trees were to be relocated um, per the direction of the city arborist. Um, two additional trees in the right of way on the southeast corner of the site will be maintained. The current plan, which you'll see uh, in just a minute, uh, calls for 60 trees to be planted within the, the property lines. An additional 35 will be on the right of way, which is pretty important when it comes to reviewing the tree plan, especially in the downtown urban area. So we've got over 200% uh, additional trees that are going in. The orientation of what you're seeing on the screen, uh, this is the north half of the block that the uh, courthouse is being built on. Underneath the words draft subject to change is the new courthouse building. And the two wings are flanking that kind of a whiter area on the bottom of the page. The trees in green are new trees and they are a combination of small flowering trees, large trees and specimen trees. The trees that are shown, the circles in gray, are not on the property, but uh, this is a pretty important part of it. And again, the urban area, you've got the combination of trees in the right of way and the trees that are on site that make up the tree plan. Some of them are in the project, some of them are up to the city. The ones in the right of way don't count toward the TDUs, um, but as you'll see uh, in a minute, we have, uh, we have met all the TDUs for the site and uh, we'll be working with and have been working with the uh, city arborist to define those trees and to work on the site plan. So there was a tree plan in terms of demolition submitted early. This now has been submitted. It is the current tree plan. And I want to go over some pictures to show you what the canopies might look like in years. Um, let me first go to the, to the bottom half of the site. The, the top half of the site, again, what's on the screen is the immediate uh, phase of the project. And then as you go to the next one, it's a little bit hard to, to follow, uh, but 9th Street is on the bottom of the page. Halfway through the site is approximately the north face of the existing tower. So when the cap tower comes down and parking is provided, you can see again the combination of the green trees and the gray trees that make up the current tree plan, some in the project and some in the right of way. I want to kind of emphasize uh, the tree uh, size, canopy, and location. If you look at this, this is a section through 10th Street. To orient you, you're looking back towards Midtown, out of downtown on 10th Street. The Springer Opera House, the profile of that building is on the left. The profile of the new courthouse is in gray on the right. And you can see a combination of multiple size trees. The smaller, darker ones are the smallest initial trees that will be put in. Um, as a side note, smaller trees tend to adapt quicker and grow better than larger trees. But it is the case that when trees are planted early, you have smaller trees, three to six inch caliper trees, and they're somewhere in that darker range. 10 to 15 years from now, you get into the middle size tree height and canopy, and I'll illustrate that in a minute. 
And then in 50 years, more or less, you have the bigger street canopy. So somewhere 50 years from now, people will be hopefully uh, arguing about saving those trees and want to protect them, but they'll be towards the end of their lifetime. But you can see the tree canopy that we are intending in the design and the point being in this, the bigger trees and the ones that are near the street are on the right of way. So those actually aren't in the tree plan. They're in our plan in con conjunction with what we're working with the arborist and the city on, but they're not, they don't count towards the TDUs. So let me illustrate the tree canopy, and I think this will be uh, recognizable to most folks. And these are taken from uh, Street View on Google Maps. And so they're accurate back to 2007, uh, 15 years before the ones that I'm going to show you in a minute in 2022, which was the latest. And certainly in the three locations that I'm going to illustrate, they've gotten a little bit bigger than that. But this is... Um, Basically, it's a block to the north of the government center near 12th Street. And you can see the trees in the median are willow oaks. Those are shade trees, large kind of specimen trees. You may recall that they were taken out to move houses down First Avenue years ago, and they've been planted back. But the difference, and I'll leave the, the white outlines, you can see in 15 years that what was in 2007 a relatively small tree has grown in the case of these willow oaks in the island about 10 feet and those are my estimates where the crepe myrtles on the side street and 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 our combination maybe crepe myrtles or silver leaf lindens or some other flowering trees um, they've gotten quite a bit bigger and create shade which is exactly what we intend to do around the courthouse second location is right in front of the river center and um, you can see on the right is the, I call it the Smith Barney building, the old Hardaway building, I believe. And here you've got Chinese elms parked on the streetscape, 16 feet plus or minus high back in 2007, and 25 foot willow oaks, similar to the ones that are in the median on First Avenue. So these Broadway trees 15 years later, you can see are quite a bit larger. The Chinese elms have actually performed bigger, higher, better. Um, but they're about the same height as the willow oaks, which are about the same height as the ones on First Avenue. And the last location I'll show you is in front of the Georgia Power Building on Veterans Parkway. Um, in this case, you've got a reversal where the trees in the median are the small flowering trees. They're crepe myrtles. And the trees are a slightly different type of oak on the, on the side, on the east side, in this case of the road in front of Georgia Power. Those are not all oaks, 15 feet. And, and also note that these are in 2011. So the comparison of 2011, only 11 years later, is that we've got, again, 30 foot plus tall nut all oaks on the side. And then you've got the uh, crepe myrtles, which aren't intended to get much bigger on, in the median. And that's for, for safety and visibility, but also aesthetics. So I just wanted to bring all of that to the attention of the council so that when we're talking about the tree plan and what is uh, included in the tree plan and the process of approving that in, in collaboration with the city, that it would illustrate where the design intent is going. So I'll open it up to questions. Councillor Davis. Thank you. I just wanted to highlight one point you made. A lot of those trees, when they were put in, especially there on... Fourth Avenue veterans were, when they were put in, they were four or five, six inch caliber type trees. So we talked about that at one of the meetings here about the replacement of trees that just don't go back with, same applies with Golden Park, just go back with two inch caliber or whatever type trees. You'll, you won't see the growth for a long time, but to go back in with more mature four or five, six inch type caliber trees, I think we have the ability to do that. We should do that. We have three and six inch caliper now. And, Great. Um, and again, in 11 years, you can see the, the difference in the. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. That looks good. Uh, don't, doesn't appear to be any more questions, Will, so. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Mayor, uh, Henry, thank you, sir. Questions that concludes uh, updates in my agenda. Okay. All right, uh, Madam Clerk, hang on, we're coming to you. Here we go. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, members of council. For the clerk's agenda, item one is a resolution to excuse Councilor Davis from.
the March 26th meeting. A motion second to approve uh, item one. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Okay. Mayor Pro Tem, Allen has voted in the affirmative as well. Thank you. Item two is a resolution excusing Council Barnes from today's meeting. So moved. Motion second to excuse Council Barnes' absence. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? And Mayor Pro Tem is voting in the affirmative. Item three is an email correspondence from Mr. Jack Hayes. He's resigning from his seat with the Historic and Architectural Review Board. Needs to be received. Motion second to receive with regret. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Let's Mayor proceed. Pro Tem has voted in the affirmative. Item four, minutes of various boards to be received. Motion second, receive the minutes. Uh, any edits or any uh, questions? All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? They're approved. Mayor Pro Tem has voted in the affirmative. Next, we have board appointments. We have council appointments that are ready for confirmation for the Development Authority of Columbus. Ms. Janice Granville was nominated to serve another term. All right, motion second to confirm Ms. Granville. All in favor say aye. Are there any opposed? She's confirmed. Mayor Pro Tem is voting in the affirmative. Item B is Development Authority of Columbus. Mr. Travis Chambers was nominated to serve another term. He may be confirmed. All right, there's a motion. That's, that's B through D. Yeah, mo motion and a second to Travis Chambers, Selvin Hollingsworth, and Charles Sheffield. Well, that one's going to be taken. He's a new nominee. The others are just continuing in their seats. Mm -hmm. All right, so there's a motion. Was there a second, Senator? Yes. Okay, motion second to approve B, C, and D. Mr. Chambers, Hollingsworth, and Sheffield. All in favor say aye. aye. Are there any opposed? All right, those three and gentlemen are Mayor confirmed. Pro Tem is voting in the affirmative as well. Item E, this is Development Authority of Columbus. Mr. Doug Jenkins was nominated to succeed. Mr. Heath Chondemeyer. Yep, uh, Councilor Davis. Yes, Madam Clerk, I just wanted to, uh, over about a month ago, I nominated uh, Mr. Will White for this position, and I don't see it listed, although I did contact him today, and he was a little confused. He said somebody had called him and kind of, uh, he was a little caught off guard, but anyway, uh, he really wants to serve. He wants to uh, uh, wants to contribute uh, on the development authority. So I am nominating him. This is the position that I had already verbally and public nominated him for. Yes, and we will bring this back then, Mr. Mayor, okay. for a vote tabulation at the next meeting. That'll work. Thank you. Next, we have the personnel review board, Miss Natalie McDowell was nominated to fill the expired term of Dr. Shanita Petaway. There's a motion to uh, confirm uh, Ms. McDowell. Is there a second? Second. All right. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? All right, Ms. McDowell is confirmed. And Mayor Pro Tem is voting in the affirmative as well. Next, we have council district seat appointments. We have the Community Development Advisory Council we have the vacant seat of District 2 as well as the District 3 representative. Thank you, Council Hub. Next, we have Council appointments. Any nominations will be listed for the next meeting. The Animal Control Advisory Board. Uh, we have the seat of uh, Dr. Jean Wagaspak and Dr. Scott McDermott. And we will bring this back. Uh, once we receive a recommendation or nominees uh, from the Veterinary Association president. The Historic and Architectural Review Board, the seat of Reverend Curtis West. Uh, this seat is slated for the Liberty Theater and Cultural Arts Center, a board member representative. If the council would prefer that a recommendation come from the board, we can certainly reach out to them and uh, request that, Councilor Huff. Sure will. 
Next, we have the Hospital Authority of Columbus. Um, we have prepared to uh, send the following nominees to the Hospital Authority, Mr. Darrell Floyd, Mr. Bob Jones, and Mr. Tracy Sears. If a member of council does not have any objections to submitting these names, uh, we would just need a vote to make that, um, to forward those names. Okay, those will be sent. Council Crabb is um, placing the vote, the motion to forward those names to the hospital authority. Okay. We would just need a second. All right. Is there a second? Second. All right. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. They'll be Okay. We will submit those names to the hospital authority, and the mayor pro tem has also voted in the affirmative to forward those names. For the Keep Columbus Beautiful Commission, we have uh, the seat of Lee Jordan as well as a vacant seat. The Keep Columbus Beautiful Director is recommending Ms. Taylor G. Martin to succeed Mr. Lee Jordan, and if there are no... Uh, if a member of council wanted to make that nomination. And we will bring this back for confirmation at the next meeting. And that's all I have, Mr. Mayor. All right. And before we go into executive session, I believe we owe Mr. Broadwater three minutes. I'm coming back next council meeting there. Ask y'all to change y'all agenda, but so on. <laughs> but um, I just want to make sure that um, I was pretty clear. Um, I, I just, I really truly believe that in this day and time, you all have to be, um, you have to think out of the box. The traditional way of thinking is gone. Uh, I think that's why the charter needs to be reviewed um, more often than what, 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 what it says. Every 10 years, that's a long time. A lot of ideas come and go. Uh, I, t I did talk to the uh, city attorney and he was telling me, well, you know, we can get, you can get voters' signatures. But I think, I want to say he said 14,000. That's a lot. You don't have that many people vote in your elections anymore. So we need to we need to really think about our charter. And I think that's that's why we have so many issues that are coming before you now. And um, I'll be honest with you, I I felt like it was April 3rd, 1968. Today. I felt real bad. I love all of you, whether I disagree with you, the way you govern, I still love you. But we have to make sure that we have a government that's of, by, and for our people. And when you have that many people show up and stand, that's an issue. I really mean that. And I think that it boils down to the differences that a lot of our citizens have than when our counselors are elected, or when this body is elected. They think that you're going to govern one way by how you campaign. So when you get into office, if they feel like you're governing another way, they're going to come here and voice their opinion, or they're going to show up. And I think we really need to consider that. Um, I remember having a conversation with a counselor for almost 90 minutes, and we talked about people on the ballot. And I, I brought it up then to, to that person about the charter. Change the charter, and you wouldn't have that. That counselor said he. Th well, that that counselor said that his constituents were probably disenfranchised. I said no way. But anyway. Thank you all. You have a lovely afternoon and enjoy yourself. God bless. Thank you for your patience, Mr. Yes, Brother. All right. We uh, have a request to go into executive session to discuss potential litigation. We have a motion. Is there a second? All right. All in favor say aye. Aye. All right. We are any opposed? We are in executive session.
All right, we went into executive session to discuss uh, potential litigation. There were no votes taken while in executive session. Um, we'll call now on uh, our assistant city attorney. Uh, Thank you, Mayor. I'm here to ask council's approval of a resolution authorizing a liability settlement with claimant Rhonda, Rhonda Grant in the amount of $40,000 in exchange for a full release of all claims. Second. Motion second to approve. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? All right, that is approved. All right, and before we adjourn, let me just urge everybody uh, in, in this community and the surrounding communities to take advantage of a rare opportunity to watch some of the best athletes you'll ever see. Best Ranger competition taking place in Columbus at the A.J. McClung uh, uh, Stadium and also portions down the uh, river walk down close to the uh, zip line. Uh, they're great partners. We need to support them. They'll try to be out there. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. All right. Wait a minute. We've got Councilor Tucker. Yes. The, the last council meeting, um, I, I gave a speech um, regarding my grandmother and thanking you all um, just for being a rock um, in a in a time of just a real bad time for me. Um, I had a feeling that she was going to pass Tuesday. She passed the next day um, at 10.27 p.m. And I just want to publicly thank you all and just thank so many other people um, for, for calling, um, for sending food, sending flowers, sending cards. Uh, it means a lot to me because, yes, she is my grandmother, but my mom had me at 16. So she raised me and my uncle like we were siblings, along with my mom. And my mom went on to go to Tennessee State, and my, my grandmother continued to raise me. So she is mom 2.0, <laughs> and I used to call her mom come, because that's all I said, mom, come here, come here, you know, all the time. So that was my affectionate name for her. But um, one of the things that I will miss is her support, and I can just hear her on the phone you know, saying how proud she was of me for being in this position to help people because that's how she raised me. And that's what she did for the community is helping. And she worked on Fort Benning at the time. And Fort, well, never <coughs> Fort Moore, but it was Fort Benning. And she retired as a, <coughs> as a manager for AFIS. But she saw a need because we had so many soldiers coming in and she went back and worked at the central issue facility because she said they needed help with getting those uniforms, those soldiers, her babies, uniforms. And she brought them candy and cookies knowing that they weren't supposed <laughs> to have that. But she did. And I know she is love. I know she is missed. But I just really had to get that out there. Um, that I just appreciate uh, all of you for being there for me. We will continue to cover you and your family in prayers for support. Uh, I know it's a no, it's a tough thing losing someone that's that close to you. <laughs> all right, um, we do have a motion to adjourn. I think second. we have a second. All in favor, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? All right, we stand adjourned.